So um, thank you, Marco. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lucio Caracciolo. I am the editor of the Italian Geopolitical Review, Limes. So I'm not a philosopher, of course, but I'm very much interested in Kojev because of Marco, uh, because of having the honor of uh, publishing some of his essays on Kojev and specifically on Kojev as a geopolitical thinker and agent, starting with the, the famous Empire Latin, et cetera. Uh, so um, I'm supposed to, to chair this discussion, and I'm pleased to uh, give the floor to Professor Kyle Moore of the Kingston University in London, who will speak about Europe as Katehon, Kojev's concept of empire. Kyle. Thank you very much, uh, Luca, and thank you, Marco, and thank you, Lucio, excuse me, uh, uh, Marco, and, and uh, for all the organizers for inviting me here today, and um, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just uh, begin. Um, in, in August 1945, Alexander Kochev uh, wrote a memorandum, a memorandum ostensibly intended to reach the, the upper echelons of the Gaulle's provisional government of the French Republic. The memo, which sought an outline of a doctrine of French policy, surveyed the situation facing France in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War and provided a program outlining the country's future. It was in these pages that Kojev offered up one of his lesser known but no less provocative political ideas, the peculiar notion of a Latin empire. Only very recently, long after its supposed date of expiration, has this document gathered attention. In 2013, Giorgio Agamben opined in a controversial piece in its own right that the discussion around Kochev's proposed Latin Empire should be revived. Even more recently, and, and perhaps bizarrely, Bernard Henri Lévy suggested that none other than President Macron should read the memo since, according to Lévy, great texts are like historical events. They need time, and often the time of a human life, to take on their full meaning. And because, and because the world seems to be 75 years after the first publication of these notable pages in the exact state that Koshev predicted. Levy's provocation, if it is to be taken seriously, demands that we understand the situation facing France when Koshev first wrote his memo. Only after having answered this question can we look at how his memo informs our current circumstances. Kojev was concerned with two very specific dangers linked to two major global events threatening post-war France. He describes the first danger as economic and therefore political. Only a few weeks before writing his memo, General Secretary Stalin, Prime Minister Churchill, later Atli, and President Truman had concluded their momentous meetings in Potsdam where the fate of Europe was being decided. Besides deliberating on the division and administration of a denazified Germany, the conference delegates also initiated conversations on how to establish a post-war economic, military, and political order across a devastated continent. Although not itself a participant, the future of France was clearly linked to the outcome of these talks. Displaying a certain amount of prescience, Kojev deduced that the agreement reached, which would soon divide Germany between the, G between the GDR and the FRG, was unstable and prone to collapse. He argued that gradually Germany would likely slip out of its straitjackets and orient itself towards either the American West or the Russian East. But no matter which way the pendulum would swing, for reasons I will discuss, Kojev believed the former to be far more likely, barring some kind of preventative action, France would be swallowed up by the weight of an enlarged Western or Eastern superpower along with the German economy, an enriched German economy. Consequently, Unless something was done, France, and indeed all the countries making up Europe's periphery, would inevitably find itself reduced to a protectorate contained within a larger political entity. Despite being more distant, Kojab claimed the second danger facing France was even more urgent. Only days before drafting his memo, on the other side of the world, the first act of atomic warfare was committed, an event too acute for Kojab to even mention. The destruction wrought in Japan proved that if war is indeed a continuation of politics by other means, then nuclear war threatens this continuation and hence the conditions of the possibility for politics. In this context, Kojab warned that the prospect of a third world war remained firmly on the horizon 
And if France was to have a say in its own continued existence, it would have to find a way to maintain, at least as much as possible, a state of neutrality if and when war between the Russians and Americans would recommence. To do so, France would have to transform itself from peace to player in the post-war geopolitical chess game. The task of Kochev's memo was to navigate a course in which France can survive these two dangers. His solution, the creation of an enlarged European state, which would increase France's economic and political capital. The idea of a Latin empire was born, a Mediterranean alliance between France, Italy, and Spain, which would allow these countries to enter into diplomatic relations with the other two new global superpowers flanking them on either side. More than a relationship paid by mere lip service, this alliance could create space between the American West and the Russian East in such a way as to prevent further military conflict. At the same time, and in preparation for this eventuality, Kochev claimed that a Latin empire is the only way France, Italy, and Spain will be able to maintain their economic and political position in Europe and the rest of the world. All indications suggest that Kochev did not intend his policy memo for public consumption. It was addressed to Robert Marjolin, a student of Kochev's famous, famous seminars on Hegel, and who under de Gaulle had become a director in the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Marjolin responded to Kochev with a general dismissal, explaining that the policy recommendation, recommendations contained in his memo were archaic, even borderline fascist. Unsurprisingly, there is no evidence that the letter had any impact on the decision makers of the time. Indeed, the cold response Kochev received from Marjolin in many ways anticipated the reception of the text in general. For instance, when Agamben dared to suggest that some of the ideas in the document be revisited only a decade ago, he was immediately reproached. Although clearly intended as a provocation, Agamben's short article was denounced as a crude form of anti-Germanic propaganda. But as I will argue, I feel that these criticisms are missing the point entirely. Kochev's point of departure, a point that Marjolin himself, despite his criticisms, also found compelling, was that the outcome of the war denoted a decisive turning point in history comparable to the one that took place at the beginning of modernity. Kochev writes, the beginning of the modern age is characterized by the unstoppable process of a progressive elimination of feudal political formations, dividing the national units to the benefit of kingdoms which is to say of nation states. At present, it is these nation states that irresistibly are gradually giving way to political formations which transgress national borders. <laughs> Kojev argues that just as the medieval city-states were dwarfed by the political reality of nations, the world produced out of the conflict between these nation states had made necessary a new political reality. The end of the war signified a new epoch of transnational political unities born out of the ashes of the nation state. In order to remain politically viable, going forward, statehood must take the form of what Kojev called empire. It is indeed a loaded term, and in order to avoid confusion, we need to linger on it for a moment. As we will see, Kojev's concept of empire is opposed to the Roman model of imperium sine fine as well as with the idea of global technocratic administration that we find, for example, in thinkers like Hart and Negri. Yet before we can understand what Kochev means by the term, we must first understand the historical transition which makes this novel political form possible. Three years earlier, in 1942, Kochev wrote a short text on the notion, the notion of authority. Drawing from Weber, Kochev discusses the state in terms of a political power that has final authority within a defined territorial space. Like any authority, Kochev argues that the state needs to have an adequate material support in order to have an objective reality. In the Latin Empire memo, the authority of the state is said to manifest itself in and through the potential to utilize the most up-to-date military technologies. As, technologies, as technology changes, and armaments evolve, the form of the state must also change to accommodate this need. Providing an example, Kochev says that for a time, the feudal prince was capable of arming vassal citizens with swords or spears, and this was sufficient to maintain political autonomy. 
However, as technologies improved and it became necessary to maintain an artillery to be able to support a possible war, feudal political formations showed themselves to be insufficient. As a result, these formations were progressively absorbed by richer nations, richer nation states. Analogous to the transition from feudal to nation states, Kochev surmised that the outcome of World War II, more specifically, the defeat of Nazi Germany, indicated that the nation could no longer support modern armies. As Kochev puts it, the Third Reich was undoubtedly a national state in the particular and precise sense of the term. This is a state which, on the one hand, strove to realize all national, all national political possibilities, and which, on the other hand, wanted to use only the power of the German nation by consciously establishing qua state the ethnic limits of the latter. Well, this ideal nation state lost its crucial political war. Kochev is explicit in disregarding uh, uh, analysis that assigns responsibility for this defeat in terms of population constraints, incompetence, or lack of planning, claiming in unequivocal terms that Germany lost, this, lost the war because she wanted to win it as a nation. And the German example proved for Kochev that any nation which persists in maintaining an exclusively national military that supports its political autonomy must sooner or later cease to exist politically. Standing behind the claim that the defeat of Nazi Germany provided definitive proof that the political history dominated by nation states had ended, Kojab also acknowledged that the political reality of the nation was already in question before the end of the 19th century. The two most perceptible forms of this repudiation were found in what Kojab referred to as bourgeois liberalism and internationalist socialism. But for Kochev, we must, we must distinguish these two abstract political ideologies from what he considers to be the two concrete forms of empire that were emerging in the West and East. Both liberalism and international and that internationalist, which is to say Trotskyist <laughs> socialism, had a universal goal of extending their reach over the entire globe and hence encompassing all of humanity. It is this utopian aspect of these ideas that is criticized. What both fail to understand, Kochev says, is that, quote, it is impossible to jump from the nation to humanity without going via empire. Before being embodied in humanity, the Hegelian Weltgeist, which has abandoned nations, must inhabit empires, end quote. It is in this context that we should understand Kochev's somewhat controversial praise of Stalin alongside praise of Churchill, and most importantly, his zone idea of a Latin empire. On the one hand, Stalin was able to recognize contra, contra Trotsky, that socialism must ride under the banner, socialism in one country, which for Kochev meant that it limit its expansion to a bounded territory. On the other hand, Churchill grasped the need to form a partnership with the United States, which would reduce the territorial reach of the pseudo-national imperial ideology of the Commonwealth. In this way, it was both Stalin and Churchill who were, by grasping the historical situation facing them, able to discover the interme intermediary political reality of empires, which is to say unions or even international amalgamations of affiliated nations. Empire must thus be understood for Kochev <laughs> as a mediating concept which is to say a bridge that allows for a transition between defunct nationalism and utopian universalism. Different from a concept of empire that knows only unlimited expansion of its dominion ad infinitum, Kochev wants to think it in terms of limitation and boundedness. As such, it must be distinguished from its relation to hegemonic imperialism and its regulative ideal of empire without end. With this in mind, and even though Kochev does not himself use the word, what I would like to argue is that the idea of empire as a mediating political form places it within the logic of Karl Schmitt's notion of the Catacon. Mentioned only briefly in 2 Thess Thessalonians, the Catacon is a term used by Paul to describe a mysterious and ambivalent figure identified with the power that restrains or holds back the messianic events. In doing so, 
catacon, whatever it is, performs a somewhat paradoxical task of delaying the apocalyptic destruction of the earth by postponing the return of Christ and the longed-for salvation of mankind. Although such theological references appear today as esoteric, the catacon has found purchase in recent political debates. From its popularization in Schmidt's Nomos of the Earth to Agamben's Stasis and Massimo Cacciari's The Withholding Power, among others, this figure indexes a general political problem. As Kachari writes, quote, while the relation between theology and politics must always present itself in historically determinate terms, it also poses, the, poses questions of a more general, a more general theoretical order, end quote. To see how Schmidt, in particular, holds the theological concept of the catacon into a legitimization of, polit of a political entity requires that we remind ourselves what exactly politics meant for Schmidt. Famously, in his concept of the political, Schmidt wrote that, quote, the specific political distinction to which political actions and motives can be reduced is that between friend and enemy, end quote. The, agonon, the agonistic distinct, distinction denotes the utmost degree of intensity of a union or separation, but is not, as Schmidt emphasizes, based on moral, aesthetic, or even economic relations. It is only necessary that the distinction be based on an otherness sufficient to produce potential conflicts. It is the potential for war that is important for Schmidt. When this potential disappears, a situation that parallels the messianic event is said to occur. On the one side, the end of war promises the secularized equivalent of eternal salvation and peace. On the other hand, the actualization of peace is threatened by the chaos of a global, a global civil war that would precede it. As Schmidt writes in the theory of the partisan, quote, the denial of real enmity paves the way for the destructive work of absolute enmity, end quote. Far from achieving universal peace, the elimination of this foundation, the distinction between friend and enemy, pushes agonism to the extreme. It is for this reason that Schmidt's Christian interpretation of politics called for a catacontic force to contain political relations and avoid what he perceived as the catastrophic consequences of depoliticized unipolarity. As Schmidt writes in his glossarium, one can recognize the catacon by the fact that it does not strive for world unity. Similarly, the function of Kochev's Latin Empire is to prevent the world from falling into a state of post-political unipolarity. Of course, of course Kochev is well aware that a union between Mediterranean countries would never be militarily or economically powerful enough to defeat either of its adversaries. But this is precisely why he supports <laughs> the idea. Not powerful enough to actually conduct wars, the Latin Empire just might be powerful enough to remove the temptation of either the Americans or Russians towards global expansion. By inserting itself between two reciprocally hostile and antagonistic forces, Kojov argues that the Latin Empire had the potential for acting as a kind of buffer zone. That is to say, the idea of empire seeks to maintain, politi maintain political tensions while preventing the depoliticization, the depoliticizing nature of imperial glo globalism. In words that sound very catacontic, in spirit, Kojev writes in his Latin Empire memo that, quote, the possibility of making war does not mean the necessity of actually conducting it. Indeed, on the contrary, it is only by enveloping itself in the Latin Empire to which it will give rise that France will ensure peace for herself and all of Europe. This empire will never be strong enough to be able to attack the empires which will, which, which will surround it so that its leaders will not be tempted too often to transform their imperial policy, imperial policy into imperialism. But it will be powerful enough to remove anybody's temptation to attack it on the condition of course that it does not fall out simultaneously with both of its possible imperial adversaries. If these two empires were to confront one another in a martial struggle, the sole fact of a Latin empire's existence would force them to limit their battlefields." End quote. A specifically Latin version of empire would thus withhold hostilities precisely by maintaining political tensions. Too weak to attack, yet strong enough to establish a deadlock, the Latin empire has the potential to 
guard the circumference of the Mediterranean and the entire West from ruin. Of course, one could rejoin by saying that it is not necessarily the case that depoliticization and apocalyptic and apocalyptic destruction go hand in hand. In fact, Kojima himself proposed that earthly satisfaction would one day arrive in the form of a universal and homogenous state. Furthermore, experience has taught us that from a social, economic, or even psychological point of view, many people are more or less okay with being more or less a camouflaged protectorate of America. However, historical experience has also shown that a country deprived of its political foundations will also perhaps imperceptibly at first, lose its culture and traditions. <laughs> Showing some foresight, Koshev says that once separated from its political trappings, a nation's culture will become sterile and will disintegrate little by little. In his introduction to the reading of Hegel, Koshev describes this disintegration in terms of post-historical vegetation that will eventually encompass the globe. He writes that, Several voyages of comparison made between 1948 and 1958 to the United States and the USSR gave me the impression that, that if the Americans give the, appearance, give the appearance of rich Sino-Soviets, it is because the Russians and the Chinese are only Americans who are still poor, but are rapidly proceeding to get richer. I was led to conclude from this that the American way of life was the type of life specific to the post-historical period. The actual presence of the United States in the world, prefiguring the eternal present future of all, human, of all humanity. Even though Kochev's forecast will change over the years, it is significant that he repeats the same idea in a letter to Schmidt in 1955, writing that the world was slowly taking the form of, quote, Molotov's cowboy hat. In 1957, in his diary, Schmidt commented on this dismal prognosis writing that for Kojev, quote, a new humanity is beginning, without war, without games, without heroism, without risk, total welfare is beginning. We are not at the end of all security, but at the beginning of total security. This was Kojev's apparently optimistic response. However, Kojev also added that this new paradise was not his paradise, end quote. Kojev makes it clear in his memo that it, was not only, that it was not only with the view of preventing a third world war that he proposed a Latin empire. Just as important as human existence is the culture and traditions that make human existence meaningful. Empire fulfills this other function by serving as a bulwark against homogenization. To have any political purchase as friends, the individual nations that make up an empire must have a specific gravity that binds them together socially, religiously, and linguistically. Kojev writes that, this kingship between nations, which is currently becoming an important political factor, is an undeniable concrete fact that has nothing to do with generally vague and unclear racial ideas. The kinship of nations is above all a kinship of language, of civilization, of general mentality, or as is sometimes also said, climate. And this spiritual kinship is also manifested among other things through the identity of religion. It is for this reason that Kojev calls for the creation of a specifically Latin empire. Very schematically, Kojev argues that the Anglo-American and Slavo-Soviet empires already have their own specific identities. Referring to Weber's seminal work, Kojev argues that the Anglo-American empire can define unity through a Protestant capitalistic ethic and a Germanic tongue. On the other end of the spectrum, the Slavo-Soviet empire can be supported by an Orthodox church socialism, and Slavophilic traditions. Distinguishing itself while complementing the other two, Kojev proposed the Latin Empire could be based on a Mediterranean spirit of dolce far niente, supported by an anti-clerical Catholicism. The hypothesized empire would thus have a transnational unity rooted in the church, romance languages, and what Kojev called the art of leisure, which is the source of art in general. Admittedly, Kojev's analysis of the binding characteristics of this Latin world could come off as perhaps simplistic and even antiquated. This was Marjolein's complaint when he accused Kojev of dredging up ideas that had previously provided the substance underpinning elements of fascist ideology. However, looking past the Latinized features of his proposal, Kachari, like Agamben and Levy, 
finds the memo still relevant. Kachari argues that while existing within a world that little by little edges towards a global system built upon bureaucratic and administrative functions of control, policing, and regulation, Kozhev's idea of a Latin empire is a useful model for understanding how we can momentarily ward off the inevitable consequences of depoliticization. He agrees with Kozhev that in the transition from the nation state to global order, there is a hiatus, that is a gap. But it is a gap that Kachari says cannot be crossed by dreaming up imaginary bridges. What distinguishes Kachari from Kochev, separated by a half century, is the form such a temporary catacontic empire should take. Kachari writes that, quote, here is where we differ from Kochev. A Latin empire is impossible. Impossible and indeed portending of new conflicts with Germany and Eastern Europe. The European empire will be, if it comes to pass, the ambiguous power formed by the agreement between its always contrasting voices. Common voices, precisely because of their centuries of tension and conjoined finally by means of these very tensions in reciprocal recognition. However, as Kachari admits, if the European empire formed is to be an effective catacon, that is, to be able to hold back the depoliticization of unipolarity, it will have to first define itself politically. Yet, as Kachari also admits, at least in this regard, the Euro European empire is just as problematic as the Latin version. It is in this sense that we are compelled to agree with Levy that nearly three quarters of a century later, empire finds itself in exactly the situation that Europe, sorry, Europe finds itself in exactly the situation that Kochev predicted. To emphasize this point, I would like to conclude my talk by quoting a certain section of the Latin Empire memo. By replacing only the word France with Europe, Kochev almost speaks from the grave by delivering an astute analysis of our contemporary situation. It is not only Europe's politically specific gravity that will become neg negligible if she lets herself be absorbed by the Anglo-American empire. Her economy too will play only an entirely secondary role in it. Europe's economic functioning too, and consequently her very social structure will have to transform itself bit by bit to comply with and adapt itself to the models and the requirements which, coming from outside, will often be in flagrant conflict with its traditions and aspirations. Finally, no longer sustained either by independent economic activity or autonomous political reality, European civilization itself will not count for much at the heart of the American world and consequently of the world in general. Far from shining outward, Europe will be internally subject to the influence of the American civilization. It can thus be supposed that, in renouncing autonomous political existence, that is the state, Europe will lose not only face, but her own face. And speaking in Italy today, it's not difficult to understand these words, spoken three quarters of a century ago, as prophetic. And notwithstanding Kochev's own efforts in helping to shape post-war Europe, the European Union has been formed, not as an empire, but in the shadow of global imperialism. Agamben puts it bluntly, what Kochev forecast has turned out to be true. This Europe that strives to exist on a strictly economic basis, abandoning all true affinities between lifestyles, cultures, and religion, has repeatedly shown its weaknesses, especially at the economic level. Indeed, if unity is achieved in Europe, it is only as a vassal of the United States. As a result, despite Kochev's warnings, we now help facilitate imperialistic wars instead of holding them back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kyle, for your fascinating presentation, especially when you superpose uh, Europe to France and vice versa, because this is typically French. The question being was, is Kozhev a Frenchman or not? But I have no answer about that. <laughs> um, now, um, I have the pleasure to give the floor to uh, Eduardo Raimondi. Uh, who will speak about État universel et homogène or État mondial, globalization, politics, and modernity from Alexandre Kozhev to Eric Weil. Oh. Weil or Weil? <laughs> Weil. Sempre tedesco era. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody and Marco 
Filoni for invitation to this conference and Massimo Palma uh, to the organization. Um, here um, I will try to propose some simple suggestions Cosuian um, est un universel, et homogène et onvalian est un mondial. Therefore, we'll see how these two authors can help us reflect on the end of modernity and on the current effects of globalization. <coughs> we cannot understand Cosuian's theorization of the univer universal and homogeneous state without considering his famous and intricate reading of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. Leaving aside the enumerable appropriation of this reading, here it will, it will be sufficient to recall how this category arises in the light of the profoundly theological secular interpretation of Hegel's philosophy of history. The true subject of history, the Hegelian servant, or as Kojev say, the slave club will be able to free himself from his religious estrangement and friend to the struggle against his old and new masters and the rational transformation of nature to work. The latter, in fact, will even prove to be capable of creating entirely human universes from scratch, radical opposed to mere being given, in which all will be able to reach the recognition of their universal value and their relative satisfaction. Therefore, it's only human activity that can create truly dialectical processes, ontologically separated from the pure natural universe. It's no coincidence that it's desire for desire and not purely animal need that generates the so-called historical anthropogenesis, claim which, as Kojev is well aware, had nothing to do Hegel and his fourth chapter of the phenomenology. The fact is that precisely this ontological dualism, the division between man and nature, temporality and speciality between activity and passivity, desire and need, bears witness to the theological vision in its secularized form, supported by Kojel. An essential dualism that seems to be able to be reconciled once and for all, precisely in and with the universal and homogeneous state of Hegelian matrix, embodiment of the absolute spirit, and at least initially a sort of anticipation of the Marxian kingdom of freedom. Therefore, in this early reconciliation, there can no longer be room for religion and for the Christian religion. Man definitely take the place of God. Now it's man who creates the last new world. This is how the story of struggle and work ends, because total satisfaction and self-recognition are now at hand. Then the universal and homogeneous states is testimony and imperishable proof of the end of history, as also of any other new and possible truly human discourse. The philosopher Hegel achieved his goal, to become sage and to realize wisdom, since man no longer wishes to say or create anything. As a result, as we know, in 1968, Kojé will decline in very different ways to say, um, yeah, very different ways. Mm. Science man no longer wishes to say or create anything. As a result, as we know, uh, these different ways uh, compared to what was said in 1947, the year of the first edition of his Hegelian seminars. However, these dif differences are less profound than they seem, precisely because the theological structure underlying all his Hegelian appropriation what Michael wrote, will never be questioned. At the basis of this persistent theological secular vision, in fact, lies precisely that dualistic and creationist paradigm has never felt, used by Kojev to reread Hegel and in primis his phenomenology. Let's see what this is. We know the uh, 
Brazilian operation, which during the famous seminars on the phenomenology of spirits, tried to reread the Hegelian work to the reproposition of the intricate ontological dualism, derived not only from Heidegger's philosophy, but also from a certain Platonism with a Christian and creationist background, mostly the solo of Platonism, as we know. Kujavinis Kant, as we know, draft after the Hegelian seminars, recognized the Platonism itself, developed a clear ontology dualist that inspired the Hegelian phenomenology. In other introductory work of the famous Système du Savoir, they say, Une histoire raisonnée de la philosophie païenne, about Platon and Aristotle, also written in the 1950s, Roger talked about of the existence of a real Platonic phenomenology. But already during his Hegelian seminars, Kojak said, Hegel n'est pas toujours fidèle à son idée directrice, namely the historical thesis created over time to struggle and slave work. Parfois, l'évolution historique apparaît comme la réalisation successive dans le temps d'une idée éternelle, préexistante. In this sense, this ontological dualism will be functional to the construction of this theological interpretation of Hegel. According to introduction à la lecture de Hegel, as you can see in the, in the handout, in my handout, Roger said, Il y a une différence essentielle entre la nature d'une part, qui n'est révélée que par le discours de l'homme, c'est-à-dire par un, une réalité autre que celle qu'elle est elle-même, et l'homme d'autre part, qui révèle lui-même la réalité qu'il est, ainsi que celle naturelle qu'il n'est pas. And again, d'une manière générale, l'anthropologie hegelienne est une théologie chrétienne laïcisée. Hegel s'en rend parfaitement compte. Il répète à plusieurs reprises que tout ce qui dit la théologie chrétienne est absolument vrai, à condition d'être appliqué non pas à un dieu transcendant imaginaire, mais à l'homme réel vivant dans le monde. Hegel ne fait que prendre vraiment conscience du savoir dit théologique et n'expliquant que son objet réel est ne pas dit, mais l'homme historique, ou comme il aimait dire, l'esprit du peuple, Wolfgeist. Kojavis clear, the French Revolution, the last true slave revolution, leads to the laicization of the Christian religion, suppressing the state's signature, and creates the Napoleonic states, namely the universal and homogeneous states. Au moment où l'idéal est réalisé, le dualisme disparaît, et avec lui la religion et l'éthéisme. Or, l'idéal se réalise dans les parlations négatrices révolutionnaires. La révolution réalise donc la religion dans le monde, mais elle l'est fait en le supprimant en tant que religion. Et la religion supprimée en tant que religion ou théologie, par sa réalisation dans le monde, est la science absolue. Pour Hegel, il s'agit de la religion chrétienne, de sa réalisation par la révolution de 89 et de sa sublimation dans la science hegelienne. C'est donc un homme athée qui déclenche l'action révolutionnaire. Mais cette action réalise l'idéal chrétien, car l'esprit divin réalisé dans le monde n'est plus divin, mais humain. Et c'est là le fond même de la science absolue de Hegel. À la fin de l'histoire of the philosophical discourse and the achievement of the état universel et homogène, namely, namely the Napoleonic state. Une vérité n'est vraiment vraie, c'est-à-dire universellement, nécessairement, éternellement valable, et si la réalité qu'elle révèle est entièrement achevée, tout ce qui était possible, c'est effectivement réalisé, donc parfait, sans possibilité d'ascension ou de changement. Cette réalité totale, définitive, est l'empire napoléonien. Pour Hegel, c'est un état universel et homogène. Il réunit l'humanité tout entière, du moins ce qui compte historiquement, et supprimer, en fait, en son sens, toutes les différences spécifiques 
nation, classe sociale, famille. Donc, les guerres et les révolutions sont désormais impossibles. C'est dire que cet État ne se modifiera plus, restera autrement identique à lui-même. L'homme ne changera donc plus lui non plus, et la nature sans négativité. Et de toute façon, achevée depuis toujours. Par conséquent, la science qui décrit correctement et complètement le monde napoléonien restera toujours et entièrement valable. Elle sera savoir absolu, terme final de toute la recherche philosophique. Ce savoir, c'est l'esprit sûr de l'humain. In this sense, the sage can only be reduced to the guardian of the end and of the final truth. Le sage, this is in introduction, le sage, par contre, est pleinement et définitivement réconcilié avec tout ce qui est. Il se confie sans réserve à l'être et s'ouvre entièrement au réel sans lui opposer des résistances. Son rôle est celui d'un miroir performant plein et indéfiniment entendu. Il ne réfléchit pas sur le réel, c'est le réel qui se réfléchit sur lui, se reflète dans sa conscience et se révèle dans sa propre structure dialectique par le discours du sage, qui le décrit sans le déformer. Hence, the idea of a universal and homogeneous state, by now concretely revealed by Hegel, that it must continue to achieve in the world of the, fin of the fin de l'histoire, a purely technical problem and a more political, considering that these states, universal and homogeneous, can take any particular empirical form to be realized at any price. In this sense, Hegel's secularized theology, which reveals the truth of human existence once and for all, can be read both from right to left with the triumph of Stalin and from left to right as a reactionary or as a revolutionary movement for both together, as recalled Jacques Derrida in L'Ecriture et la Différence. Indeed, we are facing the end of the possibility of creating a truly human historical world, which is replaced by the pure mimesis of conflict. From the hand of history in the American way of life, in which Kojeb sees the reanimalization of man, Japanese snobbery. In this regard, we can see the consideration of Massimo Palma in his photo di gruppo con Servo Signore on how Bataille interpreted the Kojibian plan found the l'histoire, as well as Kojel's irony on the movement of 1968, as Filoni recalls in his Kojel Mon Ami. We can see holds of the tax capitalism and socialism Marc Sedier for the son prophet. As we know from a lecture that Kojel gave in Dusseldorf on 1957 at the invitation of Karl Schmidt. Here, as proof of the eff effective hand of history, Kojev wanted to prove how the Hegel or Marxist theory confirmed and re realized unconsciously by capitalism itself. In any case, we are faced with the inevitable global homogenization of the ways of life in the name of the total technical rationalization of the world. In this sense, perhaps, we are dealing here with the deterioration of the concept of equality. These suggestions can make us understand, paradoxically, how Kojab finished giving us a more realistic picture of our globalized world, picture in which by its aspiration to lie. And then Weil. Weil, uh, Eric Weil, as you know, was among the editors of the Kojabian seminars in Paris. But while sharing some aspects, he rejects not only the theory of the end of history in Hegel, but also the theological framework that underlies it, which Weil quickly realized. In fact, he believed that all existentialist philosophy, including that of Heidegger's adopted by Kojev, was based precisely on the secularization of theological thoughts. In this case, theological Christian thoughts. About this we can see of while the strength and weakness of existentialism is published in 
1852. Wherefore, while on the one hand rejects the radical dualism with which Kozhev reread Hegelian ontology, on the other, he believed that to grasp Hegel's authentic thought, we cannot start from phenomenology stacks. In fact, Weil considered it an unfinished work and which, precisely for this reason, led erroneously to the theorization of the end of history and of the universal and homogeneous state. See Hegel et l'Etat, 1950s book in which Weil, although sharing Kozhev's interpretation of the phenomenology, he wants at the same time to reject its suit the analysis of the Hegel's philosophy of law. It's not coincidence that the Hegel of elements of philosophy of law, according to Weil, denied any possibility of an end of history a la Coget. In this regard, Weil spoke to his friends and Italian philosopher Arturo Massolo in the mid 1960s about a contradiction heureuse in Hegel. In any case, to overcome any metaphysical drift of philosophical thought, in 1950, Weil published one of his most important works, The Logique de la Philosophie. A logic no longer of being, but of the concrete discourses of man, grasped by philosophy in their systematic unit. In this system, made up of 18 philosophical non-metaphysical categories, while also included Hegelian absolute knowledge under the category of absolute, l'absolu. The center of this curse, however, cannot be the last. After him, follow the categories of violence and revolt. L'oeuvre défini, the latter, the properly existential is one. These categories testify to the conscious rejection of absolute knowledge by the particular individual. Thought has not led to any real reconciliation and satisfaction, but only on the level of the discourse. Therefore, it must be rejected as useless and harmful to the individual living in the labor society. Here's the violence in history by no means reaching its end, which must now equally be understood in philosophical discourse. After the categories of revolt, there is the Marxian category, l'action, which shows how it's possible to think of a reasonable praxis to achieve precisely that final reconciliation not yet realized on the level of reality. Lastly, the sens and the sagesse are the only formal discourses of philosophy which will have to regulate to an action for an ever greater reasonable universality of ends on board and ends some ways of being, of thinking, of acting. As we read in the category of action, si l'absolu amené à la révolte, ce n'est pas parce qu'il exigerait la cohérence mais parce qu'il l'affirmait à temps d'en par les seuls discours. C'est dans la condition, the modern world of the division of labor, que cette cohérence doit être réalisée, mais elle ne sera pas réalisée par la condition. For this reason, we now, uh, we now know that l'homme qui cherche la sagesse, c'est se vivre dans un monde dont l'histoire est celle de la condition. Il ne pourra pas raisonnablement renoncer à l'action ni l'oublier. Il ne pourra pas quitter les discours. Now, la sagesse est ainsi les dernières catégories. En elle, coïncident formel, les formels et les concrets. En tant que pensée, l'une et l'autre, et ils coïncident pour l'homme qui se sait homme dans sa situation historique. Autrement dit, L'homme dans sa situation, l'homme pensant et agissant dans un sens concret, c'est aussi qu'il pense ses situations et ses déplus quand les pensant dans l'universel formel du sens. Il a cessé de se penser pour penser, penser. Tout en sens et la sagesse est de vivre dans le sens pensé. Les mots de Socrate s'expliquent sans se justifier. 
devenir sage, c'est mûrir. Mais cette renonciation est mort seulement pour ce qui est dépassé et est vie plan et entière pour celui qui, sans renoncer à ce en quoi les mouvements deviennent concrets, se libre réellement en tant que l'homme, en tant que raisonnable. Il ne s'agit point de mûrir au monde, de s'en détacher, de s'en retirer, et il ne s'agit pas d'être sage en dehors ou, du monde ou à côté de lui, mais dans le monde. Dans ce sens, le Hegelian absolute knowledge, the relative and of history, yet to be realized, must now be understood again as a Kantian idea and not all platonic. Science is not only of a regulative, but also formal nature. It, in substance, does not it could prescribe any particular pre predetermined and hypostatized image of an ideal society. While said it's, it's clearly in a 1963 conference at the Sorbonne, in the company of thinkers such as Jean Ball, Father Fossard, Paul Ricoeur, and Raymond Poland. In this conference, by says that je crois en effet qu'il y a une structure du discours, mais c'est une structure et la structure la voir négligée c'est c'est euh, c'est là l'erreur hegelien dont il s'affranchit toujours lorsqu'il travaille dans les concrets ne coïncide jamais avec les structures. In short, for while the Hegel of the elements of philosophy of law who work in the concrete, in the concrete, realize that there could be no real final reconciliation between thoughts and reality, always in progress. A position now totally distant from Poget, aimed to refuse all the new theologies and all the new tyrannies, posing that conference while a deed. Aussi, dois-je dire que dans mon papier, je ne voulais pas parler des conditions d'un discours mortellement cohérent. Je crois que j'ai parlé tout le temps de la recherche d'un tel discours cohérent. Les discours cohérents, si je peux citer un auteur tout à fait à la mode, ou certain Manuel Kant, c'est une idée. Le discours cohérent n'est pas exhaustif, et les discours exhaustifs qui existent peuvent être se caractérisent comme limités, mais ne sont pas cohérents entre eux. Je pourrais donner une autre réponse. S'il doit s'agir d'un discours mutuellement exhaustif, ce serait un compte sens, ce serait un discours divin. Pour Dieu et discours, si cela ne va pas très bien ensemble, on l'a toujours dit. Ou bien, on veut parler d'un discours humain, alors le discours absolument cohérent a sa condition nécessaire et suffisante dans la volonté de cohérence, mais c'est une volonté qui, comme volonté infinie d'un être fini, ne veut dire jamais dans le fini. If I recall the, these passages, it's only to better understand true fundamental questions found in philosophy politique, a 1956 text in which Weil speaks specifically of the word state. Here, it's a question of define what politics is and what relationship the categories of action and wisdom have, have with the concept of world state. In philosophy politique, we can read. La politique visant la science raisonnable et universelle sur le genre humain se distingue ainsi de la morale, la science raisonnable et universelle de l'individu considéré comme représentant de tous les individus, sur lui-même en vue de l'accord raisonnable avec lui-même. Reasonable and universal action is precisely that described in the Marxian category of l'action, a political action that must aim at the realization of wisdom, the regulative ideal par excellence, aim at building a world in which the technical rationality of the labor society can be reconciled with human res reasonableness, with, him, with an encompassing vision, neither sectoral or discriminating, of humanity. In this sense, in this 1956 text, Vai already seemed to strongly criticize the possible outcomes 
of the Hegel-Kojevian discourse, which, moreover, will be described by Kojevian himself with the notes to the 1968 notes in the end of history. L'organisation rationnelle parfaite, by itself, serait la victoire parfaite parfait de l'homme sur la nature extérieure. Elle serait à la fois libération totale de l'homme par rapport à la nature, et elle réaliserait le vide dans l'homme, qui aurait à sa disposition la totalité de son temps, mais n'étant plus qu'être social, n'aurait pas d'emploi sensé pour ce temps. À moins donc que l'homme ne renonce, après la transformation totale de la nature extérieure, à tout sentiment, ce serait le règne de l'ennui. Seul sentiment survivant d'un ennui qui, insatisfait non de ceci ou de cela, de telle imperfection, tel besoin, telle injustice sociale, mais de l'existence même, mènerait rapidement à la destruction par la violence de l'état idéal à temps. Il est sans doute possi possible de penser, sans contradiction, que l'homme s'affranchisse de tout sentiment, même de celui de l'ennui, et que l'humanité s'échange en termes mitaires. Ce qui voudrait dire qu'il n'y aura plus ni problème ni philosophie. Lorsqu'il existe chez des êtres autres que l'homme, un tel, tel état est concevable, il est même observable. Il n'est pas concrètement imaginable comme état humain. On se trouverait avec lui en une post-histoire sans langage sensé et à la limite sans langage instrumental. Après sur les valeurs d'un tel état qui par définition ne connaîtrait aucune valeur, serait une entreprise contradictoire. Pour la philosophie, en tout cas, un autre point de départ est la philosophie. Cet état, cet état n'est pas suitable. L'absence de pensée n'est plus constituée en idéal pour qui pense. For all this reason, the word state is defined as a reasonable ideal of each particular state whose elite will have to aim at the humanizing universalization of individual particular societies, which will thus preserve their internal difference, their morals. This is about arriving at a global social organization in the historical world of the condition. Starting from a dialectical and Hegelian perspective, now by only turn to Kant and Marx. That's to the need to arrive after Hegel at the if effect effective realization of the realm of ends and of freedom. For its part, philosophy will have to educate different subjectivities to the practice of dialogue. Aim at the universalization of their ways of living, talking, thinking, and acting. In short, each particular state will have to aim at the realization of a world in which cosmopolitanism does not remain a dream. The regular mission of a reasonable and universal action on mankind must be constantly confirmed. Therefore, the plan of concrete and historical action once again present itself in all its problematic nature. After all, here understanding history means understanding in view of what it's still necessary to transform it. In this sense, the world state, far from conforming or homogenizing nation, classes, individuals, according to a single possible mode of existence, becomes a universal instrument of social organization. An instrument which can, can also be overcome dialectically in favor of the plurality of peoples. Here is a perspective of wisdom, which overcoming any personal vision of itself and of the world, manages to welcome differ differences in a unitary system of thought, enabled to prescribe predetermined ideal models of existence, or by now considered eternally valid, in the sense of those platonic ideas, as we saw, to which Kojeb seemed to be looking. On the contrary, precisely the presumed hand of history would justify a final universal and homogeneous state, equipped with an apparatus of sages functional to supervise the final truth of things, now revealed by the Hegelian book. And this, as we know, is Kojeb in its various declinations, since his secularized theology, 
could lead to early heaven as well as to early hell. The Russian philosopher knew this well. On the contrary, for Weil, l'état mondial n'est tant que société, n'est pas but en lui-même. Une société mondiale créée par la violence et à l'aide de ce que la violence comporte des rues, des tromperies, des mensonges, des loyautés forcées et non raisonnables, des transforts des responsabilités du citoyen à des hommes du destin, puissant mais ne disposant d'aucune autorité librement reconnue, une telle société ne trouvera pas, pas facilement le chemin de la liberté raisonnable de la loi concrète et de la vertu humaine. Non seulement ces membres auraient des appris de penser, mais ces dirigeants même pourront bien avoir oublié, avant d'être parvenus à but intermédiaire, le but final et l'idée de la dignité de l'homme, de tout homme. Le droit qu'à tout homme des participeurs en tant qu'être raisonnable et qui se soumet à la nécessité sociale, à toutes les décisions, au développement de la morale de la communauté et même à la création d'une communauté et d'une morale nouvelle. Pour le dire d'une autre manière, on pourrait avoir oublié que dans les mondes modernes, être esclave ne peut être rationnellement et raisonnablement que le résultat d'une libre décision de l'individu, celle de ne pas se décider pour soi un but de l'universel. Then it's understood that the world organization cannot totally suppress or standardize the spe specific dif differences of the particular states which will have to become truly free now while perspective, perspective is strongly Kantian. Le but de l'organisation mondiale est la satisfaction des individus raisonnables à l'intérieur d'État libre. I guess that's why it's main concern in the light of the growing globalization of international markets and of the post-historical or post-modern theories was were beginning to emerge in this time was to preserve both the concept of equality of social condition and that of individual freedom. In this sense, equality could not be reduced to pure conformism and pure uniformity to a single mode of existence believed to be the last possible. The price to pray, in fact, was the imposition of new post-democratic tyrannies, a concern that also belonged to Leo Strauss, despite his well-known negative judgments about Weil, confided precisely to Kogel, and several times, has emerged but from his letter to Kogel on the final state, dated August 22, 19. 48, as well as from other philosophical and political writings. Indeed, Kojev, in 1968, would seem to become aware precisely of the conclusion already entreated by Strauss. In conclusion, I'd like to recall a passage from Philosophy Politique in which Weil proposed a solution to reduce the growing economic and social inequalities between um, developed and backward countries on a global scale, a fundamental condition to be able to implement a fair universal organization of societies. Dans chaque cas, les conditions sur le plan mondial ne sont jamais telles qu'il serait impossible d'éliminer les manques, les gaspillages, les mauvais, les mauvais emplois des hommes. Un manque absolu des matières pourrait, en effet, se produire mais ne s'est jamais produit dans les temps modernes et ne se dessine nulle part. Tout au plus, serait-il nécessaire de procéder à un nivellement mondial du niveau de vie afin de pouvoir réserver une partie du travail des sociétés évoluées à la création des biens de production requis pour élever les degrés de productivité des sociétés retardataires et ainsi les niveaux mondial moyen. Le concept d'une surproduction globale, d'autre part, est contradictoire en lui-même. La consommation humaine et sa totalité ne connaît pas de limites et une abondance de produits permettrait de distribuer avec plus d'égalité et d'équité les biens principaux tirés de la lutte avec la nature, à savoir le temps libre, cette partie de l'existence biologique non consacrée au travail nécessaire à la vie. 
Now it's clear how their tendencies of international politics in the last 50 years have gone in, com have gone in a completely different direction. Here, while, for example, does not seem to consider the problem of the growing scarcity of natural resources or the ecological environmental one at all, remains a child of this time. However, when he speaks of an international policy based on the redistribution of wealth and therefore of free time, he seems to assume a sort of giver or donor capitalism, which Kojev himself will express in 1957 in Dusseldorf. See his intervention on colonialism from a European perspective. The links with Smith's philosophy are evident in this text. A question anticipated by Kojev in other terms in his 1945 writing on the Latin Empire, a non imperialistic empire. There it was already about resolving the colonial question and the relationship with the Arab countries in the Latin European sphere. sphere. But I think the politician and philosopher Kojev, even more than Weil, ended, ended up taking an increasing, increasingly disillusioned perspective, both on his present and on the future of politics and philosophy in a violently globalized world. A tragic irony remains. The note to the note of 1968 can be a proof of this. On the one hand, the negative reanimalization of man. After all, the USA and the Soviet Union arrived at the same encompassing homogeneity of society and of the existence. On the other, the pure mimesy of the conflict, Japanese formalism, in which the opposition between subject and object can now only be mimicked. But this also involves an awareness of the decline of modern society, of struggle, of work, of democracy in the full sense, as the main tools for human emancipation. Here, what's left of Western societies is a logic of surveillance. Thank you. So welcome back, everybody. Now it's my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Danilo Scholz, uh, who comes from Essen, Germany, Kulturwissenschaftliches Institut, and he will speak about how not to make history a guide for the perplexed by Strauss and Kojet. Please, Danilo. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just... Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, I'm really glad to, to join you today. It's always a, a great pleasure when the community of Kujev scholars gather and exchange, and it's almost a, a nice tradition at this stage. I um, also want to apologize for coming a little late. My flight was delayed, and I came straight from the airport. Uh, but even though this sort of lateness is obviously not very German, um, I'm going to use, because I'm not, I think it's a little bit boring for, for, for you if I just sort of read very long quotes, so uh, uh, you see them on the slides, some people can't sort of follow a conversation or a presentation by also looking at the quotes. What I'll say is also just go here and just treat it as a footnote, as it were, and if you're interested, you can um, sort of just compare it with what I say. Uh, also, it would be nice if, it's, uh, if I miss a slide or if it's completely uh, um, out of sync with what I say, just do alert me, raise your hand. Um, and I think since time is precious, I'll just start. Now, when delving into the rich intellectual dialogue between Alexander Kuzhev and Leo Strauss, one is presented with a myriad of angles to explore. My talk will consist mostly of unpacking the title, How Not to Make History a Guide for the Perplexed by Strauss and Kuzhev, and I will try to unravel the captivating layers of their exchange by focusing on three pivotal aspects of history. The first key dimension lies obviously in the epistemological realm, encompassing Strauss and Kozhev's respective attitudes towards history and historicism. And secondly, their intellectual dialogue extends into the political sphere, quite obviously, where between the lines their stances towards the tumultuous political developments of the 20th century come to the fore, 
And lastly, the <clears throat> historiographical aspect of their exchange also takes center stage, obviously, as their interpretations of past thinkers shape their own philosophical framework. That's also about the certain view on the history of philosophy, of course. And I think by exploring uh, these three fundamental dimensions, I hope to provide some insights into how Strauss and Kozhev sought to guide those perplexed by the intricacies of understanding, writing, as well as making history. So this is just the, the roadmap. Um, so that you always know where you're at, uh, what I'm trying to do today. And I'm also, I'm, I'm really glad this is because I, I, I as some of you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working uh, on a, uh, for a German publisher on an, on an intellectual biography of, of Kozhev, uh, even though I already know it, it won't be able to rival the work of Marco. But um, one one reason why it's not been done yet is that I found it always very frustrating to get a really good handle on, on the relationship between Leo Strauss and Alexander Kozhev. I find it much easier to, to kind of write with a certain confidence about, say, the correspondence between uh, Karl Schmidt and uh, Kozhev. And it's, 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 it's far trickier uh, um, in the case of Strauss and Kozhev. And I'll try to explain reasons for that as well. Now, we publication history, obviously, when you think about their dialogue, you think about, uh, above all, about one book. Um, the publication history of On Tyranny, that's Leo Strauss's book, has undoubtedly contributed uh, to the enduring fascination surrounding the book. Initially published in 1948, the book was presented in its original form with only Strauss's commentary um, um, in, 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 in English, and I'll come back to that. In 1954, a French edition titled De la Tyrannie was released, featuring an extensive critique by Kozhev entitled um, initially L'Action Politique des Philosophes, later um, Tyranny and Wisdom. And it also included a response from Strauss in the form of a restatement, mise au point in French, addressing Kozhev's critique. Then you had in 1963 an English edition that appeared, which included not only the aforementioned editions, but also a translation of a classical dialogue uh, about which Strauss had written, that was Xenophon's Hiero. And nearly 30 years later, another new edition emerged featuring revised translations and the inclusion of a complete correspondence between Strauss and Konjev. So you have this funny funny case of a book that initially was very slight. I think it used to be 80 pages. And now in this of the latest edition is a 2013 Chicago University Press edition. And I think it's exceeding 300 pages. So it's quite, it's a, it's a growth industry, if you will. Uh, a frustrating element when I say, why is it tricky to write about Strauss? A frustrating element is, of course, that Strauss hits so well behind the classical authors uh, that it could be hard to pin down his own convictions, yeah, and uh, that's why I will dwell at certain length today because we are all we are all more or less familiar with how Kozhev's behavior in that debate, and it's it's it's, it's I want to just provide some background today as well uh, in Strauss's case. It is uh, quite significant, I think, that Leo Strauss uh, classified his intellectual project not as political theory, but as political philosophy, uh, or even more precisely, as political philosophizing. Yeah, as politisches Philosophieren is, is the German term he kind of preferred the most. And if you want a Greek word, um, Strauss was a, a zetetic philosopher. Yeah, um, and I'll explain that word in a second. The contrast then with Kozhev from the beginning is really striking. Kozhev merged this sort of very funny, entertaining foible for provocation with his um, very strong will to systematicity. Yeah, that's always uh, every project, even though they, they may not be finished in the end, every project is systematic always. Strauss, on the other hand, shies away from system building and contents himself with kind of searching movement. Yeah, I mean, true to the legacy of Socrates and Plato, his two <laughs> intellectual heroes, it was all about asking the right questions, and never being too certain that truth is within one's grasp. And I think this is what zetetic means, to proceed by inquiry. And if you try to sort of pinpoint Strauss's political ideas, it can feel a little bit something like uh, nailing jelly to a wall. Now, and most of us are here obviously familiar with Kozhev's biography, so I restrict myself to kind of whistle-stop tour of the most important episodes in the exchange between Strauss and Kozhev. Uh, interestingly, compared to the other formative epistolary exchange between um, um, with Carl Schmidt, which was very intense, but sort of went on for a little more than three years. 
the correspondence between Strauss and Kuzhev was much more sustained, really, and spanning almost four decades, initially from 1932 uh, to 1965, and more recently, um, Emmanuel Petard located a final letter from Strauss dated May 1968. So this is a very long period for such heavyweight to stay in touch. Now, how did they get to know each other? As so often they met in Paris late, late 1932, through the good offices of Alexandre Curé, I think even in his apartment. And Strauss had obtained a Rockefeller scholarship, as most of you know, courtesy of Carl Schmitt's letter of recommendation. And in, in, in Paris, and that's already quite interesting, in Paris, uh, Strauss attended both Curé's and the first year of Kuzhev's Hegel seminar. And then after that, he went to England. And I think judging by Strauss's effusive letters uh, to his German friends, his encounter with Kuzhev had all the trappings of what you might call an intellectual uh, bromance. Strauss confided to Karl Löwe that he met a very clever and very friendly Russian with whom Strauss at least can agree on what they disagree about. Yet Strauss also lamented uh, Kuzhev's inclination towards erotic adventures, and he encouraged Kuzhev to focus on work instead. How successful that advice is, I leave that to others to judge. Now, in a footnote to his 1936 book, The Political Philosophy of Thomas Hobbes, Strauss even announced that, I quote, Mr. Alexander Kuzhevnikov and the writer intend to undertake a detailed investigation of the connection between Hobbes and Hegel, but the two men did not make good on their promise and the project came to nothing. Uh, Strauss then... Uh, I'll just try, but this is, yeah, um, no, this is not the one. In um, Strauss and could you have a copy of his Hobbes book and inscribed, inscribed it with an awestruck dedication, and as soon as um, Kuzhev's uh, Introduction à la lecture de Hegel appeared, Kuzhev dispatched a copy to Strauss, who congratulated him on this accomplishment. Strauss even crowned Kuzhev the most brilliant philosophical spokesperson for philosophical modernity. Yeah. The publication of Untyranny in 1948 occurred also at a very interesting moment in Strauss's trajectory. For a start, it was the first monograph uh, he wrote in America. Uh, and by then, Strauss had already been living in the US for almost 10 years. In fact, on Turini, it was the first book he wrote in English as well. Yeah? I mean, the political philosophy of Hobbes originally appeared in English in 36, but it had to be translated since Strauss penned the manuscript in German. On Turini is also, and that tends to be forgotten, on Turini is, um, was also Strauss's first book length analysis of a thinker of antiquity. Uh, um, there's also professional dimension to all this. In 1949, he had become a professor of political science at the University of Chicago, and that was for him quite a significant move up the career ladder. By the mid-1950s, Strauss had definitely made a name for himself um, within the field, as evidenced by a ranking conducted by the American Political Science Association, which placed him ninth. So he was the ninth most uh, important uh, political scientist of the American post-war era. That was, I think, 55, 56 of that statistic. So even when Strauss sort of reached the zenith of his renown, Kuzhev always loomed in the background of his teaching at Chicago. Yeah, over the last years, thankfully, the transcripts of Strauss's lectures at Chicago have been made available, and Kuzhev makes a cameo uh, appearance in both the 1958 and the 1965 lecture course on Hegel that Strauss taught. And there again, he singled uh, Kuzhev out as the scholar who, I quote, wrote probably the best book on Hegel in this generation. But let's take a closer look now at the debate between Kuzhev and Strauss. Now, I will dwell at some length on their differences of opinion, but certain philosophical affinities uh, also ought to be mentioned, I think. The first is obviously the peculiar influence of uh, Martin Heidegger, and, and I think what is what is notable, uh, it's, it's a very, very similar um, attitude towards Heidegger. What is notable is that both Strauss and Kuzhev feel the need to distance themselves from Heidegger precisely because in crucial respects their writing bears the imprint. Yeah? Uh, 
of the author of Sein and Zeit, they're indebted to Heidegger intellectually in very significant ways. And I think it's like a philosophical school they went through. And as we often, as was often the sort of patricidal case, they disowned the very teacher who had a formative impact on their philosophical worldview. For Kujev, the influence, as you know, was mediated by Coiré. For Strauss, it was really more direct because I think he attended the Davos um, debate between uh, Heidegger and, 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 and Strauss's PhD supervisor, Ernst Kassir, in 29. And I think what really left a mark on Strauss's thinking, again, that's not, I think, appreciated in the existing research enough, is obviously that that um, this whole obsession with antiquity um, that was that, that, that this, this you find traces in there of Heidegger's concept of the destruction of a modern canon. And Heinrich Meyer has also found in, in an early, if you see that, an early version of a Hobbes book where uh, kind of Strauss scribbled in that, okay, this whole idea of why we need to look at, uh, go back to the Greeks, basically, is something I picked up from, from Martin Heidegger. And uh, obviously, as Strauss so often did, he erases his traces and that's then deleted in the published version. Um, so that was definitely one source for Strauss's reorientation in turn to ancient Greek and to a lesser extent Roman philosophy. So you have to kind of like Heidegger with the destruction of a, of a canon, you have to kind of grind down and strip away the layers of a modern philosophical corpus to get back to the classical thinkers of antiquity. I think this is really a gesture at least partly inspired by Heidegger. Now it's not as clear that, or just as clear, that Heidegger ends up in Strauss's uh, crosshairs. For Strauss, Heidegger represents the epitome of historicism. Yeah, I mean, a kind of 19th century historicist posited that each era needs to be judged according to its own standards. Heidegger went one step further and radicalized historical thinking. He turned historicity, Geschichtlichkeit is a German term, but wasn't really a word until Heidegger, into a fundamental category of human Dasein. And Strauss left little doubt that the obsession over historicity, of, of, of facing up to the fateful challenges uh, um, of one's time, left Heidegger really susceptible to the siren song of National Socialism. So his, historicism, in, in, in Strauss's views, opens the floodgates of relativism and amounts in practice very often to a loss of one's moral compass. According to Strauss, the loss of faith in reason within Western thought was a fundamental issue that existed right from the early stages of modernity. And so each subsequent effort to address this problem, whether undertaken by historicists or their enemies, only served to exacerbate it and exacerbate the crisis further. Kujev's take was slightly different. I mean, I've written elsewhere about Kujev's engagement with the German historicist tradition, but anyone familiar again with the Kujev papers at the French National Library will have seen the numerous reviews Kujev wrote in the late 1920s and throughout the 1930s. A lot of them tackle the authors associated with the historicist wave. There are reviews of Wilhelm Diltai's work, obviously. You'll find comments on Georg Misch, who was the son-in-law of Diltai and the editor of Diltai's collected works in Germany. You come across traces of Ernst Trolsch, notably in the PhD dissertation of, of, of Kujev. So for Kujev, the, 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 uh, and, and Kujev takes their contribution very, very seriously. Yeah? I mean, it's far from him to sort of excoriate historicism for Kujev. The readiness to deal with a given epoch of a past on its own terms represents genuine progress. There's one caveat, though, and it's decisive. Relativism is indeed a danger that needs to be banished, but how to be a radical historicist without ceding an inch to relativism? And I think Konjev's ingenious solution is that, uh, to that seemingly intractable problem is that genuine knowledge of things past is possible, but only in the post-historical era. Yeah, that, that the sort of the end of history and radical historicism are two sides of the same coin for Konjev. Um, and that, of course, becomes a huge bone of contention between Strauss and Kujer, who re Strauss rejected this view as sort of logically improbable and ethically inadmissible, I think. For Strauss, historicism yielded paradoxical results. The more humans strove to define themselves not as natural but as historical beings, the more like they lost sight of a bigger picture. Let's take a closer look at the debate sparked by Strauss's on tyranny and at the protagonist there. Yeah. I mean, it needs to be said in fairness that Leo Strauss's arduous and bone dry methodological approach did not endear him to everyone. In his review in the journal Commentary, the German born uh, intellectual George Lichtheim claimed that the book attracts readers not because, but in spite of Strauss's scholarly commentary. I mean, it's a very, it's, it's a hilarious review, all of it. I recommend it. And um, 
In fact, Lichtheim dismissed Strauss's esoteric reading as puffed up mumbo jumbo and argued that the full meaning of xenophone can be grasped by an intelligent schoolboy at the first reading. Uh, I have not seen Heinrich Meyer quote this. Um, as far as political understanding goes, Lichtheim continued, there is not much to be got out of xenophone and any other minor Socratic. The hero is in fact tried. So Strauss duly got wind of that review and uh, reported to Gershom Scholem about the fellow who was led not only to despise me as a hopeless reactionary, which I am indeed, but also as a victim of indoctrination through the humanistic gymnasium. Um, let us briefly pause to consider the author, the Greek author who serves as a backdrop for the dispute between Strauss and Kozhev. Why Xenophon? Strauss had some explaining to do. Um, Why Xenophon? Why on earth enter the fray of contemporary debates by providing an almost line-to-line -line exegesis of a minor Greek author who is often mocked because students learning Greek have to toil through the aridity of his prose? Now, Xenophon is really a textbook author in the negative sense of the term. He is chosen for the simplicity of his language rather than the lofty heights to which he elevates thought. I also have very vivid memories of, of, of Greek lessons in school where, I mean, that's that's what you give 16-year-olds when, they, uh, when, when, they, when they're learning Greek, basically. And by the late 1930s, that's very interesting, Strauss had discovered another xenophon, yeah, and, and, and one that sort of proudly and insightfully carries the torch of wisdom. And in a letter to his close friend, Jakob Klein, Strauss even gushed that xenophon was, I quote, his special favorite because he had the courage to, uh, um, because he had the courage to go through the millenniums doing in his writings exactly what Socrates did in his life. And uh, Strauss had also lectured by then quite extensively at the, at the New School for Social Research in New York, where he taught prior to his um, recruitment by the University of Chicago. Now, the impression, I'm not going to go into much detail, the impression one takes away from reading Strauss's On Tyranny is that Strauss starts to inquire into the meaning of tyranny and ends up relativizing the importance of politics per se. That's very interesting. So we, 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 the answers he comes up with uh, towards the end are not those that uh, the, don't respond to the questions he raised at the beginning of his text, um, and that has reasons as well. And sort of over the course of a dialogue uh, you have um, between the poet Simonides and the tyrant Hiero, political life really reveals its limitations yeah, and the narrowness of its scope when compared to the sort of philosophical life, which directs its gaze not primarily towards citizens, but towards nature and the true human good. The takeaway, I guess, would be that for Strauss, one way of not falling into the trap of tyranny is to moderate our expectations concerning politics, not to expect too much from politics. That's, I think, a big, big, big esoteric, exoteric, I you decide, teaching of Strauss. Um, in the summer of 1948, uh, Strauss asked Kozhev point blank, point blank whether he would be willing to review on tyranny, flattering him to win him over. I mean, you will be familiar with that correspondence. Um, and, and in December, because Kozhev hadn't really done anything, because in December Strauss reiterated the request and declared that Kozhev is one of only three people on the planet to get what Strauss is trying to do. And Kozhev then finally relented and got down to work in the first six months of 1949. Uh, unfortunately, he ended up producing a text that was way too long for publication in the journal Critique. The published version we have is therefore quite heavily truncated and deprived of most footnotes, for instance. Yeah. And uh, we, it is thanks to the efforts, again, of Emmanuel Patard that we now possess a critical edition of, of, of um, Kuzhev's review of Strauss, um, Tyranny and Wisdom, that is 20, almost 20 pages longer than the published version. Now, Strauss overall was pleased with Kuzhev's results. Finally, someone represented philosophical modernity in a scintillatingly honest and straightforward fashion. That is, I think, a rather magnanimous response uh, from Strauss, for Kuzhev did not exactly wear kid gloves in his treatment of Strauss. Kuzhev has little time for Strauss's image of a philosopher as engaged in a quest for truth that is only partly reconcilable with the demands of political life. Uh, Kuzhev really, as you know, calls on the philosopher to play an active role in achieving the Hegelian objective of a universal and homogeneous state governed by mutual recognition. And according to him, the philosopher's proofs need to be verified in the turmoil of history um, and withdrawing into solitude, as suggested by Strauss, would only lead to a kind of solipsism that has foregone all possibilities of effecting change. 
what is more, renouncing tyranny as a matter of principle could condemn a given state to ex uh, extinction, could you have, right? Yeah, sometimes if you want to carry out a project of political emancipation, you need a strong man to enforce it. So Khrushchev's answer to the question of whether philosophers ought to be willing to advise dictators was a resounding yes. And the high road, the, sort of the tyrant of antiquity, for Khrushchev, high road does not even deserve the name tyrant. For according to Khrushchev, high road acts not like a tyrant, but like a quote, a good liberal, he does nothing, decides nothing, and allows Simonides to speak and to depart in peace. In passages that were excised in the published version of Khrushchev's tyranny and wisdom, Khrushchev goes further and attacks head on both Strauss's return to the ancients, Strauss's embrace of the idea of a more or less immutable human nature, and Strauss's belittling of historical thinking. I mean, this is quite a full on statement that is sort of in Emmanuel Tatar's critical edition, where really, uh, I mean, he sort of pulls out all the stops. Um, I mean, as you can see from there already, I think nature, nature occupies an intriguing place in the quarrel between Khrushchev and Strauss. Here again, the epistemology, even the ontology, is tied to fundamental political questions. Strauss begins by remarking that Khrushchev did not make his own all of Hegel's philosophy. Uh, Khrushchev discarded, as stated, Hegel's philosophy of nature, and Khrushchev subscribed to an ontological dualism that he claimed to have borrowed from Heidegger. I think in one of the previous uh, Khrushchev conferences, I mean, uh, Ovidio gave also an excellent paper on, on, on how exactly um, Khrushchev um, engages with Heidegger's thinking. And, and then this ontological dualism drew, in any case, a sharp dividing line between the realm of nature, which, despite the changes occurring within it, uh, remains essentially identical to itself and the realm of human activity in history, which is driven by man's negating activity and therefore fundamentally marked by radical contingent change. Yet Strauss doesn't let Khrushchev get off the hook so easily. How, he wonders, can Khrushchev maintain the circularity of Hegelian system if he severs the very ties between nature and humanity that unified Hegel's uh, system and made the circularity possible in the first place? Khrushchev interrupted, as it were, the ontological flow between humankind and nature, and that has far-reaching political consequences too. Strauss places, as I said, Khrushchev squarely among the modern thinkers who call for humanity that self-consciously creates its own destiny. And that means breaking free from the shackles of nature only to enslave nature in turn. Yeah? I mean, such as the hubristic self-empowerment of humanity, that is something that uh, Strauss feels very angry about, and then you kind of can follow it up in his uh, book, City of Man. Um, so the real, you might say that the real victim of a master slave dialectic is the natural environment. And this is why Strauss, when pushed to determine the defining traits of modern dictatorship, and he's very reticent to do that, but when you really push him, what makes modern dictatorship different from so the ancient uh, tyrannies, um, he points to the exploitation of nature and to the use of science. Yeah, that is also present-day tyranny, in contradistinction to classical tyranny, is based on the unlimited progress of what Strauss calls the conquest of nature, which is made possible by modern science. That is sort of a defining trait, trait of, of, of modern, modern day dictatorships. Another aspect of Krzysztof's thought that found itself in the firing line of Leo Strauss was the end of history thesis. It's quite clear that always attracts a lot of controversy and Strauss voiced very grave doubts whether the end state theorized by Khrushchev would truly bring about the universal satisfaction of a human desire for recognition. Nor did Strauss believe that wisdom at the end of history, that sort of great prize Khrushchev dangles before the eyes of his readers, can ever be within the reach of the many. In my opinion, that's a far more astute criticism of Khrushchev. The idea of who will be able to attain wisdom at the end of history is, 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 is not adequately resolved in the introduction à la lecture de Hegel. And Strauss, as you look, when you look at the quote, Strauss conjures a sort of desolate landscape. And you, you wouldn't hear that from him. He's, you know, he's not, he's not Jakob Taubes. Strauss doesn't like this order, but he conjures this, this, this uh, uh, weird desolate landscape where violence against the world state might be the only form of genuine human action at the disposal of the denizens of a post histoire and that's just, I mean, in French you would say, uh, uh, that, that um, 
that's why it always bothers me when people say that the, the sort of like the great um, the person who has done most to update uh, Kujel's thinking for the late 20th century is, is Fukuyama, and it's kind of, it couldn't be further from the truth because if you if, if, if you read the end of history, the whole skeptical streak in there about the whole last man element, it's what he is is really it's a hybrid of Strauss and and Kujel and and Paul Sager, who's at University College London, has written an excellent essay on that. That really. What, what Fukuyama does is already someone who's read the exchange and sort of tried to synthesize that. Um, the end of history, just to sort of um, uh, finish that uh, line of inquiry here, the end of history remained an abiding concern for Strauss. In his 1958 lecture on Hegel, he depicted the post histoire as a frightening prospect that has all the traits of Oswald Spengler's pronouncement on the decline of the West. And a few, as most of you, I mean, it's probably too too small to read that, but I, I can't read it. Um, but uh, I don't know whether it was Marco or Massimo that, because um, I thought it wasn't the case, but uh, you, you do find an annotated copy of, of the, the decline of the West in, 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 in Kujev's philosophical library at the BNF. So uh, it, it's, it's not that far-fetched to compare, um, to, to kind of draw up comparison to Oswald Spengler. Um, and even in, I think, in Strauss's most sympathetic rendering of the end of history, Khrushchev's world state is, I quote Strauss, an entity somewhere between the present-day United States and present-day Soviet Russia, meaning more socialism than we have now in the United States and more liberty than you have now in Soviet Russia. So I think so central was the role of nature, as I said, on the one hand, and the end of history, Strauss's criticism of Khrushchev, but he grew somewhat impatient when he felt Khrushchev skirted the issue and failed to address Strauss's objections adequately. That's a shorter one, and that's quite clear. So if you look, these are basically um, the two issues I wanted you to tackle, and you haven't done so in our correspondence. Um, where Khrushchev did meet Strauss halfway, obviously, was in his portrayals of post-historical individuals. Yeah, in its first version, I mean, if you look at it in, in the introduction like to the Hegel, the first edition, the end of history is almost painted, or in the esquisse du phénoménologie du droit, it's almost painted in the bright colors of a socialist paradise. And that horizon soon darkened, partly because Khrushchev conceded to Strauss. And if you look at this quote, for instance, I mean, again, it's, 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 it's very well known that uh, Khrushchev comes up with, I think, one of the most dystopian takes on the end of history in his correspondence with Strauss, and that is more than a de decade prior to the famous footnote in the in the second edition of Introduction à la Lecture de Hegel, where the people living at the end of history are virtually all deprived of humanity, all that is left are automata, healthy automata, sick automata, ruling automata, and it makes a really depressing reading, and it kind of sounds like it could have been taken out of Stanley Kubrick's Clockwork Orange. Um, Strauss's I'll come now to the issue of sort of totalitarianism in the 20th century. Strauss's on tyranny did obviously not emerge in isolation, but rather within a broader context of political scientists grappling with a profound impact of total war and the emergence of collectivist tyrannies exemplified by Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia. And the publication of Strauss's book coincided with the influential analysis just to give you a bit of sort of context, what people were writing at the time uh, of the rise of fascism presented by Horkheimer and Adornan, the Dialectic of Enlightenment, it also preceded a wave of books addressing similar themes, including Karl Popper's The Open Society and Its Enemies, Anna Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, and of course Raymond, uh, Raymond Aron's Democracy in, in, in Totalitarianism. And I think it's very, it's very useful to place um, the on tyranny exchange in that context, and then you can also see what this exchange between Strauss and Kujev achieves and what it doesn't achieve. And these, I think these works collectively contributed to the sort of intellectual exploration of historical context and ideological underpinnings of totalitarian regimes. When the journal, oh, it's also very small, but that is, is, is a scan of a back cover of Critique, the issue of February 49, when the journal Critique announced in February 49 Kujev's response to Strauss, the contemporary overtones were very clear, but this was to be a piece on, I quote, xenophone and dictatorship, not tyranny, dictatorship. And as it happened, the piece didn't come out for another year and not under that name either. Now, in the beginning of his book on tyranny, Strauss too does acknowledge what he calls the horrors of the 20th century, and he criticizes modern political science for failing to recognize a form of tyranny that surpasses what past thinkers could have imagined. 
But in the subsequent text, he does not analyze the regimes of Stalin or Hitler. Interestingly, these two names um, are absent from the original study on tyranny. Yeah? I mean, how does Strauss justify this initial omission? Well, he contends that he, he says, it's a quote, a basic stratum of modern tyranny remains for all practical purposes in unintelligible to us if we do not have recourse to the political science of a classic. So the idea is, yes, political, modern tyranny and, 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 and ancient tyranny are different, but we can't understand the modern variety without looking at the ancient one first. And it's only in response, in his restatements, only in response to Kujer that Strauss really discusses contemporary dictators uh, by name. I mean, Kujer had declared that the ideal tyranny described in such utopian terms by Simonides has in fact been actualized in the 20th century by Stalin, obviously, uh, and uh, curious enough, also by the Portuguese dictator Salazar, who crops up. Um, just again, a quick aside, Strauss on the other hand, he's convinced that he doesn't accept that Salazar is a tyrant. He says he's just a post-constitutional ruler, uh, which tells you a lot about Strauss's political thought as well. Um, and um, as for Stalin, I think it won't, uh, Stalin won't come as a surprise to you that Strauss abhorred the world that came into being in the wake of the October Revolution. Strauss was never a naive champion of American supremacy, but God did he hate the Soviet Union. Strauss routinely described the USSR as just one quote, as a barbaric and cruel, narrow-minded and cunning foreign enemy who is kept in check only by the justified fear that whatever would bury us would bury him too. Yeah, so only nuclear deterrence and the balance of terror prevented the Kremlin from acting out its expansionist desires. And as for Khrushchev's self-proclaimed Stalinism, it disturbed Strauss a great deal. This really disturbed him. But Strauss also thought it was a pose. It was a pose, a case of sort of armchair radicalism by someone who can pledge allegiance to Moscow from the safety of Paris. And in 1949, there's a delicious quote, Strauss wrote to uh, Eric Vögelin that I quote, Khrushchev calls himself a Stalinist, but surely, if he spent any length of time in the Soviet Union, he'd end up facing the firing squad. By the end of his discussion with Khrushchev, Strauss seems to have changed the topic and sidestepped the topic of tyranny. Yeah, he no longer grapples with tyrannies, ancient and modern, as he had announced, but he's buried deeply into an investigation into the nature of politics. As he explained in his important 1953 book, Natural Right and History, which I think elucidates in more detail many, many of the issues he had broached with Khrushchev, the main problem of politics as viewed through the lens of classic philosophy is this. How can you reconcile the requirement of, um, for wisdom with the requirement for consent? And I think it's quite evident from passages such as these that for Strauss, and that's a very, very interesting point, and I think I would need more time, and I, I, I'll continue to think about it, that for Strauss, civic morality, citizen morality, ranks lower than the pursuit of truth. That's why it goes to such great lengths in the dialogue to say, well, what do we actually do if we have a really virtuous tyrant? Uh, um, and the, the kind of, for Strauss, because that's for odd that he's kind of, he always called it a political philosophy, but political life for Strauss is necessary only in so far as it enables for philosophic life. That's very important, I think. Now then, I, the most, I think the, the, the most, um, ungratifying aspect in, in, in preparing this talk was obviously, so, okay, what does Strauss then think on non-tyrannical regimes? What is his view on liberal democracy? And he's, you have to, it's, it's all scattered. He never, he, he never, in, we never got an interview with him on like his view on American foreign policy, obviously. And I think what I can say is this, I mean, Strauss does obviously not dabble in sort of high-minded schemes for the improvement of mankind. His thought more closely resembles a kind of exercise in damage limitation. Yeah, it would be a mistake to attribute Strauss's support for modern liberal democracy to purely negative considerations. True, liberal democracy acts as a safeguard against both left-wing and right-wing tyrannies. And while this aspect is indeed part of Strauss's views, it is not the whole story. In addition to its defensive function, Strauss recognized and appreciated the inherent merits and positive qualities inherent in liberal democracy. As he wrote in his rejoinder to Khrushchev, liberal or constitutional democracy comes closer to what the classics demanded than any alternative that is viable in our age. Having said that, and I think that needs to be pointed out as well, Strauss's was a very odd brand of liberalism. For one, 
he distinguished between what he calls the liberalism of the ancients. I mean, it's also funny to posit that they had a liberal uh, thinking, the liberalism of the ancients and the liberalism of the moderns in a way that gives away some of his sympathies. Yeah, I think the genuine classical liberally, liberal embodies qualities of republicanism and gentlemanliness. The modern liberal, on the other hand, rejects the existence of fixed norms and believes that all norms are subject to historical change. And I think this modern form of liberalism is characterized as of optimistic, democratic, and egalitarian, and it comes with certain risks. Strauss was not a huge fan of it. And that's why he was so insistent that we need to hold on. I mean, he would definitely be someone when all these sort of um, controversies of identity politics and what we do with our cultural canon, he would definitely be on, on the side of saying we need to hold on. To, to, to the legacy of these past thinkers, otherwise we'll be completely lost in the present. Yeah, I mean, that's I, I think important to read the Strauss wrote, the greatest enemies of civilization in civilized countries are those who squander the heritage because they look down on it or on the past. Civilization is much less endangered by narrow but loyal preservers than by the shallow and glib futurists who, being themselves rootless, try to destroy all roots and thus do everything in their power in order to bring back the initial chaos and promiscuity. There's also, I guess, the not so minor matter of this weird epigraph of on tyranny. Yeah? I mean, this is, uh, uh, Strauss chooses a quote from the Whig historian Thomas Babington Macaulay, who was known for his liberal leanings, and yet the intention behind this epigraph in on tyranny is to provoke contemplation or imply at least that modern liberal systems, which uphold the freedom to criticize the government, can paradoxically lead to a form of mental debasement and enslavement. It also won't surprise you that Strauss couldn't get on board with the exuberant rationalism of the Enlightenment. I think that was a lesson inculcated by Nietzsche he found impossible to unlearn. As Strauss wrote in his late essay, Three Waves of Modernity, the critique of modern rationalism or of a belief in reason by Nietzsche cannot be dismissed or forgotten. This is the deepest reason for the crisis of liberal democracy. And I think that sets light, uh, tight limits on transformative political endeavors. Communists may have dreamt of a new Soviet man, but liberal Democrats of Strauss's ilk knew that although wise institutions could improve human condition, they would never change human nature. So Strauss feared what he considered a delusional sense of feasibility, Machbarkeitswahn is a nice German word, that beset the modern mind. Obviously, the experience of the Weimar Republic imbued Strauss with a profound fear of the irrational masses. Lest we forget, when Strauss engages with Khrushchev's claim that philosophers are forever in danger of living in bubbles of like-minded people, that's Khrushchev's accusations, Strauss repost is that if he had to choose between a philosophical sect and a modern mass party, he would always choose the sect. For Strauss, the key to preventing democracy from becoming ruled by the uneducated poor lies in the presence of a robust middle class. Strauss also had a dim view of consumer culture and popular culture. As a general tendency, technology reliably lowers the standards of cultural achievement, which in turn could impact politics negatively. Yeah, and I think that uh, Strauss believed that this sort of prevalent mass culture undermines the quest and pursuit of excellence. Strauss was therefore, and that's important with the history of Straussianism in, in the US, Strauss was a big believer in what the Americans call liberal education. I guess Europeans might refer to a humanist, neo-humanist education. Liberal education uh, is the ladder by which modern man, that's the quote, by which modern man tries to ascend from mass democracy to democracy as originally meant. Liberal education is the necessary endeavor to found an aristocracy within democratic mass society and this is why it was never a coincidence that Strauss formed a school and gave birth to a lot of little Straussians that to this day thrive in university departments in the US. I think Strauss's outlook on education was unabashedly elitist and this, I think, uh, sort of intellectually taxing forming of young minds he envisaged that would only be the reserve of a chosen few. And in this programmatic attachment to education in the classics, Strauss obviously harkened back to the days of the Platonic Academy, that was always the idea, yeah? where like-minded future philosophers would undergo an intense instruction at the hands of a mentor. I'm coming to my conclusion now. In my final section, I want to turn to the afterlife of this debate. How did contemporaries judge the outcome of a debate between Strauss and Kozhev? I mean, if you uh, look at what was the name, Timothy Burns, they had a lovely edited volume. I mean, I, I do sometimes find them very amusing, Strauss, they had an edited volume devoted entirely to the debate. And they, they judged who won the debate. And then two Straussians said Strauss won. And the other, the counterpersonal was that it, 
<laughs> undecided. But uh, no one thought that Kozhev had anything uh, interesting to say. Um, how did other contemporaries judge it? I mean, we have already heard that George Lichtheim sided unequivocally with Kozhev. Perhaps more unexpectedly, Alexandre Coiré considered Strauss's restatement by far the most cogent and compelling part of a debate. Yeah. Uh, what is more, Coiré thought that Strauss went far too easy on Kozhev, whom Coiré accused of sophistry. As someone who had spent the Vichy years in exile in New York, Coiré frowned upon Kozhev's defense of dictatorship. And Coiré took it to be bad ethical taste. In the broadsheet uh, Le Monde, uh, um, Jean Lacroix uh, um, praised uh, Kozhev as a man that doesn't mince his words and expresses himself, it's quite a beautiful French uh, turn of phrase, with a purity and toughness worthy of a diamond. Here's another lingering after effect of that debate. Thanks to Strauss, Kozhev discovered the joys of esoteric writing and dabbled himself in uncovering the carefully concealed meaning of past texts. A festschrift for Leo Strauss provided a welcome occasion for Strauss to showcase, um, for Kuzhev to showcase his calls uh, to the man who taught him the chops of esoteric writing. And I think that festschrift was in the making since the late 50s uh, and was only published in 64. In his contribution, Kuzhev shines a light on Julian, a Roman emperor who reigned for a short three years in the fourth century of our common era. And there's a certain aura surrounding what Strauss in the 1941 essay called the art of writing, which is why I quickly would like to clarify the term esoteric writing and dispel some myths. I mean, Strauss holds that political philosophy, and texts in political philosophy are often encoded and possess a hidden layer to convey their potentially risky truths. Only readers who are in tune with the author's thinking can fully comprehend this deeper dimension. That does not mean that does not mean that esoteric writing involves arcane forms of knowledge or a secret doctrine. Yeah, it's neither conspiracy nor a cult. And Strauss attaches particular importance to the question of whether and to what extent one can define a text as satire or passages as ironic. I think, given this Kuzhev's penchant for playfulness, this idea obviously greatly seduced him. And he he kind of uh, practiced it first in his correspondence because a young Parisian philosopher. Uh, whom I worked for on, in my PhD as well, initiated an exchange with Kozhev and sent him his books, presumably hoping for approval. His name is François Châtelet, who would later become head of the philosophy department at the Reform University of Vincennes, and he was also possibly one of the closest friends of Gilles Deleuze. Um, Châtelet did not get the reaction from Kozhev he might have expected, and his responses, that's just for a laugh, I'm showing this, Kozhev dialed up the sarcasm and proffered counterintuitive provocations that betrayed their Straussian origins. Very this idea like, okay, what's irony? What's kind of esoteric writing? And it's completely, if you look at this, uh, um, it's completely uh, over, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's short, I make it short. Uh, if you ask me, Khrushchev right? Plato was never interested in the state, let alone the political. The Republic is in fact ironic. The famous community of women is only a satire, a parody of a Moors of the Athenian high society of the time. Communism is a satire of the democratic law which allowed the sale of family land and also a parody of the reactionary critics of it, etc. But the real subject of a dialogue is the academy. The philosopher must not concern himself with politics, he must become and remain an academician. Uh, and then the polis, he goes on, the polis is a cave from which one must emerge as quickly as possible. And Kuzhev adds mischievously, that's not on the slide, I quote, as I seem to be the only one who sees it, one has to assume that the platonic irony is not obvious to everyone. Now, the Festschrift for Strauss was an altogether more respectable affair. Kuzhev circulated copies to his friends, and in a letter, Coiré expressed his amusement about Kuzhev's contribution. Uh, for his part, Alan Bloom, a disciple of Strauss responded in a jocular way, predicting a bright future for Kuzhev as an interpreter of the ancients. In Emperor Julian and the Art of Writing, Kuzhev pays genuine homage to Strauss by showing that the Emperor Julian carefully concealed his own atheism so as not to offend the Christian citizens of his empire. But Kuzhev can't refrain from a tease. Yeah, and that is. The kind of from Montaltese, for he adds a dimension of esoteric writing that is that the perennially earnest and high-minded Strauss would never have approved of for Kozhev, though esoteric writing is not just about avoiding prosecution, it is also about having a good old laugh. Last point. Everyone these days knows that 
Leo Strauss spawned a school of Straussians that grew very influential in the US during the presidency of George W. Bush post 9-11. And I think such was the attention drawn by the neocons that it obscured a far more unlikely reception of Strauss. In France in the late 1960s and 70s, everything that pitted Strauss against Kojev now made the political philosopher, made Strauss appealing to a younger generation that had grown weary of neo-Hegelianism. Yeah? Neo-Hegelianism's promise of progress rang hollow to those politicized by the events of May 68. They had lost faith in the state as an agent of emancipation. And the 1972 Club of Rome report alerted them to the limits of economic growth and the environmental costs of Western prosperity. All of a sudden, Strauss's warnings against the conquest of nature that Kozhev saw as the hallmark of human freedom resonated with a crowd steeped in anarchism and eco-consciousness. The, the Greeks knew what was coming when they resisted the allure of technology. The channel through which this, what you might call, left Straussianism passed was none other than François Châtelet. In the philosophical uh, movement away from Hegelian and Marxist philosophies of history that shook France in the 1670s, Leo Strauss became an unlikely ally of anarchists. Yeah? And Strauss's cyclical view of history had the advantage of being more sustainable in every sense of the word. In Les Conceptions Politiques du XXe Siècle, a sort of nearly thousand page survey of the history of ideas that Châtelet co-authored with Evelyn Pizier Kouchner, um, Châtelet turned away from Kojev and praised Strauss for deliberately rejecting the ideology of progress while holding on to a certain form of rationality. I think on that unexpected note of an eco Strauss, I would like to end. While Strauss put it, for try as one might to expel nature with a hay fork, it will always come back. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Danilo, for your very intriguing uh, presentation. I think we would need a couple of days for the sake of discussing it, but we don't have that time. So uh, the floor is open to everybody here. If you have questions, uh, suggestions, uh, critiques to the three presentations. Yeah, shoot away, because since it's, that's very much still a work in progress, and obviously, as I said, since Strauss's bibliography is, is, is vast and expanding, any, any, any hints are, are welcome. Or video. Oh, sorry, right, I'm not going to go on. Uh, maybe here for the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. It was extremely powerful. Um, it was clear, well informed as usual. I have discovered texts I haven't known before, so it was very helpful for me. Um, now, when reflecting about this um, Kozhev Strauss debate, one gets sometimes, or I think the, the nicest part is when, when one gets the impression a bit like in, in the Davos debate, but not the mm -hmm. Kassiver Heidegger, but rather the Thomas Mann debate, the, the Nafta Settembrini debate, that one switches the position and then one doesn't actually get how one could endorse a position that one would attribute to the adversary. More precisely, I'm thinking about the question of nature. You know, you've mentioned it, and actually it, one, it is one of the kernels uh, of the of the debate, right? Um, what would you put, asks um, Strauss, in place of Hegel's philosophy of nature? Um, and in the in the letter from 1948, upon reading the introduction to the reading of Hegel, this is also one of Strauss's main objections. Now, of course, there is a, a simple answer from Kozhev's perspective, which will be nothing. There is no philosophy of nature. There is just a science of nature, right? So why? Because uh, should there be a philosophy, this philosophy should be verbal, that means dialectical, that means historical, right? But what does this also mean? 
Well, it means precisely that nature is like the ancient has have uh, thought about is immutable. It is unchangeable, right? So, what what is strange about this position is that, in a certain sense, Kochev adopts uh, Strauss's position, right? Um, when thinking about nature, and precisely because of this, he corrects. He wants to correct he Hegel's perspective, while Strauss, in this perspective, stands with Hegel, or, or with let's say with the moderns, uh, with Hegel or with Schelling or with the Romantics, even worse for him, against this ancient wisdom. Right? So, um, yeah. This is just a comment. I uh, want to see what, what, do you, what do you think about this. And now, I think there is, it was very, uh, a very important point that you mentioned. What is the political relevance of this, right? Because it seems to be a speculative issue. Are we with Hegel or with Schelling or are we with, with, with Kozhev? But what is the political relevance of giving a philosophical weight to, to, to nature, right? Um, and, and here, of course, one can go on this, um, one can adopt this position saying, well, if there is no philosophy of nature, if we don't recognize to nature a sort of inner mobility, then we adopt the stance of a sort of a predatory stance. Nature is nothing, we can do anything uh, with it, right? But then we can also reverse the position and, and say, well, seen from a, a, a very high level of abstraction, we cannot do anything to nature. I think this would be uh, Hegel's position. Of course, we can do bad things to the earth. We can do bad things to the human environment or to the, let's say, to the environment of the species we have co-opted in our world, but to the world as such, so, yeah, these are some of the reflections. Sorry if I was too long. No, that was extremely stimulating. Thank you. I mean, one, of course, one, one, there's one strand of Kozhev scholars who would obviously say what, what one could put in place uh, is what, what, what Kozhev tentatively called um, anagology in the sort of his, 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 his mise à jour du système hegelien, and also a text that I haven't looked or that I haven't mentioned at all is, of course, the the real answer, the real answer to these objections uh, formulated by Strauss is, of course, the, the essay in Histoire raisonnée de la philosophie païenne. But I have not anyone who is sort of buried to himself or herself in these three books. I've never seen anyone kind of come back with a kind of coherent answer of what they're about. It's, it's really, it's pretty crazy stuff. I don't see, it's very cryptic. I don't see, he's doing something that is kind of draw, I, you, if you, if you, because all the, I haven't mentioned that as well, all the later letters between Kozhev and Strauss are all about Plato, where all they talk about is, is how to, 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 to interpret uh, Plato, and I think then the, it's the second volume, no, it's Plato, Aristotle, uh, and the third is when the Neoplatonists, when, when, when something is happening there, but I, I can't, I, I can't really pin that down. But yeah, it's an excellent point, I think it was in the one quote that I said that uh, Kozhev even, because Kozhev is aware of it, it's like, I do agree with the ancients that nature is in fact immutable. What I haven't not fully understood yet is like, what do you mean that Strauss is stands against the Romantics? Because obviously that's that's a position that that he, if you pushed him, he would dismiss or abhor. He wouldn't like to be in that place. What 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 do you mean that he, when he sort of uh, moves away from the ancients? So and the quick answer is that I adopted, um, let's say, Kozhev's stance mm -hmm. for Kozhev, the philosophy of nature in Hegel is a romantic heritage. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. Um, purifying Hegel of his philosophy of nature is eliminating his Schellingian uh, soul, right, or Schellingian mm -hmm. half soul. Mm -hmm. But there's also, isn't we, when we talk about the anagology, there is this, at least until the mid 30s, the idea of the science, there is a science of it, the science has changed. And there is a temptation sensed by Kozhev what if we use sort of quantum, quantum physics and had another go at the philosophy of nature? 
there's definitely and he, he he dabbles with that idea a little bit and then it doesn't and there's some really because it's it's about also the he's very interested in the sort of uh, role of um how the how observing chain something determines the observed thing that's this uh, really for also an epistemological problem but uh, I, I think deep down you're probably right that he is in the end of the day he puts nothing in its place and this also the, the, the when 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 Kozhev is very uh, Strauss is very dramatic about the conquest of nature I think Kozhev really thinks that the project of human emancipation is inconceivable without exploiting and even enslaving nature that he would if, if, if you pushed him you would probably grant that that point of view I would say please Yeah, thanks to all three for the talks and also beautifully um, coming together. There were all these shared themes and I mean, Olivia pointed to the environmental subtext, which I think there's a lot more to write in Kozhev about all these topics of energy expansion. And there's almost a kind of missed encounter between environmentalism or a contemporary ecological thought and, and Kozhev's ideas about that. And uh, the other theme which appeared in all three talks was the idea of a problematic concept of modernity and different ways of overcoming the modern condition. And I just wanted to address all three what you think about um, Kozhev's project of post-historicity, which is also a post-modern project, but also it diff it's, it's really different from other um, post-modern projects. And, What's the difference between postmodernity, post historicity, and how would we map, in your view, would we map Kozhev's project as also an um, like Aufhebung or um, like um, overcoming of modernity? And um, then there's a question for Kyle as well, um, which I found it really interesting this idea that there's a certain impossibility of cultural unity without a nation state. If I understood you correctly, there's a that you, Towards the end, you um, suggested there's, there's a kind of economic unity, but a kind of absence of cultural unity. And um, can I ask one more question? The final question for Eduardo um, would be, you, if I understood correctly, you said um, Eric Weil criticized Kozhev for a kind of theological reading or take on um, Hegel. And I found it just um, interesting why what were his arguments for someone who declared so openly that he wants to do an atheistic, um, desacralizing reading? May I add a blunt question? From a Hegelian point of view, how is it possible to have a state because the universal and homogeneous state is a state and no history? A state is history. Thank you very much, Isa. Um, you asked quite a few questions there, so I'm not really sure which one I should choose to respond to, but I, I suppose I can respond to the one that you asked me directly, where you said that you asked if Kozhev believes that you can only have cultural, um, the, the possibility of culture depends upon the nation state. Um, I think that Kozhev thinks that culture depends upon the state. I don't think it depends upon the nation state because in, in the text he, he, he makes it pretty clear there and elsewhere that he thinks that um, uh, the nation state, well, it, it, at least if, if not dead, was in the death throes um, at the time that after the Second World War, if not before, but he calls for these ideas of empires, if not for universal homogenous state. The, the, the point by Lucio is is, is a really is a, is a really important one because these sort of end concepts, say in Kozhev, end of history, the universal homogenous state, ideas of system, always always are somehow, at least in my opinion, approached paradoxically. Um, there's always something of a contradiction that emerges at the end. For example, the one that Lucio points out that how how to have a state uh, outside of history, and and this also, for me at least, gestures towards your first question about um, uh, the, the post-history in, in, in Kozhev. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a perhaps a banal or simplistic point, but 
as Ovidi was pointing out, or many people have pointed out, that there's the disc discursivity is uh, fundamental to Kochev's philosophy. You must be able to verbally communicate the, the, these ideas, and these ideas discursively only unfold uh, in, in history. I mean, so the idea of a post-history would be, by definition, a concept that could not be described. I mean, how it would, it would be like, as Baudrillard says in his book, you would have to jump over one's own shadow in order to describe the end of history. And uh, so it's another example of something of a contradiction. I think that th this, this tension between these end concepts that supposedly should exist for Kochev in a type of silence, something that cannot be described, and yet he's striving to communicate them, or at least showing their impossibility of being communicated, uh, is, is a way that we have to approach these sort of ideas. That would be my... my Thank you for uh, the question. Um, yeah, I think that the the reading of Hegel, um, the Kozhivian reading of Hegel, uh, is a is a form of secularized that secular theology in uh, uh, in this sense. That is secularized uh, because mm, there is, uh, I think, uh, a vision, a Platonic vision, and uh, in the in the philosophy of Kozhev and in the in the reading of Hegel um, of of Kozhev. and so uh, the, the 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 hand the, the hand of history is the, the hand uh, the theology. Um, to uh, the, the secularized form of, of this theology, and so um, I, I think that this end is a um, is become a technical problem for um, for conserve the, the universal the homogeneous states uh, in the sense uh, the, the theological vision. Of Kozhev is a is a uh, is not is not a, um, yeah during in his in his uh, uh, in his philosophy I think and the difference um, with Weil is that there is a Platonic idea of the state and of uh, uh, the politics and so on. And uh, in Weil, uh, there is a Kantian idea that is not only regulative idea, but uh, uh, also uh, a formal idea that uh, cannot prescribe or uh, empirical form of or empirical um, form of states predetermined in this sense. Uh, and the, and the, the the link with postmodern. Is I think the the end uh, of politics and uh, in in, uh, in a strongly sense and uh, uh, the, the the end of politics in modern sense uh, has um, conflicts and uh, and work as tools of emancipation of men in this sense. I um I mean I would I think it's answer question slightly differently I mean the, the point about the state and history is quite well taken but I mean with the, the, the funny thing about Kozhev is obviously that he notices that and he adapts that uh, and then the correspondence with Kozhev is really helpful where it says well you can't have a state at the end of history all you have left is administration which also paradoxically is then uh, closer to uh, Marx than to Hegel the person who doesn't get that is, 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 is Leo Strauss here in his in his in his Hegel lectures 58 65 He's very, very worried. He says what makes Kozhev a Hegin is precisely that the state, unlike in Marx, never moves away. And he, he, he misses that boat in a way that Kozhev, by 55, 56, says, well, look, what we'll have is basically a kind of um, an international technocracy. Uh, but they, 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 are, they are not states in the classical sense. And I think Strauss really, I mean, I didn't bring up his term, but the term he uses, he's really scared that the, that the with the world state, he calls it a kind of planetary despotism because he thinks that the, that the state, if the state structures will remain intact, that 
will be an, an, an organism that will ruthlessly uh, pursue and persecute opposition. But then Christian said, obviously not. That's not what's going to happen. Why? That, and that brings back uh, Isa's question about uh, what uh, is, does, is it useful to distinguish between post-modernity and post-historicity? And I think yes, and I would sort of uh, um, do it slightly different view from you, because I think the post-modernity is precisely, I think, not a politics. That is, that is the, um, where anything goes, playfulness, in the sort of critique reviews of the novels of Raymond Cano. And this is also what, uh, why, um, what's it? Canadian was Shadia B. Drury, that's the proposed modern Kojab. Gender differences will be dissolved. Uh, um, gender identities can only be sort of performed in a the theatrical way. Uh, and you do things really um, half seriously at most. The post historicity, that's the political side. And I have also someone, because I. I, I Every six months or so, I get or once a year, I get a bout where I just become really obsessed with a reactionary thinker. And someone who developed the notion of a post histoire independently from Kojev is obviously Arnold Gehlen. And Gehlen, for Gehlen's point, the post histoire is precisely that the greatness that you can acquire by risking your life for, for, for a cause greater than yourself, that this, is, this vanishes in a way. And that's basically why it's post histoire. Post modernity is more cultural. Post historicity concerns more like the willingness, I think, to to risk one's life uh, in for for a greater cause. Yeah. 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 The, the, no, that's a, it, it, it's, it's not it's not history. It's about what Marx called the administration of things. Nicht mehr Regierung der Menschen, sondern sozusagen Verwaltung der Dinge. That's the, that is not the tradition of a Verwaltungsstaat that you have in mind in that case, I would say. Uh, I mean, we, we, whether that makes sense to kind of disentangle that in that way, that, that's a good question. But there is, there, there is this idea that you could really, uh, um, in the Marxian strand, that you could sort of just sever the organizational side from, from the Leviathan, so to speak. That is the utopian belief, no? Because obviously you have to organize the economy. Yeah. No, and it came back to bite them, obviously. But I, mean, they were, I come from East Germany, as if the state wasn't exactly weak in the GDR. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, can I just say, say one quick thing? I mean, but you, you mentioned Marx, of course, but Hegel, you say that the idea of the, maybe I misunderstood you, but you said universal homogenous state is, can be read in a Hegelian context, but it seems to me that this would be at least problematic when read against the philosophy of right, where mm -hmm. at the end of the philosophy of right, there is anything but a mm -hmm. universal homogenous state, anything like this, much more Kantian, in a sense, cosmopolitanism would be a universal homogenous state, I would imagine, much, much less a Galen. Yeah, but that. the Kantian thing is, that's, isn't that, that's just a confederation of republics, that the Kantian state, and that's that the unif because he says, the, if you unify it, that it would be a global tyranny. No, but I mean, if it's a perpetual peace, that is, yeah. Uh, but, uh, um, and I think uh, Bayer's version is closer to Kant, but I mean, because I, I didn't want to get involved because I arrived so late, but the, the interesting thing is, of course, that um, Kurzhev never really paid that much attention to Hegel's philosophy of right, and that where I, what you said earlier about Weil and this sort of um, awareness of a necessary distinction between politics and the economy, He's much more um, rigorous about that, right? When he says, because I often had a mind, but if I if I can say what I have, because uh, the world state, what is left, is really just the name. When in Eric Weyer, I have something left with the not the gut, but the earlier when we tried to found an uh, international trade organization, that you have a Keynesian-inspired uh, sort of not just a trade arrangement, but also a kind of or economic organization interested in full employment. And there are lots of debates in the 50s, and Bayer participates in them, I think. That's, but Kojev has no, he kind of, he, he, for him, it's either, um, he never operates. He never operates with his distinction between the economy and politics, because he only works with an analogy of spirit, where this distinction isn't yet operative. That, is, that comes later in Hegel. Yeah. And how does that go? <laughs> So thank you so much for 
or uh, your uh, talks is uh, it's very hard to put just one, <coughs> one, <coughs> one question to each, but I'll try. First of all, Kyle, um, the concept of empire as a mediating concept, that's very interesting. That's also quite ambiguous since um, not your statement, <laughs> but Kojev's statement. <laughs> no, no, no. Because, I mean, in, the, in those very years, as Kojev writes the phenomenology of right, the empire is not a mediating concept, it's the end concept. Mm -hmm. end Zustand. Mm -hmm. um, two years later, it has become what you said, a mediating concept, because he means the doctrine of the French politics to be something, operational politics, a proposal. And, and that's very interesting that Robert Mangelin says, okay, that's quite reactionary, but it's like, please leave it aside. Um, what has happened? We don't know actually, <laughs> but uh, Kojab wanted to, to be operational, wanted to have a role in French politics. And uh, while during the, 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 the permanence in the lot uh, where, where he wrote the right uh, phenomenology, he was just studying and proposing the, what can be considered the most serious uh, Kojab outline of, of the realized communism as or his Marxist version of of uh, of right, something that even Soviet legal thinkers hadn't done so much yet. Okay. How how to realize equality in in a society where politics has almost disappeared and how to how to produce equal rights for anybody. Uh, so, I mean, we always have to face this huge ambiguity in Kojev as a thinker and Kojev as a uh, politician thinker, which in those very years was so pronounced, so, so important. Then it changes because he becomes a bureaucrat and a philosophy dimanche, uh, and he only writes about pagan philosophy and so on. But I mean, the 40s are uh, very complicated mm -hmm. to understand, and uh, that's the huge problem when we face a concept such as that as of empire. Empire is l'état universel homogène. Yes, in the outline, but then when he writes tyranny and sagesse, uh, it has become something else, and he. He spends pages explaining what is universal and what is homogeneous, and uh, and that that's comp that creates complications <laughs> in understanding. Um, I come to Eduardo's um, presentation. Uh, it's um, very important what you said about the um, the, the difference between Weil and Kojev while talking about political philosophy. Right? Uh, we were seeing that privately before. Uh, Eric Weil, Eric Weil's uh, um, Philosophie Politique, 1956, is, is, a, is a work where he has nearly forgotten Kojev. He has no, no interest in spreading Kojev's uh, word, uh, such as he had in uh, Hegel d'Etat in 1950. Um, where he mentioned Kojev twice. What what does he do in his political philosophy? He's, he considers the, uh, the the opportunity to stress the language of uh, condition, the category of condition. What does it mean to talk about labor, talk about work, talk about society? Something that Kojev doesn't do at all. <laughs> he doesn't talk about production. He only says there is production, man is production. Maybe he had something done, something in the 30s where he, he talked about the philosophy of labor, but he doesn't do that in the, in the comment, uh, in the commentary of Kojev. And so that means 
reading the sociologists, reading, re rereading, making a philosophy of, of sociology, rereading Max Weber, rereading Durkheim, the, the, the mechanism uh, social in the philosophy of, in the philosophy politique is Durkheim, and uh, and that that is understanding philosophically the the condition, what what condition. No, condition, the condition of society means, which is history, even if only administrated. Uh, economy, uh, philosoph philosophically understood economy, um, which leads to the, the, the point that also Danilo stressed. Administration becomes the main part, even in l'état mondial de, 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 de vial, uh, by vial. Uh, which creates the problem of the importance of bureaucracy. The importance of bureaucracy, which is Kozhev's also a uh, huge problem, but he, he, he handles it by doing bureaucracy, while Weil thinks about bureaucracy. Uh, the difference is that Kozhev thinks about being a bureaucrat as, a lead, as the leading class in the sense of elitism, I, I, I think, that's a suggestion. Uh, the, the, the huge question in Strauss and Kozhev's uh, conception of philosophers is that not only Strauss thinks that philosophers should be apart from politics because politics is something, and polis is something strange and that endangers them, but that Kozhev thinks that philosopher should not only advise the tyrants, but be the tyrant in themselves by being bureaucrats or a leading, the leading class. And he said that even in the outline of phenomenology, phenomenology of right, where the groupe exclusive, juridique et politique, is nothing but the bureaucrats in, a, in, a, in an empire or in universal and homogeneous state. Um, so that's when, yeah, I just wanted to stress that the, the two of them are the expression of a, a different elitism, totally different elitism, but they are both elitist. Once, well, uh, this, um, Kozhev, Kozhev may, may resemble Leninism in some ways, but maybe not, <laughs> not at all, because capitalism is fine if it produces the same, the same, uh, uh, capacity to dis for the society to be satisfied in its material needs. And uh, Strauss, on, his, on the other hand, um, is very interested in stressing the importance for the elite to continue to go around in the garden and talking about philosophy. And when he says that uh, democracy, uh, did it, that the, the Greek had uh, liberalism at its height, uh, we always have to notice that he absolutely pays no attention to slavery. Never, never pays attention to slavery, which is Kozhev's concept, or seems to be Kozhev's concept, with, with this absurd translation of the word necht in, in esclav. <laughs> so, mm, Okay, I guess I said something. Yeah, Massimo, thank you very much. Um, I mean, of course, I mean, you, you point towards the, the outline of the Phenomenology of Right text, and there he uses um, universal homogenous state and empire. If I remember correctly, sometimes synonymously, sometimes in the same sentence, he'll say universal homogenous state or empire. And perhaps he does something similar in the Strauss text. I can't, I, I, in, in his uh, dialogue with Strauss, does he do, do something? Does he? I can't remember exactly how he uses empire in that text, but just to stick with the um, phenomenology of, uh, of right text. I mean, I, of course, in that text, um, like many other um, uh, of, of these, like I was saying before, these sort of end concepts, he's quite vague when it comes to describe them. And in that text as well, 
he also repeatedly says, a universal homogenous state or empire that does not exist, but maybe will exist one day. And I can't really say so much about it because like, I mean, the whole text is building up to this crescendo where you're like, okay, he's going to say, here's what the, like I mean, when you read that text for the first time, you're like, okay, he's going to describe it. And then at every moment where he's about to say something concrete about, he retreats to this idea of one, of something to come in the future. Well, at the same time, maintaining in the writings around this time that we've already are in this post history. So, I mean, if there's nothing more to come, I mean, it, it, it's, it, again, he's, he's, he's either struggling with this idea or he's playing with the paradox of what he's of what he needs to describe, and it's not clear. But I mean, what I can say about this is that, and I mean, I think that we can make a distinction in Koshev when he's talking about an idea, something that exists, as he says in the Empire text, as an abstraction, something abstraction, and a concrete, like what is the actual uh, today. And when he speaks about universal homogenous state or empire in that text, he means it as an idea. It's not concrete. It doesn't exist now. It's something that maybe will come in the future, but something that we cannot uh, 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 understand as a concrete uh, actuality in that moment. Whereas in empire, whereas in the outline of a, of a doctrine of French policy, he speaks of empire as not as an idea, but as in a realization of what is the current concrete uh, uh, a political form that people it's not it's not a choice it's not an idea but it's it's the it's the reality and somebody like Stalin or he says Churchill uh, they understood this they understand that this is the reality that uh, politics must uh, um, must uh, that, that, that uh, uh, politics must embrace and in that text Empire is described as a mediating concept and he proposes it to France or this idea of a Latin Empire as a way that Europe, or at least part of Europe, can uh, itself um, uh, adapt to this new political reality, this new political objective reality. And at that and at that point in time, he, in this text, he dismisses any idea of a universal homogenous state as utopic, and he's like, it, it has no place in in uh, in in what should be the uh, um, uh, uh, French or European. Um, uh, uh, policy objectives, I mean, uh, that you, you have to deal with reality, deal with what the current situation is. So, I mean, the fact that he uses this term in different ways at different points in time is obviously problematic, and I didn't touch upon it. But um, I think that this, again, just to repeat this idea of abstract idea and concrete reality have to be, have to be uh, at least kept in mind when we're speaking about Koshev. That would be my, uh, probably not very satisfactory answer. Thanks. Thank you so much for uh, these questions. These are very good questions, man. Yeah, yeah I, I think that uh, in philosophy politique, Bail is more Marxian than Kojel for <laughs> for there for some aspects, and um, in fact. Uh, while say and talk about uh, um, universal societies and uh, when he say that uh, the state is not a, um, a aim or a goal in itself but the question is a unity of societies and i, I think that um, in this sense uh, while um, well, was uh, well, was more more Marxian and more Mar I don't know Marxist, but Marxian, I, I think than Kojel, um, because the, the the end and the goal uh, is uh, a unity of humanity, and uh, for to overcome the the state uh, in this sense. Um, and um, the 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 fact uh, I think the link between Weil and Strauss uh, I think that the link uh, um, is uh, a question of conformism, uh, conformism, education like conformism in these sort of uh, 
paradoxically, hand of history and hand of politics and the hand of uh, conflicts. Um, when uh, the conformism is, is the theme uh, that's uh, vile also, um, it, it's, it's very problematic for vile. Uh, the conformism adds um, a, um, one uh, unique way to exist, to um, and so on. Um, and this, I think, is the, um, the liberal basis of uh, common to uh, to Weil and Strauss. But Weil, uh, I think, that's um, looking uh, to Kant and Marx in this sense. And uh, I think that's yeah, it's it's a difference, it's a, a strongly difference. But the the theme, uh, the the question of um, conformism against uh, liberalism uh, and liberal education in this sense is, uh, I think, that's, uh, the, 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 that's very important also for Weil. And also Weil uh, talking about a necessity of create a aristocracy uh, and uh, for uh, um, uh, and for um, let's see, um, for a, a, a government, a universal government, um, in, in this perspective, perspective of overcome the, the particular state in the unity of the, the humanity, and the, in this sense, it's, it's less realistic of, of Kojev, yeah, I, I think. But, um, but the, 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 the question of conformism to one uh, way uh, at the end of uh, hypothetical end of history is, I think, that is a common, uh, a common question in Kojev and Strauss. Because Weil is more Marxian than Kojev in this sense. And maybe I'll start also with the, with the, with the empire, uh, empire question because yeah, I think also Kai is right that is, um, I haven't dwelt on that, uh, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a big issue in, in at least Kojev's statement um, in his exchange with Strauss because obviously he's very interested there in, in, in Alexander because he was advised by Aristotle and so you have a kind of textbook example of how uh, the, the, the tyranny question bleeds into this um, question of whether you want to be advised uh, by, 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 by a philosopher. Um, the other thing is also that, uh, and you're, because I've noticed that um, Basim was all completely right that it's a moving target, the empire, because here he, he, he what, I, what I kind of found now as well, there's this very odd definition uh, um, of the empire as the universal state in, 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 in tyranny and wisdom, where he says what characterizes the political action of Alexander, in contrast to the political action of all of his Greek predecessors and contemporaries, is that what it was guided by the idea of empire, that is to say of a universal state, uh, at least in the sense that this state had no a priori given limits. And then he toys with his idea, and he goes back, I think, until the <coughs> pharaonic Egypt and theocracies, and uh, he also says that um, you can have uh, racially based empires uh, in there, uh, and it, that is something that makes Strauss very, very angry. And in one, also in one of the um, passages that was excised, he, he uh, because he, he picks up on that and he kind of thought, okay, I don't want to get carried away. Where Strauss then writes, as is shown in Kojev's reference to tyranny based on racial ideas, he does not seem to be averse to the suggestion that Hitler was a good a tyrant in Xenophon's sense, but it is of the essence of a good tyrant in Xenophon's sense that under him gentlemen may live and live happily. And all German gentlemen of whom I knew either left Germany after Hitler's coming to power or else they left most miserably under his rule. And there for the first time you see like Strauss letting down his guard and I can see where someone of those here of a Jew who had to go into exile that Kuzhev casually throws that in there and he doesn't have to, because something uh, that, that has always interested me for a long time 
is that in the Introduction à la Lecture de Hegel, he says that uh, uh, my idea of recognition is something that transcends racial boundaries. And that is always a standard to which you should hold them. And that is precisely then for, 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 for um, Franz Fanon in his critique of Kojerf is to like, that he can show that he doesn't live up to his own standards because in this master slave dialectic for people of color, you can't even participate in that. It's a white people's game, basically. And that's why I think it was, was it not you who said that uh, Kojerf in the, in the, in the Soviet, in his 40s text uh, develops the ideas of a non-imperialist empire, I, I think Franz Fanon would probably back to differ about that. That is very sort of traditional, conventional uh, colonialism. And then it's it's almost hair-splitting to say is it, I mean, it's definitely colonialist. It's probably not imperialist in the sort of land-grabbing 19th century scramble for Africa sense. Uh, but it's, 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 you know that he's putting a gloss on it when he says that it's a giving colonialism. We, um, I completely agree with you when you said that when it comes to education, and yes, Weil is many ways more Marxist at, 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 than, than, uh, than, than Kojev, but he's also, he shares the cultural pessimism with, 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 with Strauss, definitely. And there's also this idea, you know, in the philosophy politics, there's this weird thing that uh, he is worried about people, because obviously he wants uh, working hours to be reduced, but he's worried, it's a very common fear in the 1950s, Günther Anders has that as well, but people don't know how to fill their lives meaningfully if you don't give them in, uh, enough, um, too much spare time. And that because they, are, they haven't got the kind of mental skills to um, occupy themselves in a meaningful way. And that's why education is so important. And um, you are very right that the elitism is shared between Kojev and Strauss. But what is interesting is, and if, probably it's not enough material for a paper, but I mean, maybe like a sort of 500 word newspaper column or something. No one has commented on the fact that it's not okay. Kojev never had a disciple. And there's something about his self understanding that makes it impossible for him to be a disciple. And then he was always a little bit annoyed when Strauss sent all his disciples because it wasn't just Ellen Bloom. It was quite a lot, a lot, a lot of four or five people. But and he was busy working for the French ministry and Strauss always insisted, come on, have a coffee with him and you know, sit down. He, he never he never had the slightest inclination to found a school, and it was and there's something non coincidental about it. But I can't exactly pin down why that is the case. But that's definitely a big difference. Where uh, he he uh, you want to hang out and discuss with your mates Carl Schmidt or Leo Strauss, but you don't you don't set up a research institute or a think tank. Uh, yeah, that was, yeah. Ma Marco, you raised your hand, no? Okay. Yeah. Agnese Rossi. Thanks, Marco. And thanks uh, you all for your very brilliant um, lesson. So, um, I have a very quick question, maybe a provocation, I don't know, but um, Kojev somehow not only thought uh, philosophers should uh, commit themselves to political action, but actually acted himself politically, um, as we know in the French administration. And, and at the same time, elaborated uh, um, a theory of action. Uh, um, we thought about uh, Latin Empire and so on. And Strauss, on the contrary, um, thinks philosophers uh, should commit themselves uh, to um, the search of truth despite uh, uh, politics. And um, so Strauss didn't mean to give uh, birth uh, to a political course of action. Um, and thinking about uh, their respective uh, political legacy, um, I think there's some kind of uh, uh, irony or paradox uh, um, in the fact that uh, actually there has been a phenomenon, a political phenomenon called Straussianism, mm -hmm. um, and I'm referring to the American neoconservatives, um, that have frequently claimed themselves like uh, as Straussians. Um, and there has not been uh, a Kojevian uh, political school in the proper sense. 
I mean, um, why uh, anyone has ever called themselves Kusevian uh, uh, in, uh, in the same uh, way uh, it happened with Strauss? Okay, that was a, yeah, that's a very tough, I mean, yeah, that, that's the point I alluded to in my, that's a very difficult question. Um, we, I don't know if you know, you know, I, sometimes I've, I'm looking for people who could fill those shoes in, so, so it would obviously be, have to be a philosophically minded, high ranking international civil servant. And whom I find very interesting, I don't know if, if, to what extent he's sort of known in, is he Belgian, Luc van Middelaar, who's also, he writes sort of political philosophy on the European Union, was an advisor of uh, not Charles Michel, but the other Belgian, Hermann van Rompuy, I think, before that. And uh, also got now nobilitated because Perry Anderson, the great Marxist, uh, reviewed him in one of those 30 page uh, sort of essays. Uh, and and he's, obviously, he's obviously aware of that, but, um, that is sometimes you're looking more for people who work in a similar vein, and it's not someone who self-consciously claims a mantle of I'm 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 a, I'm a Kojavian, I think. I mean, then uh, uh, obviously Fukuyama did, but as I have tried to show, that is that has more to do with Straussianism. But it also the yeah, the irony you underline with Straussianism is, is is very clear as well, because what do we what do we associate neoconservatives with? It's of course a certain kind of what they call humanitarian interventionism. And uh, I mean, A, Strauss had, I don't, I wouldn't say he had no idea, but he had very little interest in international relations. And the one thing he did, because obviously, <laughs> the one thing he did get was from the Greeks, don't indulge in foreign adventurism. So I mean, the one thing, the, the one thing he said, they kind of didn't adhere to that. So it's kind of, it's very odd. What I think what they, what they did like was the sort of secluded, self-consciously elitist, group situation where you think that you have to say certain things and you have to do certain things that are not necessarily aimed at the same audiences. Yeah? And that uh, you also, that, that a small group of, of, of like-minded enlightened people can really push through political changes while pretending that they're just all, I don't know, uh, uh, boring civil servants. That is, I think, the, the, the the role of elites in political decision making is what they take from Strauss, but not any of uh, not any of his ideas about uh, politics. And if at all, I mean, also even in America, he wrote so little, for instance, about the U.S. Constitution, for instance. So it, it, it's and there you have a lot of Straussians working as well. You have what we call an originalist. We you know this idea that you should only ever do interpret the, the U.S. Constitution as closely as you can which probably then means that you have no right uh, to abortion. But I think that uh, ultimately the, the school deep down, I think uh, Kuzhev fancied himself a loner, a lone wolf. And he's, it's part of his, he was a dandy, which Leo Strauss wasn't. And so sort of dandies don't tend to form schools, I think. But just as a rejoinder to, to both the question and, and, and the response, um, I, I would just ask, I mean, what do you mean by politics in this way? What do you mean, like, what, what sort of a politics would a Kojevian uh, 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 strive to achieve? I mean, I mean, doesn't it sort of beg the question, I mean, if, if we take post-history seriously, post uh, uh, the end of history, you say post-historical situation, wouldn't that also mean, or is it something different than a post-political? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I mean, if, if at the end of history there's nothing more to be done, or as Schiller says, you know, when, when, once the world is given away, what is to be done? I mean, where, what type? It is a little bit of a, a problem, Koshev, that he does, as you, as you pointed out correctly, strive for some sort of a philosophy of action. But what type of action? Because on the other hand, he wants to. Yeah, you want to, you want to get in on this video immediately. Okay. Um, <laughs> But no, but this, but you see where I'm going with this, right? Um, that it's it's not entirely clear how even a Kojevian politics is is uh, possible. So that's my question. Sure, sure. Um, 
Daniela, Daniela. I am abusing my right to speak the second time. Um, so I would say, from a strategic perspective, one has more influence when one is less known. So one could submit that even if no one talks like Kojivian or understands himself herself, herself as a Kojivian, they might be pursuing Kojivian ends and thoughts and patterns of actions. And in this case, Kojiv would have been successful. Not if and not if everyone would know him by name, right? So I would say that it is in this direction that we should look if we are trying to see a possible direct influence of, of Kozhev on, on policy. Now, he did propose some, some piece of real policy, right, in the 1950s, 40s, the, um, the policy of gifts, right? Um, and we might think about, I mean, First of all, there might be a philosophical justification for this. Uh, we look at this, at the footnote from the 62, we say, what can we still do? What are the directions of politics in post-history? Well, there is the question of synchronization. I mean, post-history is not lived everywhere with the same intensity. There are with a term that probably we will not use today, provinces, right? Where the, um, let's say, the, the reverberations of, of, of post history haven't yet reached with the same intensity. So we have to give to away the resources necessary for this to happen, right? And, and to um, instill the kind of thoughts that might might lead everyone uh, in, in this direction. So this is one way. And then the second we might also ask in terms of policy whether with limited effects this kind of policy was not pursued at some, at some moments, right? I mean, I mean, I'm, I mean yeah, it, it's it's point well taken. I mean, I, again, I I would say, I mean, it depends what we mean by action, by politics, and stuff like this. Of course, I mean, nobody's arguing that you don't do anything at the at, at the end of history. I have a little bit of problem with this uh, sort of uh, um, different arrival times, like these different histories. I mean, only because I mean, I don't know where in Koshev he speaks about like you know different histories sort of converging towards the post. Maybe maybe there's a place where he does talk about this, but it seems to me. That, that if history is over, it, it is it's an event that would be of a, that would be global. Would, wouldn't you say? I mean, it seems to me from reading or from my interpretation of Koshev, it would be like it would, it would it would go it would go like that. I mean, you also have the like we, we spoke about it already, the Schmidt uh, uh, Koshev correspondences, where uh, I mean Schmidt is still. I mean, and again, it, it's contradicting completely what I said in my talk. So, I mean, but uh, it, but Koshev is is it basically. When they're having this discussion about um, uh, how is it uh, uh, division, um, appropriation, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. exactly, and uh, Koshev is like, Production. I mean, there's only grazing left to do, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it, is grazing somehow political, or is it just simply administration at this point? And is that the same thing as politics? I'm, I'm, I'm not so convinced. Mm -hmm. I mean, it depends. Like, uh, what type of definition of politics are, are we looking for? Mm -hmm. but, there's two. There's also two aspects to this question posed by Ovidio. Because one is, I mean, you could also ask, what kind of people, what would Kozhev do? So, what kind of people Kozhev did look up to in his sort of practical sphere? It wasn't a lot. He had a pretty high opinion of himself. But he's this Pierre Paul Schweitzer was at the time Secretary General of, I think, the um, uh, of the IMF of the International Monetary Fund. So he would definitely. Look, uh, unlike what is customary in academia, uh, you would definitely uh, look up to a lot of these high-ranking secretary generals, directors, presidents of the World Bank, the IMF. That's something where he, he calls it a new aristocracy. That's just where basically like-minded people who have 
not been elected by anyone. Yeah? We have been nominated uh, um, who can sort of go around grazing and distributing the world and sort of making sure that, that things grow harmoniously. The other issues, of course, that maybe the era isn't one where Kojavians thrive anymore. I mean, I don't know how far, well known he is outside Germany, the political scientist Herfried Münkler. He, after, of course, the war in Ukraine, he basically said, I mean, this is this is the final sort of nail in the coffin of Kojav. I'm pretty sure that uh, people probably said that after 9-11 as well. And it is possible to think that this is one of those skirmishes in the provinces uh, uh, that Bokushev would uh, would have thought of it. But there is this idea of, and this is this, this is an update of a Schmidt Strauss correspondence. When geopolitics rears its head, it that might not look good for Bokushev, because ultimately, when we 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 sort these of big land scale, uh, large scale land wars <laughs> and expansion is uh, aggressive warfare is not something that sits easily with that sort of philosophy of history and that maybe um, that the Kozhevian action has uh, has less purchase now than it had, say, in the heyday of globalization up to 2001 when China joined the World Trade Organization. Uh, and, and, and now, of course, also that, uh, I mean, technocracy isn't uh, has a reputational issue as well. I mean, that is, you know, the problem that forever bedevils the European Commission that, that, that as soon as uh, people are, people are very sensitive now to sort of unelected authorities and are not willing to entrust. I mean, you've seen it with COVID as well. This sort of expert rule by experts is, is is come under a lot of legitimacy pressure. And so the idea of uh, I mean, it would be interesting as a thought experiment to to to, to kind of think about how Kozhev would 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 navigate the, the, the current waters and to what extent there 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 are ones in which you would feel comfortable. Um, to be honest, I just, uh, I'm loving this debate. I don't really have any strong question. It's just to kind of keep hearing you. Uh, so to Eduardo, you said that Vile is a bit more more Marxian than Koji. I, I won't explore that too much, but it's interesting that at, uh, in the 50s, when Koji is also exploring the idea of categories more explicitly in, in his book on Kant, he decides to, he transforms can in categories a little bit, and it decides to introduce labor and struggle into the philosophical categories, which is kind of a, we a very weird move. But, but there's kind of a trace of Kozhev's Marxism in, in that introduction of labor and struggle into the philosophical categories. So, so I, I would like to know what you think about that. To Kyle, you are presenting the Latin Empire as the catacomb. But, but it's interesting that he presents the Latin Empire as uh, that which can allow the transition towards uh, the global state, unlike America and Russia who want to advance too fast. The Latin Empire is the one who actually allows the transition rather than holding, holding the, the advance. It, it, it kind of creates the transition through some kind of weird ideological form that goes here probably serious, but uh, that's it. And, and, and the debate between Kozhev and Strauss is somewhat interesting because you, you said that, okay, how do did people perceive who won this confrontation? But it's interesting that to a certain degree it feels like Kozhev uh, does understand what Strauss is saying. While the other way around is not so clear, because we also nowadays are also kind of s still discussing what is it that Kozhev says about nature. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for Strauss, Kozhev represents somewhat of a caricature of modernity. Mm -hmm. and, and what he says that modernity says about nature is not what Kozhev says about nature. So kind of there, there, there is perhaps a, a misunderstanding of Kozhev in, in, in that step. Uh, the, and Kozhev plays along with it, kind of. Mm -hmm. he, he seems to have fun at the fact that Strauss doesn't totally understand what he, he wants to say, and he doesn't provide a clear answer. So in that sense, he's in kind of Kozhev in, in a higher position for the simple fact that he actually understands what the other side wants to say. So thank you, and thank you for the thoughts. Thank you. Uh, 
for the question. Um, yeah, th this is an aspect uh, that I think while um, this is a Kojivian aspect of while uh, of philosophy of while at this of uh, the, the struggle and the work of the of slave. Um, and, and I think that by is a quasi Kojivian in this sense. But the, um, the aspects of um, more structural of the, the Marxian, of the Valian Marxian, in this sense, is the analysis of the societies in, uh, um, yeah, in a social, sociology sense. In, and the aspect that in Kerjev disappear. Um, because uh, I, I think that this depend of uh, um, precisely for the uh, theological secular, vision, secularized in a in a secularized form, and the the quite the material questions in, in Kojab uh, and in the reading Hegel or Marxian um, or Hegel, uh, I, I think that disappeared totally in this sense. Um, but Weil is uh, an auditor of, uh, um, of uh, seminars uh, of Kojev, and so the, this, this, this question of the struggle and the work of slave is, is central, because I think that the idea, the general idea is uh, um, a story like uh, uh, emancipation progress of humanity. But in Kojev, um, the end uh, is is completely different by uh, than than uh, than uh, than uh, Weil in this sense, uh, and uh, the, the 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 struggle and the and the work of slave uh, in Weil uh, have to continue um, because the uh, analysis of societies is uh, incomplete in this sense uh, for, for uh, the Valian philosophy. And uh, the logic de la philosophie is a system, uh, is, is a, a system ouvert, uh, is an open system in this sense. And uh, uh, so uh, I think, but the, the, the Kojivian element in Weil is, is precisely the the struggle and the work of the slave, in this sense, but the 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 goal in the end is completely different. Yeah, Georgia, it's 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 a. I mean, this distinction, it, it, transition, or or is it truly something that Wolfax uh, say something like Schmidt would call world unity, or we can call unipolarity, or something like this. Um, I mean, even for Schmidt, I mean, the catacomb is never just one thing. I mean, it would be it would be wrong to call it a transition, but I mean, uh, Micheli um, Nicoletti writes on the, all the different versions of the catacomb that appear within Schmidt, and it's a long article. Uh, and uh, so I, I think even at one point, uh, Hegel is the Antichrist, and then Hegel becomes the catacomb. And then at, an, at, at a certain point, Schmidt becomes the catacomb, I think, even. I think it was sort of, but, but, it, but essentially, it's more of a question of Schmidt. It's like, who isn't the catacomb at a certain point? I mean, it's just whoever he thinks is like holding back this idea of a apocalyptic uh, 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 destruction. I mean, in the context of the Latin Empire uh, of, of Kochev, he's clearly, what well, seems to me at least, clearly worried about um, uh, the, an idea of a destructive force of unipolarity or the idea of a of an apocalyptic world war three and he's like and he says it openly he's like i'm like there, there's a question here about like the future existence of, of of europe if something like that happens if 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 europe has to host another war then then europe is finished and so he's worried about holding back this idea of total destruction so in that particular sense i was trying to align it with uh with uh, um Schmidt's notion of, of the catacomb, which I mean, it's a difficult task to be honest with you, because I mean, it's 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 oftentimes unclear. I mean, I mean, the the books that I listed, I mean, Kachari's book is is excellent for this. I mean, 
it, it's a whirlwind going through all of the different examples of the different forms the catacomb can take. And, and at the very end, it's 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 very um, it's 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 even not entirely clear to pin down Kachar's position. It's, it, like the catacomb, it's a very slippery concept. I was meaning in this very particular sense that it can be it can be compared. This idea of unipolarity. Yeah, yeah, now I'm putting me in the so uncomfortable position over here that I, that I feel almost compelled to defend Strauss because, I mean, no matter how much we like him, there is, there is an issue here that, I mean, if you have a reader Straussian interpretation of a Greek text, are you afterwards, you do ask yourself, what is he actually trying to tell me? With Kozhev, He's always yelling at you what he's trying to tell you, and whatever. And I and I, and I, I love tyranny and wisdom. It's a great text, but he, he's, it's a very superficial engagement with the actual text. It's it's in, in, it's a great contribution to what are the stakes of sort of uh, philosophy of history in circa 1950. But he he also talks past Leo Strauss, and there's this whole. There's really, he doesn't follow Strauss into certain details. There's a sort of discussion about the difference between honor and admiration in uh, Eros and uh, uh, what these feelings are. And all Kuzhev can think about is that, okay, he's read in Hegel, that, that in the early Christian Hegel, there's some development in love, and they discussed it in, 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 with Gaston Fessard, and there already Kuzhev rejected love as a kind of category because you love someone for what that person is and not for what person does. And that's why it's, again, essentially passive and not dynamic. And he just reiterates that, basically. And, and I, I, I would give uh, Strauss credit that is, 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 is a, it's a much more fine-grained, almost identificatory reading with, 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 with a text, basically. But uh, um, he, he I mean, he's playing along, and it's very interesting. We, we, depending on what you ask in this in this in this in this volume, basically, that uh, uh, um, the Straussians edited, uh, they said that Strauss, seeming all passive and overpowered by Kozhev's onslaught, is just mimicry. He is just playing along so that he can look so timid toward the, com compared to Kozhev's so very alpha male uh, energy that he brings to the room. Uh, and 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 I think that 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 bit um, in those because it's quite an industry. There are so many Straussians. They they they, they come, There's a lot of commentary from their side that we Kuzhevians don't take on board, and they have no trouble showing that obviously he's I mean, he's excellent in ancient Greek and Latin, but he's a sloppy reader of the text. And you know, and Strauss will then um, Strauss will count the number of times a word is used in what context, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's by the way what makes this text so boring. But there is that, that, that there, there's, a, there's a precision and a, a scrupulousness to the scholar that the Strauss that is that is that is not the same uh, with a sort of freewheeling creativity that you find in Kozhev. I'm just to finish. I, I I can't get over this thing that Massimo said about um, when you talk about um, Eric Weil, by the way, like both Kozhev and Strauss ganged up on him in a horrible way and didn't talk about it very nicely. But what you said about that. While really thinks through political economy in the 20th century in a way Kozhev doesn't, but Kozhev sort of does it, acts it, because you can't you can't imagine Eric Weil negotiating banana export arrangements between France and the colonies, which Kozhev did, and, and, and it's just it doesn't it, it doesn't make sense, and there's also that's why we are so interested. Ultimately, he's much more of an academic. And Kozhev as well, and that's why the question of education is. And 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 Kozhev, I think, starts to find it annoying the more he lets the professor hang out. I think that's yeah, there's um, what's the word? It's an issue of habitus. Where the habitus changes, and Kozhev goes into what sort of aristocratic bureaucracy, and 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 Weil is the sort of a wisdom on the sort of a university chair figure. And apparently, uh, Hannah Arendt, who was also a close friend with his wife, yeah, you know, wife. Uh, even he, sh she says he 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 gets a bit sort of um, annoying, and he doesn't. Apparently, he didn't treat his wife very very nicely uh, at all. Yeah, I think that's the problem in Weil is uh, a possible uh, moralistic. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Way. It gets stronger, I mean, right? Yeah. When he it, rediscovers Kant, it gets stronger. It's the problem, and. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what, when we talked about it, so yeah. when I, my it's favorite not bits of fire is like his critique articles from the first five years of critique. It's like the most amazing columnist of current affairs you can imagine from a hardcore Marxist perspective, almost Stalinist. And that's, but Bile later completely disavows those articles and doesn't want to be reminded of them. In, the, want in this sense, um, paradoxically, Kojeb is more Hegelian than Bile. And uh, I, I think mm. um, Bile, tur Bile turned to Kant. Mm. And uh, mm. I think that um, try to read the Kant and Marx uh, in, 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 in a strange link, mm. um, in a strange, in a link, in a possible link. But uh, while it's not a politician, no. this I, I think that's that's the, the problem. Now, by the philosophy. Okay, to finish this session, I have an answer. Um, uh, before. Uh, Answer. Uh, how to be a Kojibian? Uh, I have the answer. Let's go to drink. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Thank you to people who is connected. Um, uh, at tomorrow morning at 9:30. Mais avant de, de partir, euh, c'est le professeur Roberto Russo, qui est notre directeur général, et qui nous donne une un salutation institutionnelle. Je, je lui remercie beaucoup d'être là avec nous. Merci, directeur. Alors, bienvenue à tous. Pardonnez-moi si je ne parlerai pas en français, parce que je ne le sais pas parler. Beaucoup de eux comprennent l'italien. C'est une langue très polyglotte. E io purtroppo no, quindi vi ringrazio di essere qui, ringrazio anche le persone collegate, mi piace sempre ricordare a tutti coloro che ci vengono a fare visita al nostro Ateneo che questa biblioteca antica, tutti i volumi che vedete sono in braille, forse una delle poche, sicuramente in Italia l'unica. Eh, perché qui studia studiavano i non vedenti, i bambini non vedenti tanto tempo fa, quindi tutta questa biblioteca è con i loro libri. E a me piace l'idea che è un luogo di studio e di approfondimento dove possiamo toccare con mano che non ci sono limiti a imparare, quindi anche a chi ha difficoltà percettive, quindi non vede, e, e per coerenza stiamo attivando dei corsi sulla LIS, sul linguaggio dei segni, proprio per poter eh, portare avanti questa idea che non ci sono limiti, non ci sono eh, occasioni per eh, non imparare e, e io ho poca dimistichezza con francese, vado sul latino, ic et nunc sapere aude, qui e adesso osa imparare, osa crescere. E con questo saluto eh, auguro a tutti voi una prosecuzione di buon lavoro. Merci bien, notre euh, directeur de général. Et bon, euh, moi aussi, je veux donner, porter ma, ma, mes salutations à Nina Kuznetsov, euh, à Grebe Slati, Francesco Scol, Dimitri Tokarev, qui, qui sont connectés, qui vont suivre les, les, les travaux de, de ce matin-là. Et hier, euh, en parlant de, 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 des livres qui, sont, qui ont été publiés sous Cogeb euh, dans la dernière, j'ai oublié, en parlant de, de, de vous parler de ces livres-là, c'est-à-dire Eduardo Raimondi, Hegel, Alexandre Cogeb et Derek Weil, qui, euh, l'auteur qui est avec nous, il, il n'a jamais vu <rire> ces livres-là, et moi j'ai la chance de l'avoir en, en avance. Et c'est un très très beau travail sur euh, le, les rapports entre Eric Pall et Kojev, dans lequel hier hein, nous, nous avons entendu parler. Et bon, euh, je, je, je ne vais à prendre du temps à Dimitri Tokarev, qui est notre premier keynote speaker. Uh, la relation de Dimitri, c'est Sophie Miss Fortune, Wizo et Yum et Alexandre Kojev. Et je pense qu'il uh, nous donnera la, 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 la lecture en française. Et, et bon, je, je, je lui laisse la parole. Et c'est un plaisir de, de, de vous avoir avec nous, uh, Dimitri. Et nous, nous attendons. Merci bien. Uh, 
Oui, merci Marco, merci à tout le monde en fait. Oui, effectivement, je vais parler en français. Et donc, je choisis comme titre, voilà, enfin, les malheurs de, de la Sofia pour, euh, pour expliciter dès le début, en fait, euh, l'esprit un peu ironique dans lequel je vais parler hein, et je vais tenir mon discours parce que le sujet est comme ça. Alors, je commence et je vais essayer de feuilleter aussi les pages de ma présentation. Ben, il n'y a pas grand chose, il y a juste des citations en fait que je donne pour que vous puissiez les, les voir comme ça et que ce soit plus compréhensible. Alors, euh, on connaît l'importance de la figure du sage pour Kojeb. Le sage apparaît à la fin de l'histoire et incarne le savoir absolu dans l'état universel et homogène. Le sage, je cite, « vit et agit » mais il ne vit que par la science et il n'agit que pour la science. Fin de citation. De sorte que cette figure du sage prenne des dimensions surhumaines dont suprême savant de Rimbaud qui le décrit dans sa lettre du voyant dans d'autres textes. Il est facile d'imaginer ce sage des derniers temps, un maniaque du savoir, toujours concentré, sérieux, satisfait de sa supériorité intellectuelle. Georges Bataille s'est au moins insurgé contre cette autosatisfaction du sage dans une lettre du 8 avril 1952, écrite en réaction à l'article de Kojève consacré au roman de Raymond Queneau, que je vais en réunir plus tard. Il existe certes une certaine ambiguïté dans la manière dont Kojev décrit la fin de l'histoire et l'état de satisfaction tant physique qu'intellectuelle dont jouissent les hommes post-historiques. D'un côté, les sages, si ce n'est le seul et unique sage, s'opposent aux autres êtres, aux autres êtres qui appartiennent à un monde animal plutôt qu'à celui des hommes. De fait, Kojev prône que, et vous voyez la première citation, euh, l'homme reste en vie en tant qu'animal qui est en accord avec la nature et l'être donné. Ce qui disparaît, c'est l'homme proprement dit, c'est-à-dire l'action négatrice du donné et l'erreur, ou en général le sujet opposé à l'objet. » Dans une note de la seconde édition de l'introduction à la lecture de Hegel, Kojev assume que, poussé à l'extrême, son argument devient ambigu pour ne pas dire contradictoire. Je vais passer à l'autre image. Voilà, comme ça. Euh, je cite « Il faudrait donc admettre qu'après la fin de l'histoire, les hommes construiraient leurs édifices et leurs ouvrages d'art comme les oiseaux construisent leurs nids et les araignées tissent leurs toiles, exécuteraient des concerts musicaux à l'instar de grenouilles et de cigales, joueraient comme jouent les, les jeunes animaux et s'adonneraient à l'amour comme le font des bêtes euh, des adultes. Mais on ne peut pas dire alors que tout ceci rend l'homme heureux. Il faudrait dire que les animaux post-historiques de l'espèce Homo sapiens, qui vivront dans l'abondance et en pleine sécurité, seront contents en fonction de leur comportement artistique, érotique et ludique, vu que, par définition, ils s'en contenteront. Mais il y a plus. L'anéantissement définitif de l'homme, proprement dit, signifie aussi la disparition définitive du discours, logos, humain au sens propre. Les animaux de l'espèce homo sapiens réagiraient par des réflexes conditionnés à des signaux sonores ou mimiques et leur soi-disant discours serait ainsi semblable au prétendu langage des, des abeilles. Ce qui disparaîtrait alors, ce n'est pas seulement les philosophies ou la recherche de la sagesse discursive, mais encore cette, cette sagesse elle-même. Car il n'y aurait plus, chez ces animaux post-historiques, de connaissances discursives du monde et de soi. De fin de citation. Il est évident pourtant que le sage dont la seule action est le livre, ne peut pas se refuser la parole discursive. Le langage des abeilles est plutôt réservé à ceux qui se sont retournés dans l'animalité, ce qui n'est pas sans rappeler le roman du biologiste russe Konstantin Merechkovsky, frère du célèbre écrivain et penseur Dimitri Merechkovsky, donc le roman de Konstantin Merechkovsky, Le paradis terrestre, publié à Berlin en 1903. Source d'inspiration pour plusieurs utopies russes, 
dans la trilogie de Fyodor Solugup, La légende créée, ce texte décrit une société proto-fasciste avec des intellectuels, des protecteurs, qui seuls possèdent le droit du langage, et des êtres humains, juvénilisés, qui passent leur temps à faire l'amour et à jouer. Une troisième classe de cette société est composée d'esclaves abrutis qui travaillent pour les sages et les enfants. Si chez Merchkovski, les frontières entre les classes de cette société sont infranchissables du fait de leur caractère biologique, que je fasse que le sage, une fois son livre accompli, peut passer à un autre genre de sagesse, celui de la rue et de son langage vulgaire et banal. Que Jeff en parle longuement dans un article qu'il consacre au roman de Raymond Cunon en 1952. Intitulé « Roman de la sagesse », ce texte présente trois héros de Cunon, notre ami Piero, le poète de Rueil et le soldat Bru, trois voyous désœuvrés, détenteurs d'une sagesse profonde et inédite. Ainsi, le soldat Bru, je tourne la page, ainsi, le soldat bru, je cite, ne vit-il pas en pleine métaphysique puisqu'il ne pense généralement à rien Ou s'il pense à quelque chose, cette chose n'est autre que la bataille d'Ina et consacre ses vastes loisirs à l'identification du néant, de sa certitude subjective avec le néantissement de l'être en soi, de l'être en soi temporel concrétisé, en tant qu'une horloge qui lui permet de compter jusqu'à trois et même au sommet de sa sagesse jusqu'à quatre. Fin de citation. Le soldat bru parle de tout et de n'importe quoi, en ne parlant au fond que de lui-même. En cela, il s'inscrit dans la lignée de Socrate, lui aussi au voyou des œuvres, et de Hegel, dont l'en-soi et le pour-soi étaient, comme dit Kogev, des expressions très simples, pour ne pas dire banales, empruntées à l'élément courant. Il faut préciser pourtant qu'à la différence de Bru, Hegel développe une réflexion théorique sur le fait de penser le monde qui se, ré... qui se révèle en soi pensant. En effet, si Bru ne pense généralement à rien, comment donc le monde peut-il se révéler dans et par ses pensées Le soldat de Cuno est le sage qui ne pense pas, mais peut-on en dire autant du sage de Hegel et de Kogel Il en va de même pour le langage. Si le langage de Bru est en français parlé, on se rappelle le projet du néo-français développé par Cuno, donc c'est en français parlé qui renvoie en un sens aux expérimentations des poètes russes dites transmentaux des, des années 10-20, Kojev prend soin d'avertir ses lecteurs que son contrat dû est, est écrit en illisible quasi-français, qui prétend n'avoir rien en commun avec le langage des sages cunéliens. La différence réside dans le fait que Kojev parodie son propre style, donc occupe une position extérieure par rapport au langage. Si l'on admet que les héros peu héroïques de Kuno sont des sages modernes, alors celui qui révèle leur sagesse doit adopter une position défamiliarisante, étrangisante par rapport à celle-ci. Donc si on emprunte le terme de formaliste russe, défamiliarisation, étrangisation. Donc c'est une position défamiliarisante, étrangisante, position qui permet de parler de la sagesse en termes de, paradis, de, de parodie. Au niveau du langage, cela se traduit par des équivoques rhétoriques de toutes sortes et de jeux de mots parfois un peu mauvais dont sont truffés les deux comptes rendus de Kogev, l'un sur Kono et l'autre sur Françoise Sagan. Selon Jacques-Alain Miller, la récession de l'heure de Sagan a tout donc annulaire. Le cœur de Wall, jetons-nous l'autre face de la sagesse, à savoir la capacité du sage de rire de lui-même. Un langage philosophique qui touche à l'illisible et l'incompréhensible, en cela, il fait semblant au langage des, pareils, des abeilles, qui se présente comme une parodie de lui-même, sert justement à défamiliariser le langage de la rue, qui procède d'une perception automatisée du monde. Et vice-versa, quand Hegel emploie des expressions de l'élément courant, euh, tel en soi, pour soi, dans le contexte du langage obscur et occulte de la phénoménologie de l'esprit, il a recours à un procédé pareil d'étrangisation. Kogev 
se souvient de cette première lecture de la philologie de l'esprit dans une interview accordée en janvier 1968 à Gilles Lapouge. Il est dit euh, « Hegel, j'ai essayé de le lire, j'ai lu quatre fois, et dans son long, la philologie de l'esprit. Je m'acharnais, je n'en ai pas compris au mot. » Fin de citation. Le brouillard ne se dissipe que quand il y retrouve un nom historique qui culmine dans la figure de Napoléon. Je cite, j'ai relu la phénologie et, quand je suis arrivé au chapitre 4, alors j'ai compris que c'était Napoléon. Fin de citation. C'est une révélation immédiate qui se produit sur le champ. Ici, je me permets, euh, au jeu de mots, car un russe, je vais vous montrer... Euh, en russe, donc, Napoléon n'a plus Paul et plus on, donc exactement, il est sur le champ. Donc, c'est une révélation qui se produit sur le champ. Et c'est une révélation sur Napoléon. Toujours sur le même ton de l'auto-ironie, Kojev prend un plaisir particulier à souligner que ce cours à l'EPHE était fréquenté non pas seulement par des intellectuels, tels Breton, Bataille, Lacan, Cuno, mais aussi par un contre-amiral de la flotte et son épouse. On a même l'impression que sans l'amiral, son séminaire aurait perdu pour lui de son charme intellectuel. Les notes prises par le tout jeune Kojev au début des années 1920 dévoilent déjà son goût pour le paradoxe et le jeu. Le 20 octobre 1920, il cite par exemple un poème philosophico-ironique de Pouchkine qui porte le titre « Mouvement ». Euh, je vais vous le, le montrer, euh, qui porte donc le titre « Mouvement », c'est un poème de 1825, et évoque une dispute entre Zénon Délé et Diogène. « Aucun mouvement n'existe », a dit un sage barbu, « un autre a préféré garder le silence et s'est mis à marcher devant lui, il n'aurait pas pu objecter plus fort que cela, tout le monde a fait l'éloge de sa réponse complexe ». Je cite dans ma traduction. Euh, Hegel s'en souvient dans ses leçons sur l'histoire de la philosophie, euh, souvient de ce dispute, en soulignant que trop se fier à l'évidence serait une erreur. Pouchkine prolonge sa réflexion poétique dans le même esprit. Pourtant, messieurs, cet événement amusant éveille dans ma mémoire un autre exemple. Le soleil tourne autour de nous tout le jour, cependant c'est l'obstiné Galilée qui a raison. Fin de citation. Une autre anecdote tirée de la vie de Diogène semble illustrer les propos de Kojev sur l'homme post-historique qui exécuterait des concerts musicaux à l'instar de Grunou et des cigales. Et cette anecdote dit que par, par, par là au jour devant un auditoire clairsemé et inattentif, Diogène s'est mis soudain à gazouiller, à siffler et à croisser bruyamment, entrecoupant ses vocalises de beaux beaux rythmes et inattendus. Une foule énorme se rassembla très vite autour de lui, écoutant son récital en silence avec attention. Donc le philosophe donc injuria alors les badauds, le reprochant de se moquer de choses sérieuses et d'accourir pour écouter des sottises. Le sage, le sage se sert justement du langage des obéis pour défamiliariser son propre discours philosophique. Une autre possibilité d'étrangisation serait de transformer son discours en illisible quasi grec ou illisible quasi allemand, euh, procédé dont use Kojev dans son compte rendu sur Kuno. Notons qu'une des premières apparitions de la notion de sagesse a lieu dans un commentaire que donne Kojev euh, dans l'aphorisme de Kozma Proutkov. Proutkov, auteur fictif qui fait parfois penser au père Ubu d'Alfred Jarry, fut inventé par le poète Alexei Tolstoï et ses cousins, les trois frères Jemchuznikov, dans les années 60-70 du 19e siècle. De Proutkov, Kojev retient un aphorisme humoristique pour en révéler la sagesse profonde et même universelle. Je vous montre la citation. Euh, voilà. Donc, hier, nous sommes restés écrit Kojev dans son journal philosophique, « Hier, nous sommes restés toute la nuit devant la fontaine de la Piazza d'Espagne. Durant notre conversation, j'ai mentionné l'aphorisme, selon moi, de grande valeur, de Kozma Proutkov, « Claque une jument sur le nez, elle agitera la queue. 
Je ne connais rien de plus profond que cette maxime. Elle peut avoir mille sens, elle peut être appliquée dans mille sens. On me disait qu'en soi, elle était dénuée de tout sens. Mais toute pensée n'a de valeur qu'ici on la comprend. Et qu'est-ce qui donc, sinon ce qui est insensé, peut être interprété de manière indéfiniment différente L'éphorisme de Proutkov ne peut-il pas peut-être contenir toute la sagesse de l'humanité Et point d'interrogation. Cette réflexion évoque le caractère naïf et direct d'une vision du monde propre à l'enfant, que Dominique Offray, par exemple, dans sa biographie, considère être celle de Coget. En effet, quoi de plus naïf que de voir un lien direct entre le fait de claquer un jument sur le nez et de l'observer agiter sa queue Mais au-delà de ce déterminisme évident, Coget soutient que cette action peut avoir mille sens, ou, pour être plus précis, qu'il peut être interprété de manière infiniment différente, parce qu'il est dénué de tout sens. Ou, si l'on veut, son seul sens est de montrer qu'il n'a pas de sens. À qui pourrait-il venir à l'esprit de claquer une jument sur le nez, si ce n'était un enfant ou bien un sage Sauf que l'enfant le fait juste comme ça, pour voir ce qui va se passer. Et la jument va agiter sa queue, tandis que le sage le fait pour réfléchir de ce que l'acte d'agiter la queue pourrait signifier. Rappelons également la réponse que Coget va donner, quelques 30 ans plus tard, à la question des mots ortigues sur le rapport de l'homme à la sagesse, et examinons à quel point celle-ci est toujours liée pour lui au rire. Je vais vous montrer la citation. Donc, je le dis dans cette interview, c'est la même chose que le rapport de l'homme avec Dieu, explique Coget à Ortigue. C'est l'histoire des malheurs de Sophie. Rappelez-vous que je n'ai pas publié moi-même l'introduction à la lecture de Hegel. La publication a été faite par une humoriste, Raymond Cunot. Ce point est très important pour, pour moi. D'ailleurs, Cunot a résumé, a résumé la phénologie de l'esprit en écrivant Zazie dans le métro. Zazie était venue à Paris pour euh, voir le métro. Mais la seule fois où elle, était, où elle est allée dans le métro, il s'est endormi et n'a rien vu. Voilà le roman de la sagesse. Fin de citation. Zazie, effectivement, agit comme l'enfant qui claque la jument. Il veut voir, voir le métro. Le fait qu'il n'a rien vu devient matière à réflexion, au même titre que le fait d'avoir vu la jument agiter sa queue. Reste à savoir si cette réflexion va mener au savoir, ou bien va s'embourber dans une infinité de sophismes, tels que tels ceux que Nabokov, Vladimir Nabokov, imagine dans « Ada ou l'ardeur » 1969, euh, quand il invente les sophismes de Sophie, de Mademoiselle Stopchin, faisant ainsi allusion à l'écrivaine catholique russe salonnière parisienne, Madame Sophie Svechin, mais aussi au malheur de Sophie, de la comtesse de Ségur, née Sophie Rostopchin. Euh, les malheurs de Sophie, euh, son livre qui a été publié en 1858 et qui vit devenu un livre incontournable pour tous les enfants de l'époque, et même plus tard. Donc Nabokov invente les sophismes de Sophie de, de Mademoiselle Stopchin et ça renvoie, je, je le répète, à Madame Sophie Svechin, ben, personnage réel, et au malheur de Sophie de la comtesse de Ségur, mais Sophie Rostopchin. Euh, donc, « Malheur de Sophie », c'est le premier roman de la trilogie sur les épreuves d'une toute, toute jeune fille, Sophie de Réa. Et ce roman, « Les malheurs de Sophie », fut traduit en russe en 1864 sous le titre « Sonin Prakaz », littéralement « Les farces de Sophie ». Donc, pas « Les malheurs de Sophie », mais « Les farces de Sophie ». Ainsi, le titre russe met en avant l'aspect humoristique des histoires de Sophie, plus que l'original. Pour Kojev, l'expérience de sa lecture d'enfant, et ben, il faut le dire encore une fois, que tous les enfants de l'époque lisaient euh, ce livre de Sophie de Ségur, hein, soit enfin, en original, soit en traduction. Donc pour Kojev, l'expérience de sa lecture d'enfant semble ne pas avoir perdu de sa pertinence. Si l'on ne peut pas prétendre que la, sa la sagesse, la Sophia, lui serait pour la première fois apparue sous le trait d'une petite fille coquine espiègle, bon, rappelons que dans le roman de Sophie de Figure, c'est une fille de 9 ans, 
on ne peut pas prétendre que la sagesse a apparu à Kojev face ou ses traits, il faut quand même se rappeler que le tout jeune Vladimir Soloviov, en revanche, en tombe amoureux, ouvrant ainsi une série d'apparitions de, de la Sophia incarnée. D'abord dans une église à Moscou, puis au British Museum et en fait dans le désert égyptien. Le poète de Vladimir Soloviov, trois rencontres, qui date de 1898, décrit cette expérience mystique avec une grande éloquence lyrique qui paraîtrait excessif s'il n'était pas atténué par une haute ironie grinçante. Donc, dans ce poème de Soloviov, les, les visions mystiques de la Sophia sont ainsi constamment mises à distance, sans toutefois perdre de leur valeur. Et ben, pour la première fois, justement, la Sophia apparaît à Vladimir Soloviov euh, sous les traits euh, d'une petite fille coquine espiègue. Donc, et puis, ça donne euh, accès à la première vision de la Sophia, enfin, la vraie, la vraie euh, vision qui se passe dans une église à Moscou. Mais au début, c'est quand même une petite fille dont il tombe amoureux qui déclenche en fait cette série de visions de la Sophia qui va l'amener jusqu'à jusqu'à jusqu'au désert d'Égypte. Dans son son essai, la métaphysique religieuse de Vladimir Soloviov. Kojev souligne l'importance qu'accorde Soloviov à la beauté physique de la Sophia. Je cite, cette Sophia de sa mystique vécue est un être individuel, concret, vivant, presque tangible et en tout cas accessible à la vue. Un être divin et humain, humain sous forme féminine. Un être proche et condescendant, accessible à une communion intellectuelle, personnelle et directe, comprenant et adressant la parole. Un être qui aide et qui guide dans la vie. Un être enfin qui est né d'un amour vif et ardent, sublimé certes, et épuré de toute sensualité, mais néanmoins conscient d'être adressé à un être féminin qui l'accepte, lui répond peut-être et le récompense en tout cas en révélant sa beauté, qui n'est jamais une beauté abstraite et est même parfois une beauté féminine. Fin de citation. Cet amour pour la Sophia incarnée rime en même temps avec l'humour avec lequel Soloviov raconte ses émotions. Il est très important que dans son traité inachevé « La Sophia », écrit en français en 1876, le philosophe affirme que le caractère métaphysique de l'homme est révélé dans l'art, la poésie et le rire. Je cite Soloviov, « L'animal est complètement absorbé par la réalité donnée, ne peut pas se mettre dans une position critique et négative envers elle. Et c'est pour cela qu'il ne rit pas, ou qu'il ne peut pas rire, car le rire suppose un état libre, l'esclave ne rit pas. » Fin de citation. D'où on pourrait tirer une conclusion qui ne serait déplaire à Kojève. L'esclave commence à rire quand il cesse d'être animal et devient un homme pensant. Selon Soloviov, la liberté métaphysique de l'homme, je cite, « acquiert la conscience de soi dans le rire réfléchi de l'homme qui pense ». Ce rire devient possible dès que l'homme se rend compte du contraste entre, je cite, « cette réalité apparente qui est toute la réalité pour la brute et pour l'homme abruti » et « un autre monde idéal ». Kojev, certes, ne pouvait pas connaître la Sophia, qui ne fut publié qu'en 1978 par les soins de l'abbé jésuite François Rouleau. C'est la longue toutefois que Soloviov développe l'idée du rire comme fondement métaphysique de l'homme pendant les leçons professées au cours supérieur pour les femmes en 1875. En 1921, paraît Petrograd en compte rendu de la première leçon, donnée le 14 janvier 1875, où le philosophe définit justement l'homme comme un animal riant. Le même année, donc 1875, Soloviov part pour Londres pour se précipiter ensuite en Égypte. Ce départ inattendu, provoqué par la vision de la Sophia, est lié à l'intérêt du jeune philosophe pour le gnosticisme, la tradition hermétique et la cabale. On en trouve des traces dans le texte de la Sophia, 
jusque dans la structure triadique des fragments écrits au Caire. À marge du texte, nous trouvons une remarque. Cette remarque est en russe, en fait. Le texte est en français, mais la remarque est en russe. Elle dit « Ensof, Logos, Sofia, Pierre et Troy, c'est la première triade ». Donc, cette remarque en russe laisse penser que Soloyov identifie ici la Sophia à la Shekina, le principe féminin de la cabane. Pourtant, une autre hypothèse n'est pas exclue, à savoir que la Sophia peut renvoyer à la Sephira, euh, je vais vous montrer là, euh, la Sephira euh, Chokma ou Chokma ou Okma en français, que l'on traduit littéralement par sagesse. Le mot euh, Okma, Chokma se prononce en russe Chokma et Solovyov le translétère ainsi dans son article La Kabbale pour le dictionnaire raisonné de Bokaus et Efron ou bien Chokma, cette dernière version représentant en soi un jeu de mots inédit. De fait, Chokma, pas Chokma, mais Chokma avec euh, l'accent qui tombe sur, sur la première syllabe en russe veut dire plaisanterie, farce, anecdote, drôle inventé. Et Chochmach est un farceur qui aime à mystifier les gens avec des histoires invraisemblables. Donc, Okma, c'est la Sephira, et Chochma, c'est une blague, c'est une plaisanterie, c'est une farce. Étymologiquement, Chochma provient du mot hébreu sagesse, Chochma, avec un effet d'attraction paronymique produit par le mot Chochot, le rire en russe. Donc, donc ce, ce mot qui est qui, qui, qui a été emprunté justement de l'hébreu, bah, euh, il ressemble beaucoup à, au mot « chochot », le rire. On parle souvent du rire carnavalesque de Soloviev, qui ne cessait de surprendre ses, ses contemporains. Sur ce plan, Kojev hérite de ce philosophe qui était à l'origine du phénomène culturel insolite que représentait le cirque d'argent russe. Loin d'être un simple trait de caractère, euh, le goût de Kojev pour la plaisanterie, pour le canular, euh, traduit à mon avis une, une intuition plus profonde, décelant une incroyable parenté entre la sagesse et le rire. Et encore un mot pour finir en fait mon intervention. Euh, pour Soloviev, un autre monde idéal est nécessairement une réalité divine transcendante, que Kojev quant à lui rejette, bien sûr. Pourtant, le sage, Kojévian, n'appartient-il pas lui aussi en réalité double D'un côté, il constate la fin de l'histoire, et de l'autre, il vit parmi les gens qui ignorent cette vérité suprême. Dans un entretien avec Gilles Lapouge, en 1968, Kojev parle de la nature divine du sage, qui ne fait, pas, qui ne fait plus rien hormis jouer. Je vais vous montrer. Je cite, il est vrai que le discours, que le discours philosophique comme l'histoire est clos. Ça agace, cette idée. C'est peut-être pourquoi les sages, ceux qui succèdent aux philosophes dont Hegel est le premier, sont si rares pour ne pas dire inexistants. Il est vrai que vous ne pouvez accéder à la sagesse que si vous pouvez croire à votre divinité. Or, les gens saints d'esprit sont très rares. Être divin, cela veut dire quoi cela peut, être la sage, la, cela peut être la sagesse stoïcienne ou bien le jeu. Qui joue Ce sont les dieux, ils n'ont pas besoin de réagir, alors ils jouent. Ce sont les dieux fainéants. Fin de citation. Ce sage divin n'est-il pas un avatar, sinon une parodie de l'homme unitotal, se représentant de la divine humanité que prenait ce lieu Stanley Rosen, qui a connu Kojev au début des années 60, se souvient que ce dernier, je cite en anglais, « He often stated his superiority by referring to himself as a god, although once he qualified this assertion by adding that his secretary laughed when he made the claim. » Fin de citation. En 1936, Kojev rédige une note intitulée « Faust » ou l'intellectuel bourgeois, Faust ou l'intellectuel bourgeois, où il écrit entre autres. Faust, après sa vie de savant, veut jouir. Euh, Dominique Coffret dit justement que euh, si Kojev sera alors euh, particulièrement sensible à les références géliennes de Faust concernant l'homme du plaisir, c'est sans doute parce qu'il se retrouvera dans cette figure emblématique de la littérature occidentale telle qu'il était à Berlin, enfin, à Berlin dans les années 20. 
Et quand il était jeune, il jouait beaucoup, en fait. Ouais. Euh, Faust peut devenir un sage euh, s'il a su dépasser le loose principe, ouais, le principe du plaisir, pour révéler par le savoir la réalité incarnée à Napoléon. Or, euh, comme dit Kogef dans, dans son séminaire, euh, le sage devient l'incarnation de l'esprit absolu. Il est donc, si l'on veut, le Dieu incarné dont rêvaient les chrétiens. Et ce commentaire de Kogef, en fait, que je viens de citer, date de la même année, 1936, où il a écrit sa note sur Faust. Mais qu'est-ce que le sage fait après ben, On s'est déjà posé la question au début. Euh, voilà, on peut se les reposer encore une fois. Qu'est-ce que le sage fait après Et moi, je propose de reprendre la formule que Kogev use pour décrire Faust. Ouais, ben, donc il dit que justement Faust, après sa vie de savoir, veut jouir. Et si on reprend cette formule, euh, et si on la modifie un peu, on peut dire Faust, après être devenu un sage, veut jouer. Et en ce faisant, ne ressemble-t-il pas au certain docteur Faustrol, le personnage mythique d'Alfred Jarry qui se plaît à dire qu'il est Dieu. Et je voudrais conclure avec une petite citation qui provient justement des gestes, gestes et opinions du docteur Fostrol, et qui est celle en fait. « Je suis Dieu, » dit Fostrol. « Ah ah !» dit Bosdonage, sans plus de commentaires. Et Bosdonage, c'est un singe, un singe, ouais. mais je dirais un singe assez sage, pour ne pas de donner plus de commentaires à cette affirmation que donne Dr. Fostrol, je suis Dieu. Donc là, Kogef, en quelque sorte, aussi nous dit, ben, il disait cela aux gens qui l'interviewaient, je suis Dieu. Qu'est-ce qu'il nous reste à nous à lui répondre Ah ah, c'est tout, c'est peut-être ça la sagesse finale et absolue. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. Bien, Dimitri, c'est un plaisir de, de vous entendre à propos de, de Sophia. Vous avez bien, bien montré la, la, la difficulté de, 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 de séparer la, la, les parties de, de l'ironie, de la parodie chez Kojev avec les parties un peu plus sérieuses, mais on, on partira de ça. Et now, Isabelle Jacobs, une tu remarques, Isa, Isa. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can. Et, je, je vous propose de, de, de prendre un coffee break, cinq minutes, comme ça on peut gérer la, la question de, de la présentation d'Issa et on revient à 10h45. C'est bien À tout à l'heure, merci. Salut Dimitri, est-ce que vous m'entendez Parce que je crois qu que nous ne sommes pas euh, en ligne dans la salle. Oui, oui. Ah, c'est euh, une très très belle lecture. J'ai ai beaucoup aimé votre lecture. 
Mais juste euh, sur euh, le point de la lecture de Jacques Alain Miller, euh, de, 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 des figures euh, de la sagesse euh, chez Keno, mais aussi la lecture de Kojève de Sagan, c'est... Il y a, vous, vous, vous mentionnez le, la, la notion du rire, euh, mais dans la lecture de Miller, il y a aussi beaucoup de emphasis sur, sur la notion du yes. Donc le courage, il dit le courage peut-être de Kojev, c'est de dire oui, de dire oui à l'Union européenne entre autres et oui aux tyrans. Et euh, cette idée de dire oui aux tyrans, c'est... Euh, ça se trouve aussi chez Kojev dans un article dans son euh, euh, dans Review d'Henri Nil, lorsqu'il parle du courage d'Egel de dire oui à Napoléon. Et donc, euh, il lit dans tout ça une euh, survival strategy. C'est donc euh, le fait de pouvoir, euh, enfin, entre guillemets, euh, collaborer avec le tyran dans le sens de « survival strategy ». C'est donc, il a, il a beaucoup insisté sur cette idée chez Hegel que si Hegel n'a pas reconnu Napoléon, la, la philosophie allemande et l'Allemagne auraient pu disparaître. Et donc, chez lui, c est, c est, il appelle ça l'esprit d'Antigone, parce que cet esprit, encore, encore il le reprend chez Sagan, c'est cet esprit de pouvoir euh, trouver une façon de négocier, en fait, euh, de survivre à la tyrannie, mais d'une façon, enfin, euh, tout est lié, en fait, mais une très, très, très belle lecture, là, ce que vous venez de faire. J'ai beaucoup appris, là, surtout les, la référence à la Chokma en hébreu. Oui, merci beaucoup. Ouais, C'est vrai qu'en fait, j'ai été frappé, moi aussi, quand je, je l'ai découvert, hein, parce que Justement, ce mot russe, euh, ben, identique en fait, ouais, il y a un choc il y a ces et c'est en même temps, en fait, pour le russe, c'est celui qui fait une farce, ouais, c'est une farce, farceur, etc. Et ben, c'est ma lecture, bien sûr, ouais, mais euh, quand on est russe, on ne peut pas passer à côté de cela, parce que bon, c'est évident, en fait, je de mots qui... Il y a Isa peut-être euh, qui va commencer sa, sa présentation. Bon, euh, mais merci beaucoup Dimitri, c'était fascinant. Merci Edgar, oui, merci beaucoup à vous.
contenido. On va reprendre les, 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 les boulons. Alors. OK. Et les, les, les titres de, de la relation d'Isabelle Jacobs is Out of Work, Labor and Inoperativity in Coja Philosophy. Isa, you're welcome. very much. Um, I'm continuing a little bit where uh, Dimitri already led us, so the, the idea of um, sagesse and also what, what is to be done if um, all work has, has been done. And um, I would like to start off with um, James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, which was published in 1916. And there's an interesting tale quite at the start about those who do not work. and um, we first encounter Stephen Dedalus, who also, um, what is this book? Okay. Um, and so we um, first encounter Stephen Dedalus when he's still in school. So he goes to this Jesuit boarding school and the fathers, um, they beat these students and discipline them for homoeroticism, but primarily for laziness and for not working enough. And um, so this is a um, piece of dialogue when one of the fathers enters the class and he says, your work, go to work, all of you, why are you not writing like the others? He asks um, Stephen and then, um, he says, I, my, he could not speak with fright. And then um, he reminds him to go back to work. And this is a returning motive also in the Ulysses, where every time he encounters the idea of employment and work, he remembers this phrase of the lazy schema, which um, he is called in, in uh, this portrait of the artist. And there's a kind of turning point in this event. And um, even in, in the Ulysses, he Daedalus is the one, he wanders around, he gets drunk, he gets lost in messy discussions, and he's not going back to his work uh, in the morning. And in a way, this is a kind of um, modernist anti-hero figure, which um, we have in Joyce, 
which is the the lazy brilliant but lazy would-be artist who um, is unwilling to take up any kind of serious employment and um, that's another great irony and this is why I mentioned Joyce because we have these quite laborious monumental works and they they all deal with laziness and the unwork and, and the idleness and there's a kind of un, it's a kind of unresolved um, paradox as well between the two and it's a it's an, a similar paradox which um, Kozhev uses in this work and it's a paradox between labor and inoperativity and we will see um, what how we can read his work through these two terms and um, let's go to um, so uh, when we when we think about Joyce's Daedalus, we of course think about the figure from Greek mythology, who similarly embodies this paradox between work and inactivity, which Kozhev was so occupied with uh, throughout his life, and the motive of flight is inscribed into Daedalus's identity. So he's known for creating the wings that he and his son uh, Icarus used to try to escape Crete, and uh, it's a well-known story that when Icarus soared towards the sun, uh, the wings which uh, the, the beeswax which was holding the wings together melted and he fell to a tragic death. And uh, this very same motive of man who masters flying is also a returning metaphor in Kozhev, I mean a metaphor of human work. And um, there's this idea that the revolutionary flies in the air and transcends nature by turning herself into an animal and she lives as if she can fly like a bird or a bee. And in um, so the, the motive comes up in the Sophia manuscript and the Hegel lectures and also in the Kant book. And this um, quote here is from uh, the Kant book. Man wants to li live as if it were true that he can fly in the air. If he says this without ever trying it, he's a dreamer or a fool. But if he actually realizes the project of making wings work or making men fly or transcending these constraints of, of men being this earthbound animal, so if he does this big effort of work, and realizes the project, then it is a great revolutionary. And um, in Kant also, of course, this idea of the project is further developed and he and Kuzhev writes there is an as if of work in the successful project. And the airplane for me is very interesting, or the idea of flying very interesting, because there's there's this double movement. Kuzhev both demarcates and dissolves the boundaries between human and animal. And there's something about this um, um, demarcation which is very relevant when it comes to discourses around work or um, the undoing of work. And um, there's also an idea that, um, that language and nature come together in an interesting way, in a flying metaphor. So he says, um, the fact of the flight undoubtedly shows that the theories underlying the projects are true. And um, there's an ideal, an almost linguistic idea, which is realized through, through work. And today, I want to go a bit into Kudrev's theory of labor, but less um, in a way which, I mean, Marxist readings, Heideggerian ingredients. This is a kind of view in which um, work in the lectures was seen primarily through the lens of the master and the slave. And um, I want to think in light of, of this idea of flying, I want to think today a bit more about um, a, a paradoxical function that work has in Kudrev's philosophy. So work both makes men human and simultaneously turns them into an animal. So there's a kind of um, idea that work unworks itself and also that the realized work makes itself invisible as work. So there are all these paradoxical things which I try to um, clarify a little bit of, um, today. Um, so I would like to start off with um, the book review we already um, heard about from Dimitri. So this book review dedicated to Ramon Quenot and also um, a review which really sp sparked a huge controversy between Bataille and Kozhev, one which we can already date back to the 1937 letter, and um, which goes on in the 50s, which I will briefly um, mention today, um, before I then move on to um, the conceptions of work and unwork in uh, the Sophia manuscript, which Frombert, of course, will elaborate on later. 
and um, let us first take a look at this book review. So we have a figure which we already encountered in Joyce, which is um, the lazy schema, and the equivalent that we find in um, Cuno is the voyou désœuvré. And in a way, this voyou désœuvré is also a figure which we already find in Marx, this idea of the lazy rascals spending their substance and more in riotous living. And then there's the hardworking elite, um, the studious hardworking elite. And um, in Quenot's uh, novels, Pierrot Mon Ami, Loin de Ruyer, and uh, Le Dimanche de la Vie, we have these uh, figures um, of uh, the Voyou, and he defines, so Kudev in his review speaks about the disinterested proletarian of aristocratic appearance and tastes, the poet who succeeds by publishing nothing, and the anti militarist professional soldier. And these are the, the lazy rascals or the Voyou who embody a wisdom that is easily accessible to all. And um, of course, these men don't work. They, they don't have anything really left to do. And um, they also know that there's nothing left to do. And, and, and there's something about this accessibility which um, makes the post-historical man or makes a sage a sage and also differentiate him from the philosopher. And we'll see in a, in a bit um, how could I thinks about that. Um, obviously, the review responds to an essay Kuno himself wrote, which is called Philosophe et Voyou, and it was published in January 1951 in Sartre's Le Temps Moderne. And it's a very interesting, quite difficult to make sense of, of the essay. And it's, um, it's a world in which, so Kuno opens with Socrates, who, um, as Plato reports claim to not do much else but walk around everywhere. And then Kuno says this uh, voyou is etymologically close to voir, to see, which is interesting. We already had um, Dimitri mentioning this idea of the sage who, don't, who, who doesn't see, but also to voir the, the way or the road. So there are all these shared semantic ground with the flaneur, uh, the voyeur, and we can think of Benjamin, who speaks about the dandy walking the turtles. Who, so there's all this, um, all these ideas around Kuno, uh, Kuno's And um, the most unforgettable of these Wayu, I mean, we have the poet who refrains from publishing, contemplating on the potentialities of his work. But the most interesting is um, the, the demobilized soldier, Bru, which we also encountered already. And the question is, what does a soldier do when there's no war to fight, and why is he still a soldier? What, what makes Bruce still, still a soldier if he, he, if he does not um, fight? And Jeff writes, if the outcome of a war is known, a man with peaceful tendencies could at least not take part in them, especially after having tried them out, if only in a military um, depot. Instead of transforming nature through work, Bruce talks about everything and anything and nothing. And um, he lives properly without having to take refuge in hermitages or subject his body to other treatments of the same kind, as heroic as they are boring. And so we know that Bru, he marries a much older woman, and then he becomes a successful fortune teller. And there are all these beautiful scenes also where he spends his days observing a clock, trying to observe the passing, capture the passing of time. He always misses these moments. And um, there's one one section in the um, in Kuno's book in which he in which Bru com compares the state of subjectivity with a dreamless sleep in which nothing happens, and um, for him the past, the present, the future are one and the same. It's a circular swing that repeats itself, like the twinkling of an eye. And um, this quote, which we already encountered before, there's a, there's a kind of double um, attitude in Bru. So he's not unconcerned, but he's also untouchable. He's like a god. He's in the, he's in the middle of metaphysics. And um, when reading the review by Kudev, you really you, you have to ask yourself why Bru would be someone Bru, who has attained wisdom, because technically he doesn't know very much. And then Kudev also contends his knowledge can't be absolute because history has not been finished. At the same time, he has attained the state of um, complete um, 
godlike um, god -like knowledge. And um, what Kuzhev suggests is that the voyou, if not a sage, points to a new understanding of philosophy, one that is different from treating philosophy as intellectual work. Um, so again, from the review novels of wisdom, he asks, what is there in common between the lazy rascals and the studious life of philosophers who consider themselves intellectual workers, who organize in trade unions, and maybe after some studious years waiting for wisdom, maybe they achieve it. And what Kudev says is, in, in this new world, there's a new philosophy this is, which is not born from study or work, but which is born from the study of désœuvrement, which the voyou embodies. And um, for him, this wisdom without work, or the wisdom out of work, is the hallmark of post-historical life. And it's désœuvrement as a concept is notoriously difficult to translate. It can mean the nothing left to do, the idleness, the unemployment, unworking. What we've seen, what we saw in Joyce, this, this idea of the go to, the not at work. Um, and uh, it's also what Agamben in various texts has called uh, inoperosita, which in English can be translated as inoperativity, which I ch chose, or also inactivity. So there's a different semantic spectrum which Agamben opened up, which I want to evaluate a little bit more. So there's this idea of being without work at the end of history. And um, we have, um, from Agamben, we have uh, this elucidation of désœuvrement as a kind of um, exploration of potentiality rather than actuality. And actuality also in the Hegelian sense of Wirklichkeit. And he points to a kind of um, dynamic aspect of this out of work and this being unemployed. And um, of course, traces it back to this review. We, we just had a look up um, by Kuno. And he says it, it is a generic mode of pot potentiality that is not exhausted. And I think this is quite an important point. And I think it's also interesting. We looked at the project before and this idea of the airplane or the flying as this big project metaphor in Kuzhev to make wings work, where nature and language can come together quite beautifully. And um, what I argue is that there's more at stake for Kuzhev than, than just trying to capture this pot potentiality. But what I think is there's also uh, an attempt to create a new conception of humanism, one that is not human, a kind of, um, a kind of human inactivity that this is more than just a return to animal nature. And we will see in a bit in the, in the Sophia manuscript how we could conceptualize this kind of new philosophy of work. And um, of course, these questions also touch on Kudev's occupation with the possibilities and limitations of discourse or of human discourse or philosophical discourse. So we have this moment of closure and this idea of what, what is left to be said, what has to be said, and what can still be expressed, similar to the question of post-work. There's still an activity, Kudev suggests, which has to be done. And he tries to identify it. And of course, we also, like Joyce, he could not speak with pride. Why is he not writing? There's this whole idea of writing about not writing, speaking about not speaking, which is really a modernist discourse, which um, Kuzhev, um engages in. And it's also something Karl has written about, this idea of um, the broken circularity of this like fragmentary work. So there's this attempt at closure, this attempt at, to finish the work and then ending up with a work which is continuously in progress, which really is Kuzhev's body of work. Um, the final point about this Kuno review, and then I want to move on, um, is this idea of the final work or the last works, which I think is quite an interesting, complex notion, because on the one hand, he states there is this last works which, which can be finished, which has to be finished. On the other hand, there, there's an eternal deferral on yeah, on, on even, or the suggestion that there's even an impossibility that these last works are ever reached. And um, he compares it with the, so a building which is finished is revealed, but still hidden by, by the scaffolding. And there's also a play with perspective here, which I think sheds an interesting light on the end of history. So there's a view from the inside, 
where we think, okay, history is complete, it's closed. But then he says there's a view from the outside, which is offered by the Vayu, who's roaming around the streets. And there's a different kind of um, perspective on this closure because the Vayu still needs to get somewhere. There's still a kind of activity going on. And um, this is basically the note on which the review ends with the study of the scaffolding, and there's no going beyond the scaffolding to see the complete, perfect, finished building. And of course, this um, review was sharply criticized, and especially Bataille wrote an outrage letter, which I think you're aware of, April 1952, in which he derides this whole vision as completely, entirely unimportant, and he writes, at the end, Bataille writes, only the moment L'instant matters. And this moment is the subject's only possible accomplishment. It's annihilation as consciousness. And um, the first, like I already mentioned, the origin of their debate is, of course, in the Hegel lectures and these first conceptions of post history and animality. And because uh, essentially paradoxical conception of what is human and how does human being continue to exist after history. So on the one hand, only men can work and stop working, he says, so only men can be bored. On the other, man properly, so-called, has disappeared, maintaining himself as animal. So this is the, from the footnote. So men who stop working falls into decay. And if we don't work like a thing, like an animal, like an angel, we stop acting, negating, and therefore creating ourselves as human. So we become bored. But if we are bored because we do not work, and only men can be bored, how can we then simultaneously be human and animal, or even an animal of the species, Homo sapiens? And um, there's also an interesting paradox that what he suggests is through work, we transform ourselves. So we make ourselves lazy. We reach the states of laziness through the very work. And the animal, um, he says, quotation, is never lazy, for if it were, it would die of hunger. So only men can be lazy, but not once he's out of work, but also once he's at work. So there's, because precisely work is, which doesn't correspond to anything animalistic. So boredom and work also, in a way, um, are intricately connected in, in, in these um, texts around Hegel. So there's an idea that work, um, in itself is paradoxical and um, it makes men human, it dehumanizes men. Without, man, without work, men's out of work. This is outside of humanity. At the same time, at work, he is also outside of work or out, out of work. And I think this confusion of, uh, of the notion of work is also what, what um, puzzled Kudev himself enough to append these two footnotes because there is a kind of um, there's a, a kind of shift in perspective on work from the, the main text to the first footnote to the second appendix. So there's an idea, which he later added, that even this very idea of happiness or enjoyment has to be um, amended because we can't say that it makes men happy properly, so-called. And so with human work, disappears language, and um, men's post-historical discourse will resemble, will, uh, resemble the language of these. However, these post-historical men who are out of work are not quite animals. Their language is something else than the language of these. And this is when he appends the, the footnote after the trip to Japan. So rather, these post-historical men resemble Japanese aristocrats who do not work for a living but are anything but animal. So Japanese snobbery is what negates the animal and is yet free from action of force work. So the tea ceremony is not work, but it is also not something that frogs or spiders would do. It's a, it's a kind of activity which is different from, from both. And it's a, it's a kind of work that is emptied of content, that is a pure formalized work. And the only work left after history is that detaching form from content. And we spoke about Bataille already. I just briefly um, go into another letter, which goes back to this idea of the impossibility of um, capturing this unworking work in language. So 
but I criticized Kudev for this letter, uh, for this um, conception, the 1933 letter, uh, 1937 letter. It says, if no other work is left to do, the last refu refuge is to create an artwork. So the artwork is this kind of um, last work. And um, briefly after, he publishes Inner Experience. And there's an interesting letter from Kudev to Bataille from July 1942, um, where Kozhev, in the spirit of these discourses on work, um, responds to Bataille's book, and he calls it mystical. He says, Bataille strives to verbally express silence, to speak of the ineffable, revealed by the discourse that obscures it. And at some point he says, succeeding to express silence means saying nothing. Why do you write? Can we communicate by communicating nothing? And then the letter turns towards um, a discussion of Marx, Lenin, Stalin as a kind of counter project to um, Bataille's um, mystic book, L'Experience Anterior. And he basically um, encourages Bataille to join the struggle of Marx, Lenin, Stalin. Um, and Hegel still believed himself to be the handle of a shovel. Stalin, however, he knows quite well what he has to do. So there's a kind of progression from potentiality towards this pure actuality. And um, he, he says, when action is complete, it exhausts potentiality. It is without power. And um, if we are no longer becoming as being, time is the concept and that's the truth. And um, the, the attempt in this letter to me is to close the circle of, um, of, the, of this potentiality and actually introducing a new understanding of activity. And this continues um, into the third and last part of what I want to talk about today, which is, for me, this letter is really written um, in the spirit of, or we can't read it other than in the spirit of the Sophia manuscript, which was written the year before. And it's interesting, if we look at the manuscript, um, it's a kind of transitional bridge between these discourses around um, inactivity and animality in the Hegel lectures and the late review. That, you know, there's a kind of interesting bridge in the Sophia. And it's also his most comprehensive theory of work, which we find in there. So it's really quite a unique um, text. And in the manuscript, work is the only place where truth is produced. So the origin of truth lies in the conscious sasnatini proletarian, one who knows his true interests. And the one example which he gives is um, the worker who, um, if you ask him why he bought, say, a bottle of vodka, he can only answer because I wanted to. That's the unconscious proletarian. The conscious worker, on the other hand, does not only live like animals and plants, but also speaks about his life. So he works consciously. And there's an interesting um, concept around this conscious worker. So the worker strives for perfection. He knows his imperfection. And yet he believes that his imperfect knowledge is the only way to achieve perfect knowledge. And it's a kind of conception which then is mirrored also in the idea of work, that there's an in the last works can't be finished. At the same time, there's almost a, a strive to finish them just because we know that we, we are imperfect or incapable in uh, completing them. And um, like in the letter to Bataille, Kuzhev also writes about the philosopher who has to take part in the work of creating um, communism. And um, I want to point out uh, one more thing about this um, idea of the conscious worker before I look in more depth um, at conceptions of unwork and animality in the manuscript. So um, there's an interesting subject, communist subject, which Kuzhev develops in the idea of the conscious worker. It's not a Cartesian self, it's not a thinking being detached from its material conditions, but the self-conscious worker lives in the world and is connected to it in the most, most earthly way. So his consciousness is connected to his worldly being. And his thinking and work change the face of the world in which he exists. So it's a dynamic conception of a working subject um, which can think and work, whereas 
a thinking being um, in the Cartesian sense can only can clearly not work. And there's really this idea of man torn between this situatedness or this earth boundedness and the ability to learn how to fly or to transform the world through work. And um, this conscious worker, which produces herself, but also it's a kind of negative activity which produces a split within herself. And there's this conception about the subject, um, we can describe it as a kind of self alienation or kind of um, necessary dismemberment. But there's this idea that the, the, the worker or the, the communist subject um, is on the one hand um, realizing herself through the work. On the other hand, there's a kind of um, split or alienation from, from her own work, which um, makes, makes the conscious worker both self-identical and out and out other. So there's this other of herself, which is the work. On the other hand, um, the work itself is, is also, there's an exteriority to the work, which continues, we spoke about this on the, continues into a new conception of language, which Pujat develops. There's an idea of a language which is produced outside of um, the speaker, which he calls work. And um, there's, there's an interesting idea of, there's no outside of work at the same time. There's a, um, at the same time, there's this idea of self-possession of the worker of work. Um, and I want to go into one more, one more quote which is the idea of um, the inoperative man. And um, it's something which I already mentioned in the Hegel lecture. So man is not animal. There's something more or more complex about this idea of um, animality. So in the, here, Kujaf writes, if only man who works as human is the, why are you an animal? And he, he calls the unemployed worker not a kind of um, like animal of the species, homo sapiens, but a subject that is already created, Ujo Sostani, instead of self-creating. And um, he writes, he does not differ it's essentially from the animal. He is, however, much more complex, but his world of cities and machines to the already existing one is not fundamentally different from the world of ants and bees, for example. Once man stops working, he can stay alive as an animal, but he disappears or dies as man in the proper sense of the word without and outside of the effort of work, outside and without the struggle with nature. Nature is stronger than man, it kills him as such, and eliminates, in this way, the real present, the Sutsjir, in it of non-existence or death, which significantly changes its own being and existence. And, um, of course, what we have here is like a kind of early version of what, what is later appended to the Hegel lectures as the footnote. And it's an early version, but I think it's also an interesting um, variant to to what we have um, as later in the footnote. So there's an idea of man, post-historical man being a more complex being than just returning to some kind of animal nature. And um, he he writes there's an the difference between human and um, animal is something else which is not specified, it, it's called the ethical something that is weightless. And it's like the aesthetic something of a painting. And um, it's a kind of, he calls it a dialectical thing, or kind of something which is nothing, which creates this, this difference between um, the unworking man and the animal. And in that sense, men, it's not only an animal, but also something entirely, totally other than an animal. And I want to um, conclude with one more, um, one more quote from the Sophia, where we have another idea of the relation between man and animal. And he writes, man is a non-animal, only insofar as he's an anti-animal. So there's a kind of negation. Um, which is not just an um, alterity or difference, but almost a kind of um, annihilation of animal nature within man, which we saw also why the airplane is such an interesting metaphor, because there's a kind of 
return to animal um, features by transcending um, nature or by destroying nature. And here he even writes, um, being non-animal, he is always therefore an anti-animal. However, being aware of himself as a man, as opposed to himself as an animal, man tends to forget or ignore animal bases and the presence of animal elements in his human existence. So through work, man forgets his animality. And I think it's an interesting idea of um, forgetting as it almost kind of, it's not a negating action. It's not the kind of action we encounter in the, in the lectures or in other texts. It's, it's a kind of almost passive mode of, um, of negation, which I find very interesting. Maybe we speak about it. Okay. And um, this, and then he writes in this anti-animal, which is men after history, unworking men, we encounter again that weightless something of which we've already spoken, which performs what quotation, what we call dialectics. And um, this something is not work and is, it's also not language, but what makes us human, Jeff writes in this section, is located outside of us. It is the other of our work. And it's a kind of displacement um, or a kind of unworking or out being being outside of, of um, this negating action. And um, if work is the language of reality, then the language of bees at the end of history is a kind of discourse which is outside of itself. And this discourse, which is um, the out of work, which is still operating, does not start at the beginning, he writes, but it starts um, at the end. So the point at which um, man has disappeared but there's still a kind of um, of discourse, which is more than the language of bees. It's something else. And um, there's another beautiful thing which I've writes about, um, about this idea of, of the animal. So he says, he says, animals pass through open doors as light and wind. Human beings, on the other hand, they stop on the threshold if they read the sign entry strictly forbidden. So man lives at this threshold of, of language and animal exists in this open, open space like light and wind. And um, at the threshold of being, man is nothing outside his animal body. And at the end, man disappears just as a painting that has been burned in the fire. And uh, yeah, I will stop here. And I'm, this was a bit messy, but I'm really looking forward to just receiving questions and discussing about these complex ideas. Thank you, Lisa, for your lecture, uh, full of interesting insight. Uh, and uh, Rambert? I, I invite Rambert Nicola. The lecture of Lambert, Rambert Nicola, uh, the, the, the title is La Sophia con défense de l'URSS et conscience de Staline. Et bon, je, 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 vous, je, je vous récorde qu'il Rambert est l'éditeur de, de, de manuscrits russe Sophia. Et, je me montre, je, je, je prends. Je sais. Oui. Merci pour l'invitation. Merci Marco. Merci pour l'organisation. Et effectivement, je vais vous parler du manuscrit qu'on connaît sous le nom de Sophia. Alors, c'est un manuscrit qui fait à peu près 3 millions de signes, soit 1600 pages. Et il sera donc difficile de le résumer en quelques, en quelques phrases. Donc, j'ai décidé de prendre un certain angle d'attaque. Et cet angle, c'est d'inscrire ce manuscrit dans la tradition philosophique russe et de montrer euh, en quel sens Kojev reprend une tradition philosophique et s'inscrit également dans la vie intellectuelle de son pays. On a pu comparer la critique de la raison pure de Kant à une cathédrale et je crois que s'il fallait trouver une architecture, qui illustrerait le livre de Kojève, ce serait au palais des soviets. 
Alors, c'est quoi exactement le palais des soviets Quel est le symbole de ce bâtiment Au cours du premier congrès tenu au théâtre Bolshoi, Sergei Kirov lance l'idée de la construction de ce palais. Et vraiment, j'insiste, derrière ce projet politique et architectural se cache l'expression culturelle de tout un empire à un moment donné de son histoire. Et je crois aussi qu'il faut lire derrière ce discours donc de Sergei Kirov qui lance la construction de cet édifice, il faut lire aussi d'une certaine façon la matrice du futur projet philosophique de Kojem. Je lis le discours de Sergei Kirov. Citoyens, je pense qu'il sera bientôt nécessaire pour nos parlements, pour nos assemblées exceptionnelles, de disposer d'une salle plus grande, plus vaste que celle-ci. Je pense que nous aurons bientôt le sentiment d'être à l'étroit, que les champs de l'international ne peuvent plus tenir sous cette coupole. On parle beaucoup de nous. On dit de nous que nous balayons de la surface de la terre et à la vitesse de l'éclair les palais des banquiers, des propriétaires et des tsars. C'est vrai. Construisons à leur place un nouveau palais des ouvriers et des paysans travailleurs. Rassemblons tout ce dont les pays soviétiques sont riches. Mettons toute notre créativité ouvrière et paysanne dans ce monument et montrons à nos amis et à nos ennemis que nous, les semi-asiatiques, nous qui sommes encore méprisés, sommes capables de rendre belle cette terre pécheresse grâce à des monuments dont nos ennemis ne pourront même jamais rêver. Fin de la citation. Dans ce discours, l'orgueil humain transpire presque à chaque phrase. Eux, les semi-asiatiques. Semi-asiatiques, c'est un terme intéressant qui pourrait renvoyer d'ailleurs à une des formules de Dostoïevski, Dostoïevski expliquant que les Russes, pour les Européens, sont des esclaves et chez les Asiatiques sont des maîtres. Donc, eux, les semi-asiatiques, c'est-à-dire les semi-esclaves, veulent faire irruption sur une scène de l'histoire jusqu'à présent, cadenassée par un Occident décadent, stagnant dans un capitalisme nationaliste, et n'ayant, au bout du compte, rien de mieux à proposer qu'une alternance de guerre de maîtres et d'individualisme de petits bourgeois. Ce n'est pas seulement que les semi-asiatiques, synthétisant Orient et Occident, esclaves et maîtres, veulent à leur tour avoir leur mot à dire, c'est surtout qu'ils aspirent à dire le dernier ou le fin mot de l'histoire. Ce mot nouveau, gros pourtant de toute la tragédie des maîtres et de toute l'espérance des esclaves, ce mot qui sauvera le monde, cette terre pécheresse, c'est-à-dire embellira ce monde en un discours monument, c'est-à-dire dans ce livre de Kojev, le livre de la Sophia. Il n'empêche qu'en 1922, Kojev et l'Empire soviétique sont encore loin d'avoir les moyens de leur ambition. Et avant de se lancer dans cette entreprise, il fallait déblayer leur propre terrain, lever un dernier obstacle ou une dernière inhibition, c'est-à-dire supprimer le maître sublimé régnant sans partage sur la conscience russe, Dieu et la religion. Pourquoi supprimer Dieu Pourquoi la religion parce que, et c'est une formule de Dostoïevski, c'est la même chose que le socialisme, mais sous une autre face, celle, d'après les soviétiques, pétris de pensée marxiste, de l'aliénation, autrement dit, telle que l'interprète Kojev, d'un report dans l'au-delà de la transcendance humaine, dernière digue empêchant l'homme d'intégrer et partant de réaliser son rêve de divinité. Il est clair répétera Kojève à la fin de sa vie, que vous ne pouvez accéder à la sagesse que si vous pouvez croire à votre divinité. Or, les gens saints d'esprit sont très rares. Devant l'audace de la formule, et saint d'esprit celui qui affirme être divin, on reste un peu comme stupéfait. On oublie, cependant, que pour la soutenir, il aura fallu à son auteur et au peuple russe de s'engager sur un terrain criminel, 
celui de la lutte contre Dieu, et par une longue lutte sanglante, s'émanciper de la tutelle religieuse. Car ce que Kojève présente à son auditoire français comme un programme somme toute théorique, revêtait en Russie, à la même époque, un tour autrement plus sinistre. Je cite Kojève, « Supprimer l'insuffisance de l'idéologie chrétienne, se libérer du maître absolu et de l'au-delà, réaliser la liberté et vivre dans le monde en être humain, autonome et libre, tout ceci n'est possible qu'à condition d'accepter l'idée de la mort et par suite l'athéisme. » Mais en Russie, ces quelques lignes signifient également « lutte à mort » non pas seulement d'ailleurs contre un régime déjà ancien, mais avec la propre identité de la Russie en train de rendre l'âme. Jusqu'à présent, on s'est comme quasiment exclusivement concentré sur l'influence de Hegel. Kojev lui était-il fidèle Jusqu'à quel point déforme-t-il la pensée du maître L'a-t-il même seulement compris On ne veut pas voir que derrière son... ou on oublie de voir que derrière son séminaire sur la philosophie religieuse de Hegel, se tenait un an avant cela un autre séminaire, à savoir un séminaire sur la philosophie religieuse russe, la, lesquelles, laquelle, lequel séminaire pardon, s'appuyait à son tour sur d'autres recherches consacrées depuis presque dix ans à la philosophie religieuse de Soloviev. Le tout d'ailleurs sur fond d'exil, de révolution et de guerre civile, mais aussi d'interprétation russe de l'idéalisme allemand. Si bien qu'à la fin des années 20 et au début des années 30, la lutte avec Dieu devait d'abord revêtir pour Kojev la tournure d'un parricide. Et alors que l'URSS détruisait méthodiquement les monuments religieux, en reprenant, non sans perte ni fracas, marbre et autres matériaux pour ses constructions profanes, la première démarche du jeune docteur consistait, en miroir, à s'assimiler philo la philosophie de Vladimir Soloviev pour mieux supprimer le père de la philosophie religieuse russe. Pourquoi cette thèse critique, pourrait-on se demander, contre Soloviev, soutenue en 26, reprise dans plusieurs articles, et même remanié en français dans un livre encore inédit, la philosophie de Vladimir Soloviev, la philosophie religieuse de Vladimir Soloviev, écrit en 1932, qui est autre chose que la métaphysique religieuse de, les de, de Vladimir Soloviev, les articles publiés euh, en français. Alors pourquoi Eh bien parce que c'est justement Soloviev qui est le fondateur de la philosophie religieuse russe, soit aux yeux de Kojev d'une contradiction à résoudre, et parce que Soloviev est, entre autres, celui qui a pensé de la façon la plus systématique la divino-humanité, le dieu-homme, soit pour Kojev un concept à renverser, au sens le plus littéral du terme, à inverser en homme-dieu. Que Soloviev soit le plus éminent penseur religieux, Kojev l'expliquera sans embâge, lors de son séminaire de 32-33 à l'école pratique des hautes études. Je cite Kojev, « C'est tout de même Soloviev, explique-t-il à son public français, qui a su donner aux idées de la philosophie religieuse russe l'expression la plus complète et achevée, la plus systématique, et on peut même dire la plus philosophique. L'étude de sa philosophie est, je crois, indispensable pour la compréhension de la philosophie religieuse contemporaine. » Fin de citation. Mais cela n'épuise pas, après tout, complètement les raisons pour lesquelles, avant de se lancer dans son propre système athée du savoir, il lui fallait y consacrer à lui, Soloviev, et non pas à quelque autre penseur religieux comme Schelling, ses études. Dans le compte-rendu au livre de Stremukhov, Vladimir Soloviev et son œuvre messianique, Kojev esquisse une nouvelle piste, plus précise cette fois, et montre que l'étude de Soloviev révèle encore autre chose qu'une émancipation hors de la tutelle religieuse en général. Je cite Kojev, « Il n'y a pas de doute, en effet, que la philosophie religieuse russe du XXe siècle est dominée par la pensée de Soloviev. Et, en effet, et puisque cette philosophie 
a joué un rôle important dans la vie culturelle de la Russie pré-révolutionnaire, l'étude des idées de Soloviev n'est certainement pas dénuée d'intérêt. Fin de la citation. Quel est l'un de ces intérêts annoncés sous forme de litote C'est justement de comprendre les événements russes de 17. Étudier cette philosophie, c'est se donner en effet une clé d'interprétation pour mieux entrer dans la Russie révolutionnaire et post-révolutionnaire. On a coutume de lire la révolution russe uniquement sous le prisme des vainqueurs, qu'ils soient communistes ou plus tard ou ailleurs libéraux. On oublie étrangement quel est le fruit de toute l'intelligentsia russe, y compris de cette philosophie religieuse qui a dominé la vie culturelle russe et qui d'ailleurs, jusqu'à un certain point, imprègne encore ce pays. Kojev, quant à lui, ne peut pas se permettre cet oubli. Il sait que le discours soloviévien a pu servir d'antichambre à la révolution et ne serait-ce d'ailleurs qu'à travers sa conception de l'Empire, un des premiers qui pense philosophiquement l'Empire en Russie, c'est Soloviev, à l'URSS elle-même. Aussi, à travers ce penseur, il ne s'agissait rien de moins que d'analyser une idéologie, selon le vocabulaire cogévien, que l'épreuve révolutionnaire allait à la fois réaliser et épurer, autrement dit, au sens le plus fort du terme, vérifier. Je cite Kojève, « Si l'on soustrait de l'idéologie dans son ensemble tout ce qui existe déjà, alors il reste l'idée comme projet. Et si l'on soustrait de cette idée tout ce qui factuellement ne sera pas réalisé, alors ce qui en restera apparaîtra comme vrai. Par conséquent, la vérité n'est rien d'autre que l'idée réalisée dans le futur, incluse dans une idéologie, reflétant le présent. On peut donc dire qu'à la lettre, Kojève s'est pensé comme la vérité de cette idéologie chrétienne insuffisante, épaulée par une révolution qui en était le pendant pratique. Cette idéologie religieuse reflétait certes le temps pré-révolutionnaire, mais annonçait également de façon inconsciente le temps de Kojève, voire Kojève lui-même, une philosophie athée ou une sagesse athée, anthropothéiste, née de la révolution prolétarienne. Et si comprendre et justifier les événements de Moscou en 17 est certainement un des fils directeurs de la pensée kogévienne, il le dira d'ailleurs dans son livre encore euh, « Le temps, le concept et le discours », je cite Kojève, il est certes facile car pour lui, c'est une évidence. Il est certes facile de constater que du point de vue sociologique, mon livre équivaut à une tentative de justifier discursivement les événements qui ont commencé à se développer à Moscou en 1917. Facile. Et effectivement, quand on connaît la philosophie russe et qu'on la compare avec la philosophie de Kojève, on peut dire qu'il c'est assez facile de voir son héritage. Donc, je reprends. Si justifier les événements de Moscou est le, un des fils directeurs de la pensée kogévienne, s'insérant d'ailleurs du reste dans le sillon de tous les penseurs russes émigrés qui ont eux aussi pensé la révolution et comment la révolution éclatait, mais ceux donc en exil comme ceux qui sont restés euh, dans le pays. Alors, indubitablement, cette philosophie religieuse ayant je répète, jouer un rôle important dans la vie culturelle de la Russie pré-révolutionnaire a pu lui apparaître à lui, Kojève, comme une première étape indispensable pour pouvoir écrire sa future grande œuvre. Certes, Kojève, philosophe athée, aspirant peu à peu à devenir la conscience d'une URSS de plus en plus intransigeante, et dont le livre La Sophia est l'étape ultime, n'affirmera jamais clairement la dette qu'il entretient à l'égard de cette philosophie. Tout comme d'ailleurs, les révolutionnaires athées n'avoueront jamais le rôle du religieux dans leur révolution, attribuant leur succès à la seule pensée marxiste et étouffant toute trace de religion ou de philosophie religieuse dans le pays. Ce qui est d'ailleurs un symptôme de l'importance de cette philosophie religieuse. L'acharnement avec lequel les Russes, les Soviétiques, ont détruit 
toute trace de philosophie religieuse, on brûlait les livres, on interdit les livres, on cachait les livres, etc. etc. Je je n'en parlerai pas davantage. Elle transparaît clairement, donc, cette philosophie religieuse dans cette œuvre, la Sophia, la Sophia en plus, non clairement euh, soloviévien, dans cette œuvre, donc, la Sophia, qu'il présente comme sa, son autobiographie intellectuelle. Ainsi, si la révolution est l'épreuve politique de la philosophie idéologique et pré-révolutionnaire de Soloviev, Kojev, en bon hegelien, censé être, sur le plan théorique, Lao Febung, soit une étape supérieure conservant et niant l'étape religieuse précédente, laquelle d'ailleurs n'est rendue possible qu'après les événements de 17. Quant à l'intérêt pour la révolution russe, Kojève ne la comprend pas comme le simple chauvinisme d'un russe blanc en exil, il s'agit pour lui d'une attention pour un événement ayant une amplitude mondiale, le seul du reste qui ait fait un peu avancer l'histoire. Partant pour le jeune Alexandre Vladimirovitch Kojevnikov, toute philosophie, je cite Kojev, pourvu qu'elle veuille préparer et contribuer à la construction d'une nouvelle culture, devra avant tout, j'insiste, je cite Kojève et j'insiste, prêter une oreille attentive à tout ce qui se passe en Russie. Et dès lors, si cette philosophie authentique ne veut pas dépérir, elle devra se mettre, comme on a coutume de le dire de nos jours, au diapason de son époque. Fermé, fin de la citation. C'est-à-dire embrasser la révolution et ce qui l'a conditionné, la culture philosophique religieuse russe. Mais avant de contribuer à la création de cette nouvelle culture, véritable programme que ce livre de 41 tente d'exécuter, il faut reconnaître qu'il en est en 1926 à l'étape de la destruction. Et c'est à détruire l'icône de la philosophie russe qu'il dépense ses premières forces, non pas uniquement pour la faire voler en éclats, mais dans un pur esprit de destruction, mais pour avoir à bâtir dessus, dans un esprit de création. Car si Kojev est le fils de son temps, ambitionnant de se mettre au diapason de son époque, il se sait aussi être le fils de son peuple. Je cite Kojev, « La vie d'un homme paraît trop courte pour qu'en commençant réellement à zéro, il puisse créer quoi que ce soit qui serait digne d'intérêt » non seulement pour lui-même, mais pour ses contemporains. Tout change. En revanche, si sous le sujet philosophant, d'ailleurs le sujet philosophant c'est aussi une expression de Soloviev, mais je laisse ça de côté, si sous le sujet philosophant, nous ne subsumons pas seulement la personne concrète, mais le peuple entier. Les peuples, de façon très générale, ne sont pas pressés. Mais un peuple entièrement privé de tradition philosophique, a davantage de chances d'élaborer une conception du monde radicalement nouvelle et authentiquement philosophique qu'un peuple vivant dans un monde déjà entièrement constitué idéologiquement. Fin de la citation. Ce peuple qu'on aura privé, voire sevré de sa philosophie précédente, dans une destruction radicale, sera le peuple soviétique. Et Kojev, se donne la tâche d'en être le penseur. Et le texte de la Sophia, c'est être le penseur de l'Union soviétique, une fois que celle-ci a pratiqué une Aofébung sur la philosophie religieuse qui l'a précédée. On ne se débarrasse pas pourtant, sans lutte ni violence, de toute cette philosophie religieuse. Aussi, avant de projeter la construction du palais des soviets, ou l'écriture de cet ouvrage, il fallait passer par bien des étapes négatives. Une date retient notre attention sur ce chemin conduisant à ces deux contributions de la nouvelle culture, le palais des soviets et le livre de Kojève. En 1931, comme un fait exprès, au moment où à Paris, Kojève achève ses réflexions sur l'athéisme, réglant ainsi son compte à Dieu, à Moscou, en parallèle, on dynamite l'église du Christ sauveur. C'est qu'il faut faire place nette pour édifier au-dessus de ces ruines religieuses la future tour de Babel, ce temple que Lénine, en véritable homme-dieu, devait dominer 
là où se tenait auparavant le Dieu homme. Il est parfois des symboles dont on s'étonne de leur si parfaite exactitude. Car rasé, le Christ sauveur, la cathédrale de Moscou, c'était détruire quoi au juste Et qu'est-ce que cela dit au fond de la sagesse qu'Ogevienne s'édifiant dessus Certes, pourrait-on dire, c'était là lutter contre la religion, ou encore, pour citer Kogev, supprimer l'insuffisance de l'idéologie chrétienne voir chasser le maître absolu de ses terres. Mais se contenter de cela, c'est dire encore bien peu. Aussi, la cathédrale du Christ sauveur représente-t-elle quelque chose de plus précis que l'on ne peut comprendre qu'en revenant au temps de sa construction Les tsars, par cet imposant édifice, voulaient commémorer la victoire de leurs troupes sur Napoléon, sur cet antéchrist venant couronner une révolution française qui avait ébranlé dans une fureur destructrice l'ordre aristocratique de la vieille Europe. Or, après la révolution russe, était-il encore temps de commémorer la victoire sur le grand homme de la révolution française Sur celui qui, comme l'a interprété Kogev, anticipait la réalisation de l'empire universel et homogène Sur celui qui, comme l'a écrit Tolstoï, a dominé la révolution et qui, en étouffant ses abus, en a conservé ce qu'elle avait de bon. En un mot, sur celui qui, tel que le comprend Kojev dans la Sofia, préludait Staline. Mettre à bas la cathédrale, c'était donc effacer l'obstacle que les Russes eux-mêmes avaient dressé sur le chemin de l'édification d'une société mondiale sans classe que l'empereur aurait dû, par impossible, réalisé. De façon souterraine, se jouait encore davantage. À quoi les troupes tsaristes attribuaient-elles leur victoire Au Christ sauveur, en personne. Il fallait bien l'intervention de Dieu, d'une force transcendante, pour tout à la fois rabattre l'oubris humaine et conserver l'ordre donné de toute éternité. Or, cela signifiait également le Christ sauveur, que l'homme ne pouvait pas de lui-même se satisfaire, qu'il ne pouvait pas par lui-même créer son empire universel ou sa tour de Babel, sans l'aval de Dieu. La cathédrale était le symbole de cette aliénation détestée de Kogev, de cet ordre immuable que les puissants pensaient divin et éternel. Elle suggérait que, sur cette terre, l'homme, n'est que le second, parfois rebelle à ses propres dépens, de Dieu. Qui est le Christ sauveur, si ce n'est celui qui vient sauver les Russes, l'humanité et les Français eux-mêmes de leur propre démesure Mais voilà, jouer les seconds rôles au profit du Maître sublimé et attendre du Christ le salut, c'est ce qui n'est désormais, en rasant la cathédrale, plus possible, ni pour les soviétiques ni a fortiori pour leur conscience philosophique concrétisée en un homme, Kogev. Avec cette cathédrale, c'est donc bien, bel et bien la conscience religieuse qui est renversée, les valeurs de l'humanité proclamées et une certaine idée du bonheur rendue insatisfaisante. Je lis Kogev, le texte de la Sophia. « Par son travail et par sa lutte, l'homme prétend la conscience religieuse ne peut aller qu'en enfer. Seul, il ne fait que le mal. Sa béatitude n'est pas son mérite. C'est un don de Dieu. C'est le présent d'une grâce, offerte par un Seigneur infiniment miséricordieux, autrement dit offerte par un Maître, et encore, offerte uniquement à ceux qui ont renoncé à toute activité relevant de leur volonté. Ce bonheur ou cette béatitude, bonheur fondé sur une reconnaissance indue et qui n'est mérité par l'homme en raison et qui n'est pas mérité par l'homme en raison de sa volonté, c'est-à-dire en raison de son travail et de sa lutte, ce bonheur, dis-je, n'est pas une satisfaction authentique. Et c'est pourquoi l'homme n'est pas satisfait par ce rêve de béatitude paradisiaque, ni absolument parlant par le bonheur. L'homme n'est pas satisfait par le bonheur. Par conséquent, tout se passe comme si le peuple théophore, tel que se présentaient les Russes, et tel que présentait Dostoïevski par exemple, tel que présentaient les, euh, Dostoïevski les Russes, 
ne pouvait être, à bien y réfléchir, qu'un peuple déicide, ayant pris à son compte la responsabilité de la création dans une lutte à mort contre tous les maîtres, y compris le maître sublimé, lui permettant par là de retrouver son esprit, voire de l'accomplir. Ou dit autrement, sur les ruines de l'insuffisance idéologique du christianisme, le véritable motif de ce livre est bel et bien de poser les fondations philosophiques de cette nouvelle tour de la sagesse. Je cite Kogev, « L'homme-Dieu n'existe pas encore Et alors Qu'advienne désormais ce que l'homme osa rêver pour lui-même Qu'advienne pour lui ce qu'il ne s'avisait, il n'y a pas encore si longtemps, de n'attribuer qu'à Dieu Qu'advienne son rêve de sérénité satisfaite et de satisfaction sereine, celle du septième et dernier jour de la création, lorsqu'on peut dire, en jetant un regard sur tout ce qui a été fait, c'est bien. Mais contrairement à Dieu, nous pourrons l'affirmer sans être ensuite contraints de nous dédire et de maudire l'œuvre de nos mains. C'est pourquoi, dès à présent, si l'homme veut connaître quelque chose de la perfection réalisée, il n'a plus besoin de fixer les... des yeux les cieux. Il peut entendre l'avancée majestueuse de sa venue en appliquant au sol une oreille attentive. Seul un peuple insatisfait, avait dit Kogev, pouvait tendre à une philosophie nouvelle. Il faudrait ajouter que seul un peuple insatisfait du bonheur d'avoir été sauvé par Dieu pouvait anéantir le chef-d'œuvre, leur bijou, le bijou de Moscou, la cathédrale du Christ sauveur, symbole d'un ordre prétendument immuable ou miraculeusement toujours rétabli lorsque l'homme, contre son propre bonheur, le met en péril. Être insatisfait du bonheur donné par Dieu, quel sacrilège Les hommes, du moins les chrétiens, font justement commencer l'histoire du monde par ce sacrilège-là. Ils ne vont pas toutefois jusqu'à en assumer pleinement la, la paternité, préférant en accuser le diable. La pensée russe, à l'inverse, est celle de cette reconnaissance ou, si l'on préfère, la pensée d'un aveu. Il n'y avait pas de serpent sur qui reporter la désobéissance. Aussi, il y a un véritable tour de force, une radicalité rarement égalée de la part des Russes et de Kojève à leur tête, consistant à endosser la figure du démon. Je cite le père de la philosophie socialiste russe, Herzen, en 1863, qui a une formule assez frappante. « Nous, les Russes, nous ne sommes pas des médecins. Nous sommes le mal. Ce qui sortira de nos souffrances et de nos gémissements, nul ne le sait. Mais le mal s'est déclaré. Ce qui en est sorti, Kojev le sait, c'est la révolution, l'URSS et Staline. Mais sans se dissimuler le mal, sans même le conjurer ni le condamner, il va faire un pas supplémentaire, qui est le livre de la Sophia, re le revendiquer. Ce n'est plus un aveu, cela devient sous sa plume une fierté. En un certain sens, tel que lui-même l'interprète, il s'agissait de reprendre la philosophie là où Soloviev l'avait laissée. Lui, Kojev, ne reculera pas devant ce qui avait interdit le père de la philosophie religieuse russe, à savoir le problème du mal, mais d'un mal porté si haut qu'il en devenait le bien de l'homme, voire plus que le bien, sa fondation même. Soloviev, si on suit la pensée de Kojev, représentait la pointe de l'aliénation religieuse, voire le point de bascule d'une pensée comme quasiment déjà prête à se renverser dans l'athéisme, reflétant par là même la culture d'une Russie pré-révolutionnaire annonciatrice de tempête. Mais le philosophe moscovite, Soloviev, ne se résolvait pas à commettre un déicide. Ainsi, son dernier livre, tel que le comprend Kojev, parachevait son échec tout en ouvrant une voie nouvelle possible. Je lis euh, Kojev, donc dans ce livre inédit, Soloviev, écrit-il, finit par penser que le monde était essentiellement mauvais, mais il n'en tira pas la conclusion, en soi possible, 
que ce monde était une illusion. Il préfère abandonner le principe même de sa métaphysique moniste et reconnaître la réalité absolue du mal. D'ailleurs, un autre motif, surnom non moins fort, déterminait l'attitude de Soloviev. La métaphysique était avant tout une métaphysique de l'humanité. Et c'est l'importance énorme attribuée à l'homme qui en formait le trait le plus caractéristique et le plus personnel. Or, nier le progrès historique et continuer de croire au salut final de tous les êtres revient à priver l'homme du rôle que Soloviev lui a de tout temps attribué, sauvé par un acte libre et conscient soi-même et toutes les créatures. Même en acceptant les vues des trois entretiens sur l'histoire, on aurait pu certes affirmer que finalement tous les êtres seront sauvés par Dieu, mais alors l'homme ne serait qu'un acteur inconscient et subalterne, jouant une comédie divine dont le dénouement ne dépendrait nullement de lui. Mais Soloviev rejeta cette possibilité. En cessant de croire que l'homme sauvera le monde, il cessa de croire au salut universel. D'après les trois entretiens, l'histoire a un dénouement tragique. Mais l'homme conserve, ou peut-être reçoit ici pour la première fois chez Soloviev, sa liberté et son indépendance absolue vis-à-vis -vis de Dieu. Fin de la citation. Cependant, ce que révélait finalement le court récit sur l'antéchrist, récit surprenant qui sert de d'épilogue aux trois entretiens, c'est précisément le recul ou l'effroi ultime de Soloviev devant cette liberté et cette indépendance vis-à-vis -vis de Dieu. Et inversement, voilà ce que Kojève, achevant son livre sur ce dernier, et par la même occasion mettant un point final à sa relation avec les penseurs religieux russes, devait très précisément faire sien. Autrement dit, devant cette prise de conscience que l'homme est le mal, parce que sa liberté n'est pas un choix entre deux biens, mais la négation du plus grand des biens, c'est-à-dire la capacité de se nier soi-même, de nier autrui et à la fin de nier Dieu, Kojev, lui, ne fera pas de mitou, mais au contraire, emportera les couleurs, si j'ose dire, des couleurs rouge sang. Je lis le texte de la Sophia. L'homme s'engendre dans le meurtre, ou du moins dans une tentative d'assassinat. Il naît comme meurtrier, réel ou potentiel voire comme un meurtrier, et c'est le pire, un meurtrier insensé, que rien ne justifie du point de vue biologique. Cela ne signifie-t-il pas qu'au fond de l'homme se trouve le crime et que l'existence spécifiquement humaine est criminelle dans son essence Fin de la citation. Tout le livre de Kojev est, sans jamais le déplorer, ni se dédire, de répondre par l'affirmative. L'homme est criminel dans son essence, revendiquant ainsi ce devant quoi Soloviev avait plié, et laissant par là même à lui, Kojev, le champ libre pour bâtir sa nouvelle philosophie, à savoir l'enfantement diabolique de l'humanité dans l'affirmation d'une liberté insensée sur le plan biologique, c'est-à-dire dans le meurtre et l'asservissement de son prochain, ou encore d'une liberté impie sur le plan de la pensée, puisqu'elle va jusqu'à être volontairement, consciemment et définitivement, on pourrait même ajouter fièrement, théomac et déicide, soit une liberté de diable, une liberté des enfers. Je cite Soloviev à, euh, Kojève à propos de Soloviev, « En acceptant les idées du diable et de l'enfer, en transformant le pessimisme empirique en un pessimisme métaphysique, Soloviev ne pouvait évidemment plus conserver en entier son système moniste. Ainsi, il semblait bien que ce sont des considérations d'origine non théorique qui le, et, pratique, et donc pratique, qui menèrent finalement à l'abandon de, 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 de la métaphysique de sa jeunesse et au projet d'une refonte totale de son système. Si le projet d'une métaphysique nouvelle était né du pessimisme, cette métaphysique devait avant tout tenir compte de la nouvelle orientation que prenait Soloviev vis-à-vis du problème du mal. Mais c'est aussi tout ce que nous pouvons dire à ce sujet. Rien ne fait supposer qu'il ait effectivement élaboré son système nouveau, ou même seulement les grandes lignes de ce système. En tout cas, nous n'en savons rien. D'ailleurs, les difficultés qu'éprouvait Soloviev ne nous étonnent guère. 
il s'agissait de construire une philosophie toute nouvelle, c'est-à-dire de dire des choses qui se distingueraient radicalement de tout ce qu'il avait dit auparavant. Et peut-être s'agissait-il de penser tout autrement que ne l'ont fait Schelling et les idéalistes allemands. Il se peut que le système projeté serait devenu une œuvre vraiment personnelle et originale. Mais Soloviev est mort avant d'avoir pu réaliser son projet. Fin de la citation. En esquissant ici la future philosophie possible de son prédécesseur religieux, c'était en dernière instance la sienne propre que Kojev mettait en branle, relevant comme autant de tâches ce que l'échec de la philosophie soloviévienne, c'est-à-dire de la philosophie religieuse russe en général, lui avait légué. Et chaque lecteur de Kojev y reconnaîtra sans conteste les chantiers de son propre système élaborer une ontologie dualiste, se libérer de Dieu, accepter l'idée d'un mal radical qu'en réalité l'homme incarne comme criminel devant l'ordre de ce qui est, donner à l'humanité l'unique rôle pour exécuter son salut à travers une histoire sanglante et accepter positivement comme telle, et enfin, en creux, penser tout autrement que ne l'ont fait les idéalistes allemands. Toutefois, ce n'est pas un hasard si ce dernier livre de Soloviev avait mis un terme à la carrière de ce dernier. C'est qu'il exigeait un effort qui s'apparentait à une violence trop grande pour l'esprit du penseur religieux. Il s'agissait en effet d'envisager le devenir de l'homme, non pas sous la figure du Dieu-homme, de la divino-humanité, mais de l'homme-démon, de l'antéchrist d'un antéchrist du reste si proche de Soloviev qu'on avait pu le démasquer lui-même sous les traits physiques et spirituels qu'il avait prêtés à son sinistre personnage. Dès lors, en reprenant le flambeau que la mort de Soloviev avait éteint, Kojev faisait preuve d'une indéniable brutalité à l'égard de la philosophie religieuse russe, d'une brutalité qui avait littéralement brisé de lassitude, c'est l'interprétation de Kojev, c'est-à-dire tuer son père fondateur, puisque d'après Kojev, et effectivement Soloviev meurt en écrivant son livre et en finissant donc le court récit sur l'antéchrist. Et sans nul doute, on trouve dans ce livre, donc la Sophia de Kojev, un projet qui ne peut pas ne pas être ressenti comme une forme de fureur pour tous les penseurs spiritualistes russes. Ce n'est pas tant sa tentative de justifier l'URSS qui déjà en soi devait faire grincer quelques dents, c'est précisément autre chose, au contour pour ainsi dire plus dostoïevskien. Quoi Décrire les bas-fonds spiri du spirituel. Ou plus exactement, les bas-fonds spirituels du spirituel. La façon dont Kojev congédie Marx et Freud dans la Sophia est à cet égard particulièrement révélatrice. Certes, Révéler les soubassements, certes, révéler les soubassements animaux de nos actions est intéressant, voire émancipateur, dit-il. Mais, même si, comme il le dira à la fin de sa vie, il n'y a dans l'homme qu'un pour cent d'humains et que le reste est, disons, animal, cela n'est pas l'essentiel. Aussi, décrire les bas-fonds spirituels du spirituel ne signifie en aucun cas se complaire, comme l'a fait le matérialisme vulgaire, dans la description des conditions matérielles de l'existence humaine, par exemple pour mieux en excuser la prétendue violence naturelle de l'homme, comme si la guerre, pour ne prendre qu'un phénomène parmi d'autres, était une affaire d'animaux. Il ne s'agit pas non plus de mettre au jour des infrastructures, c'est-à-dire des conditions économiques, psychologiques ou sociologiques, pour mieux, à l'inverse, diminuer la portée de tel ou tel comportement, si ce n'est héroïque, du moins socialement valorisé. Qui peut véritablement se dire ébranlé lorsqu'il apprend qu'en réalité, tel acte d'amour doit être reconduit sous tel rapport biochimique de phéromone, sous tel inconscient oedipien ou sous tel contexte socialement déterminant Il y a même, au contraire, quelque chose de rassurant là-dedans. L'enracinement d'un homme dans un ordre supérieur car derrière la biologie, il y a toujours plus ou moins la main du Créateur. D'ailleurs, un certain nombre de débats actuels auraient tendance à le montrer. Kojève nous oblige en dernière instance à un aveu beaucoup plus terrible. 
reconnaître que ce que l'on a coutume d'envisager, et parmi eux, les Russes, les spiritualistes russes, plus que les autres, ce que l'on a coutume d'envisager comme la meilleure part de l'homme, sa part spirituelle, ou, selon une formule de Schelling reprise par euh, Soloviev, l'homme en l'homme, se fonde non pas tant sur telle ou telle infrastructure toujours reconductible à l'instinct sexuel ou à l'instinct de nourriture, mais sur le crime par vanité, sur le désir d'une reconnaissance insensée et contre nature, mais parfaitement libre et conscientisée, voire président à la conscience de soi, à la prise de conscience de soi. Il ne faut pas se contenter d'admettre que la plupart de nos comportements puissent avoir un soubassement déterminé par nos instincts animaux, reposant sur un ordre donné. Il faut être capable d'avouer que ce qui tranche avec eux, notre liberté, n'est pas seulement contre nature pour le meilleur, par respect pour on ne sait trop quelle loi, mais pour le pire, le risque insensé de la vie, le meurtre, où la fondation d'un monde à partir de la naissance d'une humanité se répartissant en maître et en esclave. Il faut être capable de se reconnaître par liberté, consciemment et définitivement criminel par vanité. Il faut encore faire de cette vanité consciente, de ce désir meurtrier de désir de reconnaissance, les fondements spirituels de notre vie la plus haute, notre monde humain et toute sa culture. L'homme naît dans le meurtre ou l'assujettissement de ses frères. Cela signifie que l'homme, tout homme, ne peut pas naître autrement que dans le crime ou à tout le moins la lutte sanglante en vue de la reconnaissance et que toute sa vie culturelle, toute sa vie spirituelle n'est que l'expression de cette première lutte sanglante. Dès lors, non seulement il n'y a pas à en demander pardon, mais c'est justement ce meurtre ou cette lutte qui fait la dignité de l'être humain. Ou encore ce qui fait que l'homme est fier, ce qui le place au-dessus des animaux et de la nature, c'est la lutte à mort contre nature pour le prestige, c'est la guerre, c'est l'asservissement, puis la révolte, et à la fin des temps, le sacrilège, se prétendre Dieu contre Dieu. On peut donc dire que le livre de Kojev endosse et revendique la part maudite de l'homme, sa part de démon non pas pour la congédier, mais pour la sublimer. En dernière instance, ce qu'affirme ce texte, c'est que la vérité est du côté de l'erreur, du côté des parricides, du côté des criminels, du côté des fous, ou, en un mot, synthétisant ses belles qualités, du côté des démons. Ce n'est pas, dans cette conférence, le lieu de montrer comment le méfait se transforme en bienfait, comment le crime se mue en vertu. Le livre entier de Kojève est destiné à cela. Il convient plutôt de montrer que ce retournement dialectique est rendu possible ou en tout cas rendu plus évident par un certain concept de vérité tout à fait russe, la Pravda. Soloviev avait écrit un livre majeur au titre très curieux, « La justification du bien ». On avait déjà là en germe ce qui devait croître de façon effrayante avec son successeur. Car a-t-on besoin de justifier le bien n'est-ce pas d'ordinaire le mal que l'on justifie Pour mieux laver, d'ailleurs, la responsabilité de Dieu, le mal n'étant qu'un phénomène transitoire indispensable dans l'économie de l'ordre divin. Pour comprendre ce titre de Soloviev, la justification du bien, il faut repasser par la construction en russe du mot « justification ».« O »« pravda »« nie », ce qui signifie littéralement « rendre vrai » et donc « rendre vrai le bien ». Pravda n'est pas istina, l'autre mot pour désigner la vérité en russe. La pravda n'est pas une adéquation valant de toute éternité, il s'agit au contraire d'une création que l'on doit faire advenir. La vérité n'est pas de ce monde, disent les religieux. Et Soloviev a voulu relever le défi et en faire son combat. Incarner la vérité qui n'est pas de ce monde dans ce monde, faire advenir à la fin des temps la vérité ou encore la réaliser comme bien. Et l'on voit d'ailleurs tout ce que l'interprétation cogévienne de Hegel peut avoir euh, avec ces six lettres, pravda. Mais si la vérité n'est pas déjà là, et si c'est l'homme qui a à la réaliser, 
Et si enfin, avec Kojev, on s'est débarrassé d'un arrière-monde divin toujours à venir et aliénant notre propre créativité Alors, la vérité est par définition, sur le plan théorique, du côté de l'erreur et sur le plan pratique, du côté du crime. Je cite Kojev, « On pourrait définir l'homme comme une erreur. » C'est la définition qui donne de l'homme. « On pourrait définir l'homme comme une erreur qui se maintient dans l'existence, qui dure dans la réalité. » Or, puisque erreur signifie désaccord avec le réel, puisqu'est faux ce qui est autre que ce qui est, on peut dire aussi que l'homme qui se trompe est un néant qui néantit dans l'être ou un idéal qui est présent dans le réel. L'homme est seul à pouvoir se tromper sans devoir pour cela disparaître. Il peut vivre son erreur ou dans l'erreur. Et l'erreur ou le faux qui ne sont rien en eux-mêmes deviennent réels en lui. L'homme peut transformer en vérité sa propre erreur. En 1937, et je finirai là-dessus, dans une lettre au père Fessard, Kojève se sentait tenu d'expliquer pourquoi il ne voulait ou ne pouvait rien publier. « Il y a deux raisons à cela, expliquait-il. La première est la suivante. L'erreur ne s'est pas encore transformée en vérité. L'URSS athée n'a pas encore achevé l'histoire et n'a pas confirmé sa pensée. La seconde, parce que vivant en France, il est isolé de ce qui abreuve vraiment sa conscience. Il est détaché de ce mouvement qui justifie le bien, qui réalise la vérité, un mouvement russe. Je cite Kojev. « Par l'examen de votre conscience, vous, Père Fessard, vous rejoignez l'Église catholique, et la publication de votre livre prouve que c'est aussi l'Église qui s'exprime par vous. Votre lecteur a donc affaire à une conscience collective à une force collective, à une force historique consciente d'elle-même. Ainsi, le fait même de la publication enlève à votre livre tout élément d'indécence et de prétention qu'implique nécessairement un examen de conscience strictement personnel. Or, dans mon cas, il ne peut être question de perfection artistique. Et malheureusement, ce n'est pas encore des vérités, mais des simples examens de conscience que je peux communiquer. Dans mon cas, la publication serait injustifiée. Elle aurait pu être justifiée. J'aurais pu me trouver dans une situation analogue à la vôtre si ma réponse pouvait être publiée à Moscou. Et donc, le livre de Kojève, le seul d'ailleurs qui veut faire publier en son nom et qui ne semble pas être pour lui un jeu, est le texte de la Sophia. Je vous remercie. Merci Lambert, ton texte, il y a plein, plein de, de choses très intéressantes à dire. On a environ plus ou moins 40 minutes pour discuter des, des relations de Dimitri, de Issa, de Lambert. Euh, je vous les débats. Uh, if you want, you, you can... Uh... Oui, d'accord. La, la première question, c'est Lambert pour Dimitri. Oui. Bonjour, bonjour Dimitri. Euh, J'étais vraiment ravi d'entendre votre, votre texte, votre conférence, qui était très éclairant, et notamment sur ce rapport au rire chez Soloviev. Et je pensais, puisque la Sofia, c'est le premier texte, ou en tout cas un des premiers textes écrits par Kojev, en, en, par Soloviev, pardon, en 1876, qui commence donc par le rire de l'homme, etc. Et il est assez intéressant dans, de voir la lecture de Kojev que fait Soloviev dans son livre, notamment La philosophie religieuse de Vladimir Soloviev, mais aussi dans sa thèse, de voir comment en fait Soloviev bascule peu à peu d'un optimisme de jeunesse à un pessimisme. Et je me disais en vous écoutant que finalement le pessimisme de Soloviev, supposé par Kojev à la fin de sa vie, révélait l'échec de Soloviev d'être devenu un sage. Et ce qui m'intéressait aussi, ça serait de lier davantage le rire et le concept de mortalité de l'homme. Est-ce que vous voyez un, un lien entre le fait que finalement Soloviev sombre dans le pessimisme parce qu'il n'admet pas ou il n'arrive pas à admettre la mortalité de l'homme et ce qui éteindrait son rire, quoi qu'en fait Soloviev devient de plus en plus comique à mesure qu'il devient pessimiste. Mais bon, je m'égare. Est-ce qu'il y a un lien entre, quel lien vous ferez plutôt entre la mort 
et le rire euh, de Soloviev et l'acceptation de la sagesse euh, comme est-ce que enfin voilà euh, oui oui merci en fait bon c'est une question compliquée je crois en fait je sais pas si je saurais répondre à cette question comme ça en fait sur le champ <rire> bah euh... Oui, c'est vrai, en fait, que le concept du rire chez Soloviev, ça apparaît dans la Sophia, et ça disparaît après, en fait, oui. Enfin, du rire comme fondement métaphysique de l'homme, hein. ça apparaît justement à l'époque où il était encore à Moscou et tout jeune, et puis ça disparaît, hein. ça, ça est euh, euh, remplacé par... Euh, d'autres choses, hein. donc ça n'existe pas, mais pour moi, en fait, je ne suis pas philosophe du tout, en fait, je suis historien de lettres, ouais. euh, ce qui est important, en fait, chez Soloviev, c'est qu'il ait su garder jusqu'à sa vie euh, cette auto-ironie euh, qui était la sienne, en fait, hein. lui qui est fondateur euh, du cercle d'argent, qui est vraiment la base de tout ce qui se passait après, et de la poésie symboliste, par exemple, mais c'est lui aussi qui a euh, voulu faire des parodies euh, des symbolistes. Hein. Donc, lui, il est symboliste, il parle de la Sophia, etc. En même temps, euh, bah, il, euh, il fait des autoparodies de, de cela. Donc, il y a vraiment en fait, quelque chose de double dans cet apport, dans cette approche ouais, euh, chez Soloviev. Hein, en fait, cette possibilité d'être mystique. Ouais, de parler de choses bien élevées et en même temps d'être quelqu'un qui, qui peut distancier tout cela, mettre ces choses-là à distance, euh, défamiliariser en fait ces, ces choses-là, hein, si on apprend justement ce terme, euh, enfin tardif en fait. Oui. Qui... Voilà, donc là, euh, euh, je crois que justement que je fais rire de cela, ouais, cette euh, double nature en quelque sorte dans le sage, ben, est-ce que ce levier n'a pas réussi à devenir sage à la fin de sa vie Ou peut-être euh, au contraire en fait, oui, parce que le sage c'est pas quelqu'un qui... Euh, euh, qui sait tout en fait, c'est quelqu'un qui peut-être prétend <rire> savoir tout, mais qui... Euh, euh, qui est très, très ironique à hein, soi-même, oui, qui, qui, qui comprend que voilà, la sagesse est aussi euh, un questionnement permanent en fait, de soi-même dans ce processus de sagesse qui, qui semble être un peu terminable, ouais, quand même, malgré la fin de l'histoire. Hein. La sagesse, bon, ce n'est pas en état, c'est peut-être un processus. Et dans ce processus interminable, en fait, il est très important d'être, d'avoir, de, de garder cette distance, en fait, par rapport à soi-même. Donc là, pour moi, je ne sais pas si j'ai répondu à votre question, mais pour moi, c'est ça, en fait, le point, peut-être, enfin, le plus important dans, dans cette... Euh, cet héritage en fait oui, culturel euh, qui, qui se dessine comme ça à travers un, tout un siècle. Ouais. Voilà. Merci. Et une question aussi pour vous en fait. <rire> euh, je, vous, je vous invite à regarder ce, ce livre de Kojev sur Soloviev, sur son sur la façon dont il interprète Soloviev comme basculant peu à peu dans le pessimisme. Car sur le rire et sur le basculement de Soloviev de, qui serait de plus en plus pessimiste d'après euh, Kojev, à, à mon avis, il y a quelque chose d'intéressant sur, sur ce rire qui s'éteint ou ce, cette incapacité de Soloviev d'endosser de, une figure du rire, en fait, de, et donc du sage quelque part, même si c'est vrai, vous avez parfaitement raison, et c'est assez frappant de voir que c'est aussi à la fin de sa vie que Soloviev est parfois le plus drôle. Euh, et vous avez rappelé le poème des trois, entre, des trois, des trois rencontres, qui est magnifique, c'est vraiment un chef dœuvre absolu ce, ce poème, et qui est très ironique, tout en étant euh, enfin, très drôle quand il se fait passer à tabac par, euh, dans le désert, euh, et en même temps très mystique, qui arrive à conjuguer ces deux choses, 
C'est assez, assez beau. Merci en tout cas pour votre réponse. Est-ce que je pourrais poser une question à Robert aussi ah Non, mais allez-y. Allez euh, oui, euh, en fait, euh, je vous remercie beaucoup euh, d'avoir parlé euh, de cette histoire euh, de la cathédrale euh, Christ, euh, du Christ sauveur. En fait, c'est un sauveur à Moscou et de sa destruction et du projet de construire cet endroit, enfin, le bâtiment, enfin, le palais des soviets. Voilà. Euh, Est-ce que... Je, enfin, je pense qu'en fait, rien que le fait de détruire cette cathédrale, c'était vraiment enfin, une action très compliquée, hein, parce qu'il avait euh, plusieurs sens. Euh, tout d'abord, la cathédrale était la cathédrale, enfin, la cathédrale principale oui, de Moscou. Donc, euh, les bolcheviques qui voulaient le détruire, la détruire, c'était vraiment enfin, un effort de démanteler hein, euh, tout le système euh, impérial qui était fondé sur, euh, sur le tsar et l'église orthodoxe. Et je crois que, en fait, euh, la chose la plus importante là-dedans, c'était... Euh, qu'en en fait, euh, ce n'était pas un simple démantèlement. Oui, il voulait justement construire à cet endroit quelque chose d'autre, un autre temple, qui devait euh, être un temple de la raison, en quelque sorte. Donc, et, les bolcheviques ont beaucoup rasé, enfin, ils ont rasé euh, des centaines d'églises, de bâtiments religieux à Moscou et un peu partout en Russie, mais ils ont consciemment choisi cet endroit où se trouvait la cathédrale, pour la déconstruire en quelque sorte, oui, au sens vraiment enfin, du mot quand donné des rides, fait non pas démanteler, mais déconstruire et reconstruire en le transformant en temple de la raison. Et la statue gigantesque de Lénine qui devait couronner ces, ce bâtiment qui n'a jamais euh, vu le jour, c'était justement... Enfin, Nouvel Christ, un nouveau Christ en quelque sorte, ouais, enfin, c'est celui qui, a, qui, qui, qui est venu plus tard, après Christ en fait, qui a euh, euh, déclaré, euh, qui, qui a proclamé une autre religion, ouais, plus performante, ouais, plus active que celle du christianisme. Donc ce n'était pas seulement enfin, euh, un geste négateur, ouais, négatif, en fait c'était un geste de reconstruction et de production de quelque chose d'autre qui devait remplacer enfin, la religion vétuste, en fait, qui était le christianisme aux yeux des bolcheviques. Et à... ici, en fait, on peut aussi tracer des parallèles entre Notre-Dame de Paris, hein, qui était fermée à l'époque de la Révolution et que Robespierre voulait raser aussi, en fait. Il a été sauvé parce qu'il n'y avait pas de moyens financiers, je crois, chez les Jacobins pour raser Notre-Dame de Paris. Et Notre-Dame a été transformée en temple de la raison. Et plus tard, c'était donc Napoléon qui était sacré là-bas, dans ce temple. Donc là, il se dessine dans certains parallèles. Je ne sais pas si ben, on peut affirmer à 100% que c'était dans la tête de Staline en fait, et des autres bolcheviques qui voulaient entamer ce projet mais je crois qu'en fait ce sont deux choses qui, 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 que, que, dont on doit quand même se rendre compte oui, quand on parle justement de cet événement qui a beaucoup marqué les esprits bien sûr oui, cette, cette, ce démantelement oui, cette explosion de la cathédrale qui, qui, qui a qui a bien enfin, fini d'être, oui, mais à la place de laquelle il devait avoir quelque chose d'autre. Et là euh, aussi, en fait, euh, par, euh, euh, je voudrais faire une allusion au livre en fait, qui était très connu à l'époque et qui était beaucoup aimé par Staline. Hein. C'était une biographie de Napoléon euh, signée par l'académicien historien Evgeny Tarlet, et qui est apparu en 36, en fait, donc en pleine époque comme ça, et euh, qui, euh, euh, dit-on, a beaucoup marqué l'esprit de Staline aussi, hein, parce que Staline, en fait, en quelque sorte, euh, ayant lu cette biographie, et s'est identifié à Napoléon aussi. 
et tous ces projets de reconstruction de Moscou, de, de transformation, etc., c'était, ça doit être placé aussi sous le signe de, de ce parallèle, peut-être, hein, parce que là, bah, des figures euh, historiques correspondantes comme celle de Napoléon, celle de Staline, enfin Lénine aussi, en fait, pour Kojev, c'était vraiment un complexe d'idées, oui, et d'emblèmes, en quelque sorte, qui travaillaient et qui, qui sont visibles dans ces, dans ces écrits. Voilà, je ne suis pas peut-être trop logique là, mais je voulais juste attirer à votre attention au fait qu'il y avait vraiment beaucoup de choses qui se passaient à, à cette époque et euh, il faut vraiment y penser quand on, euh, quand on parle de Kojef et de son attitude envers le bolchevisme par exemple, ou envers, envers la culture, avec, envers le christianisme, etc. Voilà, merci. Ce n'était pas une question, c'était juste une remarque peut-être. Merci en tout cas pour, pour cette remarque. C'est ce que j'essaye de faire, exactement ce que j'essaye de faire. Et effectivement, pourquoi, prendre, euh, pourquoi, comparer, euh, le, pourquoi comparer ce texte euh, à la cathédrale du Christ Sauveur Pour plusieurs raisons. D'abord parce que, euh, comme vous l'avez rappelé, et peut-être que je n'ai pas assez insisté dessus, mais il faudrait réinsister, ce n'est pas simplement un esprit de destruction, c'est... Euh, aussi, euh, pour euh, le dire avec cette formule de Bakounine, c'est aussi un esprit de construction, de création. Euh, on détruit la cathédrale du Christ Sauveur, c'est-à-dire on détruit une commémoration par les tsars de leur victoire sur Napoléon pour bâtir dessus, effectivement, non plus le temple du Borg Tchelayek, du dieu homme, mais du, le temple du Tchelayek à Borg, du, 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 du dieu homme, euh, du, de l'homme dieu, euh, avec Lénine, euh, effectivement, en triomphe. Euh, et ce qui m'intéressait également, c'est, alors je n'ai pas eu le temps de le dire, mais effectivement, c'est le devenir de, cette, de ce projet. Puisque ça échoue, ils, bat, ils n'arrivent pas à édifier le temple des soviets. Et ce qui est assez intéressant, c'est qu'ils vont en faire une piscine. C'est-à-dire c'est que comme, ça, c'est, c'est comme si finalement, la fin de l'histoire n'arrive pas à s'intégrer dans euh, le, l'homme-dieu, mais donc dans la divino-humanité ou que sais-je, mais finalement devient le temps du loisir et de l'American way of life où on se prélasse dans une piscine qui a remplacé le Christ sauveur et qui marque l'échec de, euh, de ce palais des soviets. Donc, et de la même façon, en fait, le texte de Kojève, je ne l'ai pas rappelé, mais le texte de Kojève est inachevé. Le texte de Kojève, ce ne sont que les fondations de ce projet gigantesque de monument euh, qui euh, retracerait toute la conscience de l'humanité culminant avec euh, l'URSS et Staline. Et donc c'est assez, euh, assez marrant, en tout cas c'est, je trouvais ça intéressant de faire ce parallèle jusqu'au bout entre la cathédrale du Christ Sauveur euh, et euh, le palais des Soviets et l'échec de Kojève ne parvenant pas finalement, à fonder, euh, enfin, à aller au-delà de simples fondations qui deviendra une piscine, etc. Merci en tout cas pour votre remarque. Merci. Et au vidéo, il avait une des mains, une question. Et puis, moi-même, je voudrais bien... Merci beaucoup. Euh, je, j'aurais d'abord une petite question pour euh, Dimitri euh, Tokarev. Est-ce que vous pourriez m'indiquer exactement la euh, référence de la réaction de bataille à l'interprétation que je viens de que non euh, vous, avez, vous l'avez mentionné, vous avez dit que vous allez parler plus tard et peut-être que j'ai, j'ai mal compris ou je, je, je n'ai pas entendu. Euh, donc, une, une demande de, de précision bibliographique, mais aussi, euh, et ça c'est aussi une question pour euh, Rissa, euh, le texte, les romans de la sagesse, euh, c'est vraiment un texte étrange. Et, et je pense que ce qui le rend étrange, c'est comme souvent chez, chez Kojève, les notes de bas de page. Non il, y a, il y a cette première note de bas de page qui est une sorte de disclaimer, non où, il dit, où, où Kojève dit quelque chose comme « ne me prenez pas trop au sérieux ». L'auteur a essayé dans ce texte de parler parodier son propre style, c'est illisible quasi français. Alors, d'abord, 
pour moi, je ne suis pas un natif, mais c'est un français parfaitement lisible. Je dirais même, c'est un des textes les mieux écrits par Kojève en français. Donc, je ne vois pas exactement en quoi ce serait illisible. Et deuxièmement, qu'est-ce que ça veut dire s'autoparodier, en fait euh, Est-ce que le texte contient des thèses qu'on ne peut pas imputer à Kojève Est-ce qu'il porte à l'extrême un certain nombre de, de points Je n'ai pas l'impression, je pense justement que c'est un texte assez cohérent avec ses engagements généraux. Donc, je me demande, en fait, si l'ironie ne peut pas venir du fait, justement, que on avance quelque chose de très sérieux, mais on le déguise sous la forme... On prend la masque ironique, justement, pour euh, ne pas trop offenser euh, quand on avance quelque chose de, de, de sérieux. Euh, bon, ça c'est pour euh, concernant et, et, et d'autant plus je pense que le soldat Bru euh, c'est quand même un personnage qui euh, qu'est-ce qu'il fait finalement le soldat Bru non, il arrive à Paris et il reprend un magasin de cadres photographiques quelle est donc son euh, entreprise Celle de permettre à ses concitoyens de euh, encadrer leurs souvenirs. Frame their, their memories. Mais c'est exactement l'homme de la Erinnerung, de la, de la rémémoration, de la recollection. Euh, donc, on pourrait dire que c'est tout à fait c'était presque un impératif pour Kojev de prendre position par rapport à ça. C'est trop près, en fait, de, de Hegel et de ce que lui considère comme, comme le sage, pour, pour ne pas dire, euh, euh, pour ne pas y prendre euh, position. Et d'ailleurs, non, il y a cet épisode euh, pendant lequel, dans une séance de spiritisme, euh, le soldat Bru rencontre un de ses ancêtres qui a participé à la bataille de Yéna. Il lui demande, mais qu'est-ce que tu as fait au juste là et qu'est-ce que répond l'ancêtre C'est une phrase euh, remarquable que non. J'ai apporté sabre au clair, le sérieux dans la philosophie allemande. Uh, I, I have brought saber in hand, seriousness into, into German philosophy. C'est... On ne peut plus quoi je viens et on ne, ne peut plus, on ne peut plus sérieux. Um, ça, c'est ma, ma question pour, concernant euh, Kojève Queneau. Alors, pour Rambert, tu es dans une situation très particulière parce que tu parles d'un texte euh, dont tu es plus ou moins le seul vrai connaisseur. Donc, on doit, te, te prendre, on doit te prendre au sérieux, on doit te faire confiance. Alors, moi, ce qui m'interroge quand même un peu, et c'est pour ça que je voudrais lire le texte, euh, le voir de près, euh, et donc, je me demande si euh, exactement dans quel contexte ça apparaît, dans, dans, quel, euh, dans quelle connexion, euh, sous ses insistances sur le caractère criminel, euh, sur le caractère meurtrier. Enfin, ce qu'on connaît de Kojev dans les textes publiés, et il y en a quand même pas mal, c'est que justement, en fait, pour qu'il y ait humanité, il faut justement pas qu'il y ait de meurtre. C'est-à-dire, le meurtre nous, nous maintient dans l'animalité, la, en fait. Il n'y a personne pour te reconnaître, en fait, avec le meurtre. Le crime, c'est autre chose. Le crime apparaît souvent dans euh, le texte français, par exemple, et dans Schegel, Verbrechen. Mais c'est un autre sens, en fait. Crime, c'est inadéquation avec une norme juridique, en fait. Donc, tu peux, après, il y a toutes les distinctions en, en fonction de gravité, mais tu pourrais dire toute non-conformité avec un ordre juridique est criminelle, non Donc, le révolutionnaire est criminel, mais on pourrait dire même celui qui, qui traverse la rue euh, au feu rouge, il est criminel, non Il ne euh, respecte pas la, la loi en cours. Donc, pour moi, entre meurtre et crime, il y a un, un abîme radical, en fait. Et autant je vois pourquoi 
crime, ça peut être un terme technique de COGEF, c'est pour rien avoir un sens, mais meurtre, je ne vois pas vraiment. En fait. Et merci au vidéo. Avant de, de, de répondre, euh, je voudrais faire une question sur la question <rire> des, des vidéos, c'est-à-dire la dernière question qui t'a posée, Rambert, c'est-à-dire la question du contexte du manuscrit. Euh, il est vrai, il est en édit, mais il vient d'être publié chez Gallima, espère, on espère, à la fin de l'année. Mais, euh, alors, la, 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 la la question qui je te demande de, 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 un peu d'expliquer, c'est pas seulement les contextes, mais aussi la, la, la fameuse lettre à Staline. Euh, parce que tout m'expliquait hier, mais peut-être ça, 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 ça c'est le cas de, de, de le faire en, en public. Euh, moi, j'ai écrit que euh, la, 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 la lettre à Staline, c'était les manuscrits. Et moi, j'ai suivi Ruben, c'est-à-dire les, les, les mémoires de Ruben dans, dans lesquelles il expliquait ça. Mais eh, Rambé, il m'expliquait que euh, ce n'est pas le cas. Alors, euh, je, je te demanderai d'expliquer la différence entre ces manuscrits-là, Sophia, qui vient d'être publié, et la lettre à Staline. Maybe just very quickly on um, Ovidio, on the style of the review, it's strange for sure. And the footnote is, also, is particularly interesting because he said he's plagiarizing Canor. And uh, so he says it's a dedication and a plagiarism of Canor. And there are lots of interesting texts by Canor on the relation between written and spoken language. And I think this might be the cue to this idea of the eligibility of the review. I don't think he means it's eligible in the sense of it's not readable, but in the sense of it's a kind of wisdom which is accessible. It's closer to the language spoken on the streets than the language he would read in philosophy books written at the time. So he writes the way, um, in the review, he, he writes the way Soldat Bru speaks is closer to um, Hegel than any contemporary French philosopher. So there's this whole idea of the relation between this canonized philosophical language and then what the voyou or this initial moment of philosophical language like Socrates and all these examples of the voyou. And then I think the question of irony is also relevant, which um, Dimitri talked about, this idea of what irony is, is Kozhev using? Is it a romantic irony? Is it close to the postmodern irony? What kind of, um, what kind of irony? But I think Rambert, Euh, mais euh, alors, pour répondre à la question sur le meurtre et le crime, dans le texte de Kojève, euh, il y a une autre, euh, comment dire, il y, a, il y a une autre comparaison qui est avec euh, le péché. Euh, meurtre, crime et péché vont ensemble notamment dans euh, une excursion du texte qui s'appelle « Crime et châtiment euh, », dans une référence probable euh, au texte de Dostoïevski, « Crime et châtiment euh, ». La question du meurtre est présente dans le texte de la Sophia, et elle est présente pas seulement comme tentative de meurtre, mais elle les présente comme meurtre effectif et devant se réaliser. Et à deux reprises, ou enfin, pas à deux reprises, tout le temps dans le texte, mais dans deux contextes différents. Le premier contexte, c'est dans le contexte du maître. Le maître, effectivement, il veut se faire reconnaître. Mais la reconnaissance de l'esclave, elle ne le satisfait pas. Ce qui fait que le maître va continuer sa quête de reconnaissance de façon désespérée, désespérée au sens russe, euh, c'est-à-dire sans issue, euh, en menant la guerre et en tuant ses adversaires. Et il reviendra à chaque fois euh, chez lui. Et Kojev dit, quand il vit en paix, le maître est un animal. Quand il tue à la guerre, le maître est un homme. C'est uniquement lorsqu'il tue 
et uniquement lorsque... Et d'ailleurs, il ne peut... Il... En fait, c'est assez étrange de la façon dont il le dit, enfin, pas si étrange qu'on rentre dans le... sa perspective, mais en gros, euh, l'homme, quand il est à la place du maître, ne, ne peut vivre comme homme qu'en tuant et à la fin des fins en étant tué. Euh, ça, c'est le premier contexte, le contexte de guerre qui, pour lui, est absolument indispensable pour réaliser l'humanité du maître. Il y aura d'autres passages ensuite qui, pour lui, deviennent moins, euh, comment dire, moins intéressants, euh, qui sont le cas du duel. Euh, et le cas du duel, ce qui l'intéresse, c'est précisément que c'est un duel à mort. Euh, où un des deux ne va pas sur lui, et pas euh, où, euh, où il y a euh, reconnaissance. Euh, il faut que l'un des deux meure. Ça, c'est le premier point. Le deuxième point sur le meurtre, euh, là, il le dit clairement, dans une idéologie soviétique, il faut tuer, il faut tuer euh, les bourgeois et enjamber leurs cadavres. Euh, il faut se débarrasser. Il le dit d'ailleurs de façon plus ou moins rapide et allusive dans en guise d'introduction, dans le, dans le, dans le, dans, dans, dans le texte d'introduction à la philosophie d'Hegel. Mais dans le texte de la Sophia, il compare les, euh, il compare les, euh, les, en fait, il compare les maîtres. Ce n'est pas exactement les, les bourgeois d'ailleurs, mais il compare les maîtres aux faux bourdons, c'est-à-dire euh, à ces euh, individus qui sont des catalyseurs de l'histoire et dont il faut se débarrasser une fois qu'ils ont accompli leurs œuvres. Et ensuite, alors mon ordinateur s'est éteint, sinon je vous aurais lu le passage, euh, ensuite il s'agit euh, de les tuer et d'enjamber euh, leurs cadavres. Ce qui pose d'ailleurs un problème de reconnaissance, puisqu'en fait... Euh, ce n'est pas tellement une reconnaissance de la part du maître qu'on attend, mais c'est une, rec une reconnaissance mutuelle entre esclaves que nous aussi on est des maîtres et des euh, esclaves. Euh, donc, pour la question du, du meurtre, euh, elle, se, elle, se, elle se lit sous ces deux angles. En fait. euh, concernant le crime, c'est un peu plus qu'une affaire euh, juridique chez Kojève, puisque le crime est toujours lié au péché, dans le texte de la Sophie, enfin peut-être pas toujours, mais il est souvent lié au péché, et le crime c'est le moment où l'homme euh, refuse l'ordre établi, euh, c'est-à-dire refuse l'ordre qu'a édifié pour lui son père. Euh, c'est l'autorité du père en fait. Euh, le criminel c'est celui qui refuse l'autorité du père. Euh, clairement. Euh, et l'autorité du père, c'est quoi C'est l'autorité d'un homme qui a son autorité grâce à l'ordre dans lequel je vis. Je veux dire par là que euh, nos pères ont une autorité parce que nous vivons encore dans l'ordre qu'ils ont construit. Euh, et à ce titre, le monde qu'ils ont construit est un monde à leur image, et un monde qui leur ressemble, et un monde dans lequel d'ailleurs on peut toujours se sentir un peu étranger, puisque précisément il ne nous appartient pas tout à fait, il appartient plutôt à la figure d'un autre, qui est la figure du maître, ou euh, la figure du père, euh, qui gagne ainsi son autorité. Donc le criminel, c'est celui qui précisément refuse l'ordre dans lequel il vit, et qu'il a hérité de la part de son père comme cause de, de lui-même comme effet. Et donc, refusant l'ordre, il se montre étant comme criminel. Et cet ordre, pour Kojev, le, le vrai refus, c'est pas un refus euh, qui est simplement théorique ou qui est simplement euh, un jeu, c'est un refus dans la violence et dans la mort. C'est, je crois, sa remarque à propos de 68, euh, Raymond Aron l'appelle, inquiet, et il lui demande euh, « qu'est-ce que vous pensez des événements ?» et il lui répond « c'est rien, il n'y a pas eu de mort, donc il n'y a, a, véritable... a pas de véritable histoire. » Quand il y a meurtre, quand il y a mort, quand il y a un ordre violemment 
de façon sanglante, euh, réprimé, enfin, tu, enfin supprimé, eh bien là, ça devient intéressant, là, ça fait histoire. Okay. Je commence par, par euh, Rambert, c'était vraiment deux exposés extrêmement stimulants. J'ai aussi des questions pour, pour Isa, mais peut-être je ferai ça après parce qu'il faut que je mette un peu de l'ordre dans mes, dans, mes, dans mes réflexions, ce que j'ai réussi à faire déjà euh, dans le cas de, de, de Rambert. D'abord, je commence par les questions, une question toute simple, toute bête, d'ordre bibliographique aussi. Ce manuscrit inédit que j'ai, daté de 32, tu disais, sur, ça s'appelle la philosophie religieuse de Slovier, et c'est en français, et c'est à la BN. Ok. Et ce n'est pas identique aux articles publiés en langue française sur la VF. Et ce n'est pas seulement une traduction française de la thèse allemande non plus. Ok. 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 Ça, c'est très éclairant. Deuxième remarque, et là, je ne prolonge que les précisions de Ovidiu. Là tu, où tu, tu viens de, et c'est une question, hein, ce n'est pas une critique, là où tu viens de t'écrire une sorte de continuité entre le désir de reconnaissance et ce que tu appelles désir meurtrier, je dois avouer que je ne vois pas vraiment de continuité, je vois une vraie tension entre le cours sur Hegel et ce que tu, 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 tu décris, euh, ce que tu euh, dis sur le texte sur la Sophia. Parce que, bon, nous savons tous que, disons, le côté animal de l'homme ressort souvent par la volonté de ne pas mourir, de préserver, de vouloir préserver sa vie coûte que coûte, alors que la force anthropogène émane de la volonté de risquer la vie, ou plus précisément de risquer, celle, non, non pas celle d'autrui, mais sa propre vie. Et ça, c'est vraiment très important. Et c'est presque le contraire dans meurtre, c'est vraiment une, dans, dans le désir de reconnaissance. Je ne rigue pas jusqu'au à dire que c'est une poussée suicidaire, mais disons il s'agit d'une certaine désinvolture à l'égard de sa propre vie. Et là, je vois une tension avec tout ce que tu viens de dire sur le texte de la Sophia, avec ce désir meurtrier. Troisième question porte sur la relation entre le communisme soviétique et l'athéisme. Et là, j'ai en tête l'ouvrage d'une collègue et amie que je trouvais passionnante, Victoria Smolkin, « Sacred space is never empty, a history of Soviet atheism ». Et elle montre comment, sous Staline, l'hostilité à l'égard de la religion s'émousse de plus en plus, au point où Staline reconnaît que l'Église orthodoxe constitue un puissant outil de mobilisation, notamment dans la guerre contre l'Allemagne. Alors là, on pourrait dire, ok, bon, c'est que, ça relève que de l'histoire empirique qu'elle vient avec Kojev. Eh bien, Kojev lui-même commente cette évolution dans son esquisse euh, de la politique euh, euh, française de 1945. Il dit que voilà, euh, qu'il y a une main tendue par Staline à l'Église orthodoxe et où il concède aussi qu'un communisme non utopique euh, est une force profondément conservatrice. Et pour que ce c'est pas un reproche, c'est une vertu. Il dit la même chose sur le PCF d'ailleurs. Hein. C'est-à-dire, il, 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 il approuve, il approuve ce tournant dans, dans, dans l'histoire du, du communisme. Euh, j'ai encore deux autres questions. La question du mal. La question du mal, je crois, c'est pas seulement un sujet brûlant pour la philosophie religieuse, c'est aussi une question épineuse au sein de la mouvance communiste internationale. Et la première figure qui me vient à la tête, il y a une prise de parole de Georges Lukács en 1919, où il pointe une dialectique du bien et du mal qui, qui prend des allures dostoevskiennes. Je les cite là. L'éthique communiste fait qu'il est du plus haut devoir d'accepter la nécessité d'agir avec méchanceté. C'est là le plus grand sacrifice qu'on nous ait demandé de faire. La conviction du vrai communiste est que le mal se transforme en félicité par la dialectique de l'évolution historique. Fin de la citation. Et juste toutes les pièces didactiques de Bertolt Brecht portent sur le même problème. C'est-à-dire, c'est juste une invitation que, que, que je te donne à, à, à réinscrire que, que j'ai non seulement dans le texte, dans, dans, dans le contexte de la philosophie religieuse, mais aussi de, de le relier avec ces débats internes au mouvement communiste. Et euh, dernière question, une 
une notion à laquelle je me serais attendu, euh, peut-être cela trahit mes origines allemandes, et celle de la théologie politique que tu n'as pas euh, employée. Elle est très importante, bien sûr, dans le dialogue entre Schmitt euh, et Kojève, et Schmitt, on l'oublie souvent, est un lecteur non seulement de Dostoevsky, mais encore de Soloviev aussi. C'est Jacob Taubes qui révèle ça. Et dans son exposé, il était beaucoup question de, de, de facettes démoniaques, diaboliques, infernales de l'existence humaine. Et je trouvais ça absolument passionnant. Mais dans les débats sur la, euh, de, de, sur la théologie politique, quelle est la manifestation politique de l'Antichrist C'est la volonté de unifier le monde et de régner sur lui. Et, et Zolov y en parle, bien sûr. Hein, de, 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 et c'est exactement le lien avec Carl Schmitt, où il dit juste l'État universel dont Paul Kojève, ça serait la manifestation de l'Antichrist sur Terre, parce que c'est l'une des trois tentations, je crois, de, 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 de l'humanité par l'Antichrist. Ok. C'était un peu long, mais désolé, mais c'était juste, c'était très stimulant. Je peux répondre à la, à la première question la plus simple euh, concernant le texte euh, pour euh, puisque j'avais pas répondu de Kto ou de Robin euh, de ce que j'ai lu euh, que Nina d'ailleurs m'a très gentiment et je la remercie envoyé et photocopié Nina Kuznetsov euh, euh, je ne crois pas que ce soit le même texte euh, puisque euh, je me souviens plus très bien, mais ça doit. Il parle d'un texte que Kojav commence à écrire en 1939, euh, d'une lettre à Staline qui fait 100 pages et il dit qu'il va encore en écrire 100. Et euh, de quoi euh, Kojav parlerait dans cette lettre Il expliquerait à Staline, ou en tout cas il donnerait des indications politiques à Staline, notamment celle de, euh, si ma mémoire est bonne, euh, pourquoi l'Europe doit se détruire. Dans, une, dans des guerres nationalistes, et euh, pourquoi l'Empire soviétique ne doit pas intervenir dans cette guerre pour, euh, d'une certaine façon, euh, apparaître comme vainqueur de la guerre sans, la, sans en avoir participé. En gros, euh, les pays européens doivent se détruire, et ainsi le communisme apparaîtra de façon encore plus triomphante et pourra euh, prendre toute l'Europe, s'emparer de l'Europe. Euh, donc il ne me semble pas que ce soit le même texte même j'ai l'impression que ce n'est pas du tout le même texte euh, puisque ensuite Rubin dirait que, dit qu'il euh, aurait donné un texte qui serait l'équivalent de l'introduction à la philosophie de Hegel en russe euh, avec, accompagné de la fameuse lettre donc là on a déjà deux manuscrits euh, alors peut-être que le, ce qu'il appelle l'introduction à, à la philosophie de Hegel, ça serait euh, le texte de la Sophia, pourquoi pas, éventuellement, euh, mais alors c'est une retraduction et un remaniement assez total, euh, et puis euh, la lettre en question. Voilà, ça c'est pour la première remarque. La deuxième remarque, maintenant plus difficile, euh, sur le désir meurtrier de reconnaissance. Euh, euh, alors, chez euh, Kojève, effectivement, tu as tout à fait raison, vous avez, enfin, je, vous voyez plutôt, vous, voyez, vous avez tout à fait raison. Euh, 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 il faut vraiment le comprendre, j'ai l'impression, en tout cas dans la euh, dans l'introduction à la lecture de Hegel, comme un jeu. Euh, un jeu qui me fait d'ailleurs souvent penser à un jeu russe qui est la roulette russe, euh, où euh, finalement, euh, celui qui gagne, c'est celui qui est capable de mettre en jeu sa propre vie, jusqu'au bout, la sienne propre. Et d'ailleurs, c'est tout à fait important à savoir que euh, ce n'est pas la force qui l'emporte dans ce jeu, c'est la folie. Euh, la folie de celui qui est capable d'aller jusqu'au bout et qui ensuite fascine euh, par sa folie. Ce qui est intéressant, c'est d'ailleurs que c'est la même chose chez Soloviev. Chez Soloviev, dans les fondements spirituels de la vie, euh, qu'est-ce qui va fasciner les hommes C'est la capacité euh, qu'ont certains de nier leur propre instinct animaux euh, dans l'ascétisme. Euh, et, et Soloviev a cette image qui est un peu folle dans la justification du bien, où il imagine un combat entre un fauve 
et un moine ascétique. Nous, on est tous naturalistes, entre un moine et un fauve ascétique, on parie sur le fauve. Soloviev parie sur le moine ascétique, puisque le moine ascétique, en fait, serait capable de subjuguer la bête par euh, son charisme, le fait qu'il ait nié ses propres instincts animaux, fait qu'en fait, la bête le reconnaît et euh, se soumet à son autorité. C'est assez, euh, assez fou euh, de, de la philosophie, enfin euh, de la philosophie russe, religieuse russe. En réalité, c'est déjà très présent chez Dostoïevski également, cette espèce de, de duel entre les personnages, de celui qui est capable de se sacrifier jusqu'au bout le plus et qui se fait reconnaître ainsi dans son euh, sacrifice. Euh, alors concernant maintenant le meurtre, puisque là j'étais d'accord avec toi, alors pourquoi c'est un désir meurtrier de désir de reconnaissance Puisque malgré tout, il y a quand même un meurtre qui est celui de l'animal en soi. Euh, je je m'en débarrasse, je j'accomplis je, euh, jusqu'au bout euh, sa suppression. Euh, et euh, le maître, c'est celui qui euh, est capable de, de commettre ce meurtre euh, en, en faisant taire, dira Kojav d'ailleurs dans son, dans son texte de la Sophia, en faisant taire toute forme de compassion, c'est-à-dire toute forme d'animalité. Euh, et euh, la plupart du temps, dit Kojav, ça se solde par la mort. Euh, entre euh, il est rare de trouver un quelqu'un qui va s'arrêter dans cette dans ce dans cette lutte à mort et c'est pour ça que la lutte reprend plusieurs fois et il dira euh, euh, je me souviens plus que à un moment ou à un autre on va enfin rencontrer quelqu'un qui va se soumettre mais quand il se soumet c'est même pas satisfaisant alors là, il reprend les classes classiques, et ce qui va dès lors pousser les maîtres à se faire la guerre entre eux. Et je vais aller, dit Kojev, je vais aller tuer d'autres personnes, et comment j'ai reconnu ces autres personnes Parce qu'elles possèdent des esclaves. Et donc là, on va faire une, une vraie lutte à mort, euh, où je peux les tuer, euh, et où la reconnaissance devient une reconnaissance de l'ami entre maîtres, contre l'ennemi, les autres maîtres. Voilà, son, son... Après, il va y avoir toute une pensée de l'amitié, puisque ça fait partie des idéologies du maître. L'amitié étant une idéologie du maître chez Kojev, euh, chez l'esclave, le, le, c'est le priatial, le copain, le bon copain, et chez le citoyen, c'est le tavarish, évidemment, le camarade, euh, etc. Euh, bon, euh, alors, je ne sais pas si j'ai répondu tout à fait à la question du meurtre. Il y a une autre forme de meurtre, à mon avis, euh, plus euh, symbolique, mais tout à fait euh, importante dans la culture russe, qui n'est pas seulement donc la, le meurtre de l'animal, mais qui est aussi la mise à mort du, de Dieu. Euh, ce qui est vraiment très... Euh, là, c'est plus le... C'est plus l'esclave qui... C'est plus le maître qui est capable de faire ça, mais c'est l'esclave qui, lorsqu'il se débarrasse du maître, en fait, se débarrasse aussi du maître sublimé qui est Dieu. C'est-à-dire que pour Kojev, le maître, quand il naît comme maître, il fait une erreur, il attribue sa maîtrise à un ordre divin supérieur. Il va attribuer ça, par exemple, à la biologie et aux races. Euh, et il va expliquer que c'est un anachronisme. D'ailleurs, il va montrer dans le texte pourquoi le fascisme est un anachronisme destiné à disparaître puisqu'en fait, c'est une philosophie de maître qui reporterait leur geste fondateur sur un ordre biologique divin sans se comprendre eux-mêmes, ne comprendre pas l'acte contre nature qu'ils sont en train de, de commettre. Donc, en fait, l'autre meurtre, le, le meurtre qui va faire passer l'esclave au rang de citoyen, c'est le meurtre des maîtres, et derrière les maîtres, c'est le meurtre de Dieu c'est-à-dire du gage de cette garantie qu'un ordre immuable, transcendant existe et qui faisait reposer la maîtrise sur un ordre divin et biologique. Divin ou biologique. Euh, ça, c'était la, la question. Euh, pour, le, pour la remarque sur Lucas, je ne connais, connais pas ce texte, euh, 
à ma grande honte, euh, je, 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 je m'intéresser pour l'instant qu'à la philosophie russe. C'est un parti pris. Hein. C'est un parti pris. Euh, je sais bien que Kojev, enfin, j'ai quand même lu Hegel et j'ai lu Schelling, puisque Soloviev est euh, un grand lecteur de Schelling. Je sais bien que la pensée allemande est particulièrement présente. Je le sais d'autant plus que toute la philosophie russe est une héritière de l'idéalisme allemand et reprend les concepts de l'idéalisme allemand. Et puis si on lit la thèse de Kojev sur, euh, sur Soloviev, on voit bien comment Kojev renvoie au texte de Schelling et met en parallèle les textes de Schelling et de Soloviev. Donc, bon, je sais bien, mon parti pris, c'est quand même de montrer que la philosophie religieuse russe est plus qu'une simple répétition, une pâle copie de l'idéalisme de allemand, que Kojev s'en inspire fortement et qu'une partie, voire l'essentiel, d'après moi, de son discours est une reprise critique consistant à endosser ce que les philosophes religieux ont pensé et ont repoussé. Pourquoi je parle du meurtre et de cette part de démon C'est parce que si on, si on lit par exemple les démons de Dostoïevski, euh, où il dit euh, le discours entre Kirillov et Stavrogin, euh, Kirillov dit, présente, va, avant son suicide, hein, euh, présente ce qu'il qu veut faire, euh, et Stavrogin dit, mais ça c'est de la religion, ça c'est euh, Bokchilayek, euh, l'homme-dieu. Et, euh, et Kirillov lui répond, non, non, c'est Chilayek Bok, Chilayek Bok, euh, c'est l'homme-dieu et pas le dieu-homme. Euh, c'est... Euh, c'est quelque chose, et Dostoyevsky insistera longtemps et longuement là-dessus dans ses livres, dans son journal, le socialisme, c'est la même chose que la, philosophie religieuse, que la philosophie religieuse, mais sous une autre face. Celle où on se débarrasserait de la figure de Dieu et où l'homme, dans son orgueil, serait capable de construire tout seul la future tour de Babel, etc. Donc moi, ce qui m'intéressait, ce qui m'intéresse particulièrement dans la philosophie de Kojev, c'est quelque chose qui est assez frappant, c'est qu'il endosse cette part de démon. Il l'endosse, la... alors quand je dis la part de démon aussi, je pense à Lermontov, le démon de Lermontov qui est cité dans la Sophia. Le démon de Lermontov, c'est celui qui n'est pas satisfait de l'ordre dé... beau pourtant, et bon, et satisfaisant au moins en sens de bonheur, que euh, a créé Dieu, pour les créatures. Et le démon, c'est un moment assez euh, frappant, euh, traverse comme ça la terre, voit les montagnes du Caucase et dit « c'est pas, c'est neutre, c'est indifférent ». Les montagnes du Caucase, c'est dans la culture russe euh, des moments de révélation de la splendeur divine. Euh, c'est le moment de la beauté qui éclate et qui laisse... Euh, révéler ou deviner le visage de Dieu. Donc quand le démon de Lermontov voit ces montagnes et dit « ça m'est indifférent, je serais prêt à les détruire eh », ben, il dit par là même que l'ordre voulu par Dieu, tout bon qu'il soit, tout magnifique et que sais-je, en fait, parce qu'il n'est pas le mien, parce qu'il n'est pas créé par moi, parce qu'il est celui d'un autre, ne m'est pas satisfaisant. Et euh, évidemment, dans la culture russe, en dernière instance, et à chaque fois, c'est le démon qui a tort. Et il s'agit de faire pénitence, de s'agenouiller, de retrouver l'ordre bon voulu par Dieu, etc., l'unitotalité. Et le fait que Kojav soit capable, jusqu'au bout, d'endosser la figure du démon, de dire non, mais en réalité, ce n'est pas le bonheur sur terre qui est satisfaisant. C'est notre ordre à nous, qui est un acte... Je qui me semble d'une grande impiété. Et pour les Russes, qui s'est accompagné, et là je l'entends au sens historique, de meurtre, de masse. Et Kojev ne l'ignore pas. Exactement. 
En fait, c'est assez drôle d'ailleurs parce que c'est assez frappant dans le texte de Soloviev, le court récit sur l'antéchrist que je que je recommande à tout le monde avec euh, Kojev qui dira « Le drame de la vie de Platon et euh, les trois entretiens sont les plus beaux textes et les textes les plus profonds de Soloviev. Euh, » Ce qui est assez euh, frappant, c'est que Soloviev fait intervenir l'antéchrist, ou plus exactement un homme qui va devenir l'antéchrist, ce qui est beaucoup plus intéressant. C'est pas d'ores et déjà un homme qui est un démon, c'est un homme qui ne devient pas Dieu, mais c'est un homme qui devient un démon. Et en plus, Soloviev lui prête ses traits physiques et spirituels. Les amis de Soloviev, quand ils ont lu le court récit sur l'antéchrist, ont reconnu Soloviev sous les traits de l'antéchrist lui-même. Et que fait l'antéchrist L'antéchrist, il refuse que le monde doive quelque chose à Dieu. Euh, et il endosse entièrement la responsabilité de l'empire universel et homogène qu'il a réussi à créer, avec une maîtrise sur la nature, et il refuse que Dieu ait son rôle à jouer. C'est euh, une espèce de vision du grand inquisiteur de Dostoïevski, mais qui se serait accomplie, puisque dans le grand inquisiteur, c'est pas encore réalisé. Donc, euh, euh, Soloviev, on imagine la suite, euh, c'est la suite du grand inquisiteur, le moment où l'homme, le grand inquisiteur n'est pas seulement en train de devenir démon, mais il serait véritablement là, ça y est, devenu antéchrist. Et ce texte est assez fascinant, effectivement, et je crois, en tout cas c'est ma lecture, que euh, ce qui a fait reculer Soloviev, et euh, dans une théâtralisation, euh, Kojev dit, ce qui a tué Soloviev de lassitude, ce qui l'a brisé, ben je crois qu'en fait, Kojev, lui, veut le faire sien. Et ça sera la fin du texte, il accepte le dualisme, enfin il veut faire une philosophie dualiste, il veut faire une philosophie euh, euh, criminelle, euh, il veut faire une philosophie euh, où l'histoire de l'humanité euh, est tout entière entre les mains de l'humanité, euh, etc. etc. Jorge. Uh, so I have a question for Isa. Uh, that it, it, it's basically a little bit about okay the 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 désouvrement uh, that appears for Kojev at that point. That um, taking it in that way stands a little bit uh, aside from the tradition of Thomas More or uh, at the Utopia, in which at the end, uh, so in the island, people work as much as they need to work. And once they stop having to work, they use their free time to work. Uh, and with Marx, at, in the, the realm of freedom, is kind of the same thing. People have the freedom to work on what they want to work after, um, after once a realm, uh, in the realm of freedom, so beyond the realm of necessity. Uh, and so in this sense, Kojev, appears slightly differently. But w what I'm wondering is that there is, it seems also similar to what um, Bataille talks about uh, as the negativity sans emploi. Uh, et, but, but both times, both of them disagree with each other. So we, we, when Bataille talks about negativity sans emploi, uh, Kojev, uh, he proposes it as a criticism of Kojev, and Kojev doesn't agree with him. And when Kojev writes the reviews, it's the other way around. It's Bataille who doesn't like it. So it's it's kind of this encounter in which there there is a, a certain degree of similarity. But how? What is it that you see as perhaps being different here? And is there any significance in this certain degree of similarity? Yeah, very interesting question. Um, I think it's all very complex, actually. The Bataille Kojev. Um, disagreement and also what is even meant by um, neg negativity without employment or unemployed negativity or negativity out of work and I think um, so the of course the Marx reference is in the Hegel lectures directly before the footnote comes on the work so he speaks about the, this transition from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom but he also subverts Marx in my reading it's and, and in the um, Canoe review he writes Of course, at the end of the day, man works as little as possible, but we still have to wait for this moment. We still have to wait for it. So there's an, on the one hand, there's an exploration of the state. On the other, there's always this deferral that it hasn't happened yet. 
And um, I think the interesting difference to Bataille is, and this is what Bataille writes in the letter 37, but also in his text on sovereignty and the sacrifice, is there's always this moment of absolute um, negativity, which is constitutive for something, for a kind of autonomous um, sovereign subject, which Kuzhev, yeah, Kuzhev thinks this entirely different. There's, a, there's an entirely different subjectivity. And um, then also the um, topic of silence becomes so crucial. Like, how do you express um, these instances? Um, this doesn't really answer your question, but I think I'm still working through all these different conceptions as well. It's quite, um, I'm really trying to carve out this space, which is, um, which I try to speak about there, where all these discourses on language, animality, work, activity, negativity um, come together. And I think this is also the space where Bataille and Kuzhev diverge from each other. And I think if we understand what happens in this kind of space, then we also probably understand Bataille better. But I mean, to, um, yeah, this is just one. Well, um, French, English, I don't know, <laughs> c'est un problem. Uh, first in English to Isa. Um, yeah, the, the, the distance between Bataille and Kojab can be seen also with the, uh, thanks to the, to the figure you used, the Icarus. Uh, Bataille wanted, in, in, in his writings, in, at the beginning of the, of the 30s, he talked about uh, l'attitude anti-icarienne, uh, his sort of materialism should have a, an anti-icarian attitude, uh, which is exactly the opposite of what Kujab thinks about uh, work as a project to be fulfilled and, um, and his also, his uh, the, the authority of the leader is someone who accomplishes projects and creates something that goes high. While Bataille is in much, much more interested in this uh, narrow and uh, low materialism of social things. Um, the, 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 I guess this is the, the, the question between the two is that you never understand if Kojav is trying to to. to is taking Bataille seriously, uh, while while Bataille takes it, takes Kojeb's theories as a tragedy. <laughs> the, the, the negativity sans emploi is something uh, that he cannot uh, figure out, if not in this so, um, social attitudes like eroticism or uh, poetry or uh, uh, marginal. Uh, Figures, the 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 the, 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 the madman and so on, and uh, which for him is pure tragedy. Well, Kujab has a, an attitude, yeah, and a Postgeschichte <laughs> attitude. And uh, the important thing for Bataille is to continue to keep on using negativity uh, and to um, uh, to apply this detachment from the pure being, which is exactly what, for example, even Jacques Derrida discovers in Kojev in his notes on the post uh, history, uh, saying that you have always to be, even, even Kojev says at the end of history, we'll keep on detaching form from content. And this is the key to understand that Kojev is not serious about the end of history. <laughs> Just, that just means that okay, one form of life has ended, and we have to go on in some ways, which has always found very, very true. Because I cannot be taken seriously; otherwise, we are. You know, when he says about um, things about the, the end of history, and and this triangle, Bataille, Keno, Kojev, is is a huge problem because actually. Oh, I would like to pose to everybody. <laughs> the question is, 
what, what can uh, the sociology of post-history be? Why these people really quarrel about post-history? Uh, who are people uh, in society who can afford a post-historian uh, attitude, behavior, anywhere? And can our answers the why you, which is marginal, eccentric, uh, stupid guy going around and watching a clock? But this, this is, uh, uh, and Kosha writes about this with a grin and a smile in, in, on his face, and it all becomes parodic, while Bataille is tragedy. But Bataille is tragedy because he, he has always found an answer in. Uh, in, and when I come to Lambert, <laughs> in anthropology, in the, the use of sacrifice. And this, I mean, uh, when we uh, talk about the, the, the crime, this, the, the meurtre sacrificiel, c'est ça qu'on qu a. Uh, qu'on a découvert dans la, le XXe siècle avec l'anthropologie et, et, et les connexions entre psychanalyse et anthropologie, totem et tabou, et, et après Moss, euh, le, le la, la lutte pure, le pur prestige, c'est les fondements de, de, toutes, de toutes les, les, les dépenses des batailles. C'est une bataille pensée avec dépenses. Et l'interprétation hegelienne des batailles plutôt que celle de Kojet, c'est que c'est le sacrifice que c'est déterminant. Euh, mais le sacrifice, c'est pour bataille. En, parfois, c'est une comédie, c'est pas une tragédie. C'est une comédie parce que c'est la substitution de, 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 de Dieu avec un animal, d'un Dieu avec euh, euh, symbolique ou pas. Euh, mais, mais il parle de ça juste à partir de du de, début de, 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 des années 30, la substitution de, 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 de l'animal, de, de, de l'aigle qui, qui va manger le, 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 comment il dit, le figato, la, la, the liver of a Prometheus. No? <rire> c est, c est, ça, c'est une grande substitution qui, qui, qui peut expliquer des, 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 des liens sociaux. Et, Bon, et donc, euh, il faut ajouter même ce, ce type de, 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 de réflexion, peut-être. Et tandis que Kojep, quand, quand il parle de la réflexion, il ne parle jamais de la réflexion dans Hegel. Ça, ça, ça c'est intéressant. Euh, réflexion euh, dans la science de la logique, c'est inconnu pour, pour, euh, pour Kojep. Il n'est ne, il, il pas, pas intéressé à... Uh, autre chose que la phénoménologie de l'esprit. Um, une dernière question. Le, ah oui, la, 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 les crimes. Les crimes uh, tout ça, c'est bataille dans l'érotisme. Hein, uh, il, il dit que le crime est là pour être. Uh, les, les, pardon, les, les, la limite est là pour être transgressée. Hein. Ce qui c'est un truisme, un truisme uh, déjà uh, dans la. la philosophie du XXe siècle, parce que euh, il avait déjà été dit, par exemple, par, euh, par euh, Hermann Cohen euh, en, en Allemagne, euh, et reprise, euh, et reprise par, euh, par Benjamin aussi, euh, ou par, dans l'ordre juridique dont on a parlé, euh, Hans Kelsen a fondé toute sa euh, philosophie du droit sur euh, le concept de, de ce qui est euh, illicite et qui, qui provoque la, la, la création du droit. Euh, donc, c'est comme dire, la, la vision euh, cogélienne, c'est une exp, exaspération de, très russe, c'est très intéressant, très russe, et, ex, exaspération du moment, de l'instant du, du, de la transgression du de l'ordre social en général, euh, pas, pas seulement juridique, je suis d'accord, et euh, avec un, un, comment dire, un, un air de, euh, euh, de héroïsme, de, 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 une sorte d'érotisme de, de la décision euh, de, de, de faire la transgression en soi, 
qui, qui m'a toujours rappelé beaucoup Carl Schmitt. De ce film, de toute façon, quand tu, quand tu as dit euh, okay, la, la chose la plus importante, c'est de tuer, euh, de tuer, d'être. Euh, c'est seulement là qu'on qu qu devient maître, euh, qu'on peut se reconnaître dans, dans son être humain. Euh, ça, c'est un peu le, ce que Schmitt euh, a, a, a dit dans le Conseil des politiques. Euh, et qui devient très intéressant parce que si, si j'ai bien compris, Sophia a, a été écrite dans 1940-41. Hein. Euh, C'est juste au le moment où Kojève, dans ses écrits politiques, notion d'autorité et, et la, la technologie du droit, euh, utilise explicitement Schmitt, la notion du politique. Et ça, ça peut-être un, un carrefour de, des influences euh, qui devient évident, euh, même dans son texte euh, russe. Okay. Merci. Yeah, thank you very much, Massimo. Um, yeah, the triangle Bataille, no Kojev, and the sociology of this kind of post-historical... I mean, when you retrace these lines of discourse between the three, it's almost like a parallel history of each of their philosophies through different different ideas. And also, um, I mean, it's a, it's a, you can say it's like a private game of like kind of almost gentleman's club or something. You said who can even afford these kinds of um, jokes and then inside jokes and then reactions and then people are offended, but Haif is offended by Kajev and then they react and it's, it's all stretching over 20 years and I think it's it's still more as well so there's something for instance this Icarus figure you brought up I mean Cano also wrote a book about Icarus and there's something what I find interesting about it's also the role of the sun and this is maybe I mean for Bataille it's this like excess of energy and like this uh, generous um, gesture of like non-human waste access eternally uh, giving never receiving and this like anti ikarian what you called um is this idea of like we should never even try to colonize this energy we should just receive and there's a different inverted um gesture in Kajev, which i think is interesting which is this um madness of the project of like we have to uh, we have to pursue it until it becomes true this like stalinist madness and i think it's an interesting um yeah micro cosm of these ideas where different directions and um, yeah, interesting also the moment of decision you mentioned that this idea of transgression is also um, where I think Bataille, Kozhev, they also have entirely different conceptions of time and of temporality and temporality of exist no, of like existence and human life and um, these are so many, so many things. Euh, alors, j'aimerais justement encore répondre à cette histoire de meurtre et de crime. Euh, Puisqu'en fait, euh, j'ai pensé en, en, en vous entendant, euh, et d'un coup, ça, je m'en suis rappelé, ce qui m'a étonné de ne pas m'en être souvenu avant, mais euh, chez, euh, chez Soloviev, le jeu qui est, et chez Dostoyevsky également, euh, de la reconnaissance, qui est que l'on peut que l'on pourrait décrire comme euh, cette euh, cette roulette russe où je prouve à l'autre que je suis capable d'aller jusqu'au bout dans le sacrifice de moi-même euh, chez Dostoïevski il est très rapidement enrôlé sous une figure importante euh, dans qui va être importante dans un concept important dans la philosophie russe de Soloviev qui est l'amour le sacrifice de soi c'est la capacité de prouver que c'est la capacité... Si c'est uniquement négatif, c'est Roskolnikov, par exemple, avant qu'il rencontre la jeune fille. Mais lorsque cela devient positif, ce sacrifice de soi se joue non plus pour nier seulement moi-même et nier l'autre, mais se joue dans un acte d'amour. Je suis capable de me sacrifier moi-même, et me sacrifiant moi-même, je le fais non pas par pure négation, 
mais ce que même au-delà de la création, par amour pour l'autre, je me sacrifie pour lui. Euh, et on pourrait dire, après tout, si on s'arrête là, pourquoi ça ne fonctionnerait pas comme reconnaissance Si la reconnaissance, c'est uniquement le moment où je vois que l'autre est capable d'aller et d'endosser la mort, eh bien, quand il se sacrifie par amour, eh bien, je constate qu'il était capable de faire un acte euh, dépassant l'ordre du donné. Mais, et c'est là où le meurtre devient important chez Kojève, c'est que chez Kojève, cet acte d'amour est tout de suite nié. Si jamais euh, c'est un sacrifice qui est uniquement fait par amour et non pas fait par meurtre, ou pour le meurtre de l'autre, eh bien alors, en réalité, il n'est qu'une simple conservation de l'ordre donné, puisque lorsque je me sacrifie pour l'autre, me sacrifier, en fait, je veux faire préserver ou continuer l'ordre et embellir l'ordre déjà existant. Euh, alors que dans Kojève, il y a véritablement, je crois, impliqué l'idée que mon sacrifice, ce n'est pas un sacrifice fait par amour pour conserver un ordre déjà existant, c'est un sacrifice qui implique aussi le meurtre d'autrui. Euh, et donc, euh, je crois que euh, si jamais on enlève cette idée de meurtre du concept de reconnaissance, on risque de basculer dans une philosophie soloviévienne ou de rendre possible une philosophie soloviévienne de la reconnaissance dans l'amour. Bon. bon, alors la mort nous, nous, nous prendrait si nous n'allons pas à manger. Et alors, euh, je dirais, il y a deux questions de à guerre. Euh, je, je, je te prévais à guerre d'attendre euh, la session de l'après-midi, c'est-à-dire 15 heures, et on répondra. Et, mais, mais bon, on va manger, on se voit à 15 heures. Euh, et merci à tous et à toutes. Ora si registrerà la conferenza. Sensors. <laughs> such. Okay. So, welcome back. May I start? Yes. yes. Master and servant. I'm the servant now. Um, 
Welcome back to this last session of our symposium, and I'm very glad to introduce Professor Elettra Stimilli, who will uh, talk about Alexander Kojev from atheism to the aesthetization of truth. And uh, obviously, Elettra is a friend of us. She comes from University La Sapienza, and uh, we are uh, very eager to hear what she says about Alexander Kojev and someone else <laughs> we will not tell you in advance <laughs> thank you so much for being here so thank you thank you Ma <clears throat> massimo uh, it's, it's okay oh, yeah. uh, thank you very much uh, marco fironi and uh, yeah see sí, see sí, grazie sí. <laughs> okay Thank you, thank you Massimo and Marco uh, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here to speak about Alexandre Kojav with you. So the title of my presentation is From Atheism to Aesthetization of Truth. And as promised, I will start with atheism with a prime, a premi, premise. In the introduction of the reading of Hegel, Alexandre Kojev interprets the Hegel's phenomenology, phenomenology of the spirit as narration of the origin of human being. But in a letter to Kojev on 1955, Carl Schmitt defines this interpretation an atheistic anthropology. Starting from this definition, my aim today is to go back to the origins of this atheism. That is, in the first part of my talk, I will focus on the Kojev's text on atheism, and then I will face his famous interpretation of Hegel. If Kojev's lecturers <clears throat> of the phenomenology could be interpreted as an atheistic anthropology, as stated by Schmidt, <clears throat> sorry, it's crucial to focus the test on atheism. He wrote in Russia in 1931 and published in French translation only in 1998 three decades after the author's death. Marco Filoni and I edited the Italian translation published in 2008. According to Kojev, atheism is a philosophical problem and not simply a secular response to the religious problems. The denial of God's existence does not come from a pacified condition, from a silence on the religious problem. Rather, it faced the very question on negation, which essentially characterizes human life. The test on atheism is influenced by the theology inherited from Russian philosophers and from the Oriental studies but also the impact of Husserl's and Heidegger's reflections is crucial in Kojev's work. I refer, for example, the public lecture given by Martin Heidegger at the University of Freiburg on 29 July in 1929, which was published many years later with the title Basist Metaphysique but that was already well known in the 30s. The fundamental philosophical question in this text is precisely the problem of negative, the nothing which is more original than not as logical negation. Heidegger's text does not address the problem of atheism. On the contrary, he refers to the biblical doctrine of, of the creation from nothing, beginning so a dialogue with theology. 
but also other fields of research was involved in this discussion. In the same year, Alexander Kozhev writes Hatism, Rudolf Carnap takes part in the discussion, criticizing the way Heidegger introduces the noon nothing into his discourse. From Carnap's point of view, the entire prolusion is a classical example of a meaningless metaphysical discourse. I think that Kozhev's text on atheism constitutes a sort of close dialogue with Heidegger's Freiburg prolusion. It is not by chance that he quotes this text in some key passages. The atheist denial of God's existence reveals the question of nothing so crucial in the Heidegger's prolusion. In order to understand the philosophical approach to atheism proposed by Kozhev, it is fundamental to focus the, the perspective of the pre-categorial givenesses of the categorial forms the pre-categorial givenesses is first elaborated by Husserl and then taken up by Heidegger. According to Husserl, the logical form of judgment has a pre-categorial foundation, which is what is originally given. This fundamental issue posed by Husserl in phenomenology phenomenological terms was taken up and translated by Heidegger in ontological terms. In Basist metaphysics, Heidegger affirms that not only being, but also nothing is originally given and not simply construct in a logical judgment. Starting from this perspective, Kozhev analyzes atheism focusing in the ontological truth of the atheist's position, albeit contradictory from a logical point of view. The atheist denies the existence of God and asserts that beyond the world there is nothing. The paradox of this position lies in the fact that also the nothing does not exist from its point of view and therefore cannot be given as an object, it is expressed. Or rather, its givenness is expressed in the absence of givenness. Then, what is at stake in the atheist position is not just uh, the rejection of the divine, but something even more problematic. That is, the paradoxical and constitutive possibility of the human being to reveal the presence of what is absent. The givenness of nothing is effect. Kozhev's interpretation of atheism is developed from a, an anthropological point of view. Atheism is not an animal condition. It originates as human problem, or rather, it is at the origin of omination. The anthropological assumption at issue in atheism is not about what human beings are, but about the origin of human experience of negative. The negative from which the atheist can assert that beyond the world nothing is given. According to Gojev, the first human experience of negative is the experience of death, expressed through the mood of the fear for the own end. If human beings were able to have an, an unambiguous animal-like defense reaction in face of death, they could not be atheists. 
nor could they express their condition in different ways allowed by the human language. There is, no, there is not a single way to express the fear of death through, through human language, nor there is a unique name that can simply describe the animal cry. The human, the human world can only replace the animal cry. This substitution is like a leap into the void, into the nothing that characterizes the atheist experience and more originally the human life. In this sense, the givenness of nothing from which Gojev's reflection on atheism starts, that is the fact that beyond the world nothing is given, is not simply an absent of the given, a substantial nothing, so to speak. The experience of the atheist that takes shape in the givenness of an absence brings into light the constitutive and paradoxical possibility at the origin of human being, the possibility to reveal the presence of the absent. This is the question Kochev addresses also in his lectures on Hegel. In the lectures at the Ecole Pratique des Autitudes in Paris, which took place from 1933 to 1939, Kochev not only read the phenomenology of spirit as a modern narration of the origin of human beings, but also, as Carl Schmitt argues, in terms of an atheistic anthropology underlying Hegel Hegelian science. In this sense, what is at stake in Hegelian phenomenology is not the deification of human being in absolute knowledge, which would follow the death of God, but rather the human finitude without God. According to Gojev, this condition is connected to the obscure drives that human beings share with animals, but which become anthropogenic in so much they does not find satisfaction in the attainment of what they need because they are desirous. Desirous for desirous, desirous for nothing. The desire of desire as desire for nothing reveals the constitutive and paradoxical possibility that lies at the origin of human being, namely the possibility to express the presence of what is absent, connected to the givenness of nothing inherent to the experience of the atheist. In the case of the anthropogenic desire, it is a stake the animal internal to the human being. In the other case, it is a stake what is external to the night as divine. An ontological, I'm sorry, thank you. An ontological lack seems to be at the origin of human spaces. A gap, an absence to be filled. This, after all, is the most famous interpretation of Kojev's concept concept of desire. But this lack appears also as an opening, in so much it is not only an absence, but it is the presence of an absence. 
According to, to Kojaev's reading of Hegel, this presence of an absence is inscribed in the nature of human desire, transforming the bio biological plan common to living beings and converting the desire in, uh, into another desire. Not a thing, but the very existence of another in the absent form of his desiring. This implies a constitutive sociality of human reality that moves from the plurality of desires. This sociality is fundamentally associated with a conflictual tension specific of human beings as political animals. According to Kojève, which reads Hegel, human desire is a desire for recognition and politics is the concrete situation in which the order arises as the real possibility of my negation, that for which to risk life in view of a self-determination. It is the life and that struggle, the struggle for recognition, according to Kojève, a struggle for pure prestige. It is the Hegelian master-servant dialectic at the core of the Kojavian reading of the phenomenology of the spirit. An existential foundation of polemicity inherent in social relations characterizes his interpretation and shows a deep affinity with Smith's definition of the political expressed express in the famous distinction of friend and enemy. The point for me is that uh, this connection, the connection between desire and death that characterizes his Hegel interpretation, Hegel's interpretation is also present in the text on atheism. Here, that as the original experience of human finiteness and therefore as the givenness of nothing and denial of gold is not the simple end of human existence, but potentially always also present as latent possibility of mutual murder. In the Hegelian anthropog anthropogen anthropogenic uh, framework of the struggle outlined by Kojev, this latent destructibility is rooted in the antinomian structure of desire, which characterizes the Hegelian concept of history, and that characterizes the Hegelian modern institution of state. Within this framework, however, an aspect emerges that should be not that should not be underestimated. The desire of desire does not end in the conflictual search for a recognized identification, because the nothing from which it originates exceeds the closed space of recognition, circumscribed in the agonistic area. It constitutes, rather, its condition of possibility. And then, how to interpret the end of history at the heart of the Kajev's perspective? As it is well known in Kajev's reading, at the end of history, when human desires is fully and definitely satisfied, post-historical animals of the species of Homo sapiens appears. They become content with the immediate enjoyment. They are content with the enjoyment of the well-being to which the globalized state has accustomed them, transforming the right to kill, which is 
at the origin of recognition characteristic of the classical sovereign power into a biopolitical power, as we could say today, the power to let life. As it was as it is well known, the Kojevian paradigm has had some success in the so-called postmodern era, especially between the ex-communist disillusioned with Marxism or between liberal conservationists, often to confirm, to confirm the end of any possible change in a totally self-centered view of the so-called global norm. Among the participants to this discussion, there is Jakob Taubes, the original interlocutor of Carl Schmitt, which proposes an eccentric and uh, um, an alien position. Taubes as I invited Koshev to Berlin in 1967 at the glowing Frey University during the student movement's protests. As Taubes notes in the provocative story of his, re on his relationship with Karl Schmidt, Koshev comes to Berlin from Peking, and when he proposed him to book his return trip, he said, to have the intention to go to Plattenberg by Schmidt, because there is not one else in Germany worth talking to. This is the story. In the summer semester of 1982, Taubes organizes a seminar on the aesthetics in post histoire. The test of the seminar appears posthumously in a FS3 for Margarita von Berentano, his wife. His wife. The title of this test is the Aesthetization of Truth in Post Histoire, Aesthetisierung der Wahrheit in Post Histoire. The interruption of the progress of history, of the history as progress, is at the core of the perspective of the end of history. This perspective takes seriousness out of history, leaving a nihilistic conception of life, that is, an aesthetization of truth, to use the, the Taubes words. But what is more interesting in the Taubes text is the fact that he outlines the perspective of the end of history, revealing how true meaning and purpose have never been intrinsic in the, to the world and to history. They have always been human creations, works of heart. Tracing the development of this idea from Nietzsche to Heidegger, Taubes focuses on the aesthetic conception of the world that Kojev, in the famous note added to the text in 1963, attributed to the Japanese and so as a possible future for all. Now, in conclusion, my question is, is the aesthetization of truth still our experience today? We cannot deny that we are still in the age of the society of the spectacle, to use another famous expression. But can we still talk about the end of history? Many events seem to disprove this, not last the war, the war in Ukraine, and then how to interpret this contradiction. Perhaps on the one side, we can, we can say that aesthetization of truth is still our experience, 
just think of the use of the new technologies related to the artificial intelligence. On the other side, however, something new emerges, something that does not end in the end of history. It seems to me that what is at the end today is the idea of a unique and one directional history which characterizes the Hegelian perspective. Today, what definitely emerged as simulacrum, as a bad work of art, is the history as the unique narration of the events. Despite all difficulties, I think that the time is ripe for different histories and different narrations. Finally, the opacity that, according to Gojev, characterizes the capacity of negation at the origin of human condition is no longer conceived as a lack to be filled. Maybe this opacity begins to find new forms of expression. The expression of new voices, the voices that ex of the excluded from the one dominant modern narration of history. So I hope at last so. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Elettra, for this talk. And uh, we'll, we'll discuss it later on. I guess we can go on. It's time for Ovidio. You, were, you weren't here. <laughs> so Ovidio Sanchez uh, coming from very far, <laughs> from the Universidad Diego Portales de Santiago del Chile. And uh, is we'll talk about uh, Kojev's concept of recognition from metaphysics to politics. Please. Or the other way around. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want first to thank Marco for the kind invitation, um, also to the university for making all this possible, and also to you all for, for being here. Kojev's concept of recognition, then. The concept of recognition is undoubtedly one of the central tenets of Kojev's philosophical discourse and one of his most abiding theoretical concerns. The term recognition is used by Kojev extensively and in a wide variety of contexts, going from his philosophy of history to his anthropology, from his political theory to his epistemology, from his phenomenology of law to his ontology. By virtue of its pervasiveness, this concept possesses a, a strategical function insofar as it allows us to bring together different strands of analysis and to articulate the various registers in which Kurjev thought unfolds. Submitting this concept to close critical scrutiny, reconstructing the way in which Kurjev broaches the question of recognition, may thus appear as a privileged way for illuminating the focal center of his oeuvre, for capturing the overall trust of his theoretical project, the distinctive philosophical insight that organizes his manifold inquiries. Now, the question of recognition has also recently attracted substantial philosophical interest and plays a prominent role in contemporary debates, especially in the works of authors belonging to the third or fourth generation of the Frankfurt School or affiliated to what has been called pragmatist or Pittsburghian neo-Hegelianism. When offering a historical reconstruction of the question of recognition, these authors, the authors working in these theoretical settings, mention Kurjev's interpretation of Hegel and even at times admit that the formula desire for recognition is a Kojevian conceptual innovation. However, they barely discuss the details of Kojev's position, 
when they do not straightforwardly dismiss it as this burden with metaphysical presuppositions that supposedly render it inept to contribute to contemporary discussions. Worse still, sometimes his position is simply misconstrued. In his recent book, published in 2021, Recognition, a chapter in the history of European ideas, Axel Honneth states that, I quote, Alexander Kozhev first brought the expression the desire for recognition to prominence by placing it at the center of his interpretation of the chapter on master and slave in his famous lecture on the phenology of spirit, in which he interpreted the desire for the desire of the other as a specifically human need for recognition. Kozhev did not, however, give us a clear sense of what could be meant by such a need, end of quote. While this last assertion alone is problematic, for Kozhev de devotes extensive analysis to bringing to salience the peculiarity of the desire uh, for recognition and from separating it from any form of natural need, Honneth's further development showed that he has not paid sufficient heed to Kozhev's developments of, on this issue. Indeed, when Honneth attempts to circumscribe Hegel's position, on, on this question, on the question of recognition, by delimiting it from the views formulated within the English empiricist and the French moralist tradition, he does nothing more than to restate the basic outlines of Kozhev's interpretation of Hegel. For Kozhev has forcefully brought out that the desire for recognition can by no means be assimilated to a sensual need or natural desire. I quote uh, again Honet, it is obvious that the author of the Phenomenology of Spirit and the Philosophy of Right did not have in mind just any empirical tendency, sensual need or natural desire. Such factual desires play an important role in Hegel's construction of objective spirit as he believed that every social order must always also be capable of, of satisfying our given historically refined needs. But when it comes to recognition, he could not have meant an object of the natural sensual desire of subjects, for recognition is desired for the sake of realizing our rational subjectivity." End of quote. Now, the gist of Kozhev's discussion on the desire for recognition turns precisely around this distinction, and he clearly asserts the, that the quest for recognition pursues an essentially non biological end. Robert R. Williams, in his monograph on the problem of recognition in Hegel and Fichte, states that, I quote, Kozhev overlooks the point that phenomenology is to serve as the introduction to Hegel's system. In, constru in construing the phenomenology as an existential anthropology, Kozhev passes over the logical deep structure and its relation to the Gestalt and des Bewusstseins. Any reading, however brilliant, that, sur that suppresses this basic systematic point is unreliable. The phenomenological observer must not be collapsed into the natural consciousness, nor phenomenology into anthropology." End of, end of quote. Now, in this passage, Williams is merely rehashing the widely spread view according to which Kozhev interprets Hegel in an anthropological key. Now, it is true that Kozhev maintains that the phenomenology of spirit is an anthropology, but for him, this simply means, against the right-wing Hegelians, that phenomenology is not a theology, that the spirit whose configurations phenomenology examines is humane and not divine. Moreover, although he does not devote the same amount of attention to the logic, nor does it offer a, a thorough commentary of it, Kozhev does provide sufficient indication as to the architectonic relations between the two books and as to the overall trust of Hegel's philosophy. Let me quote a fairly long passage from the first appendix to the introduction from the dialectic uh, of the real. I quote uh, Kozhev, like all genuine philosophy, 
Hegel's science is developed on three superposed levels. First, it describes the totality of real being as it appears or shows itself to real man who is part of the, le of the real, who lives, acts, thinks, and speaks in it. This description is made on the so-called phenomenological level. The phenomenology is the science of the appearance of spirit, that is, of the totality of real being, which is revealed to itself through the discourse of man. So this is anthropology, but we all we still have two other levels. So I, I continue with the, the quotation. But the philosopher is not content with this phenomenological description. The philosopher also asks himself what the objective reality, Wirklichkeit, that is the real, natural, and human world, must be in order that it appears in the way, in order that it, it appear in the way in which it actually does appear as phenomena. The answer to this question is given by the metaphysics, which Hegel calls philosophy der Natur and philosophy des Geistes. Finally, going beyond this level of metaphysical description, the philosopher rises to the ontological level in order to answer the question of knowing what being itself, taken as being, must be in order that it realizes itself or exists as this natural and human world described in the metaphysics. And this description of the structure of being as such is made in the ontology, which Hegel calls logic, end of quote. Now, if we read this text with sufficient attention, it will become manifest that while Kozhev does indeed consider the phenomenology to be an anthropology, or rather an anthropology advancing towards an anthropotheology, for the perfect man becomes God, as we have seen earlier today, he does by no, no means claim that the whole of Hegel's project is reducible to such an anthropology. On the contrary, on his account, the philosophy of nature analyzes or should have analyzed if Hegel were true to his own fundamental insights, a world bereft of any human trace, while the logic lays out the general conditions of intelligibility whose discovery depends indeed on a certain development of human culture, but quite themselves irreducible to human culture. However, the range of categories of the, lo the logic can explore is profoundly altered once human reality emerges in the world. If there is an anthropologic or a humanistic kernel in Kozhev's thought, this does not amount to the fact that philosophy is reducible to anthropology, but rather consists in claiming that the coming about of humanity or of spirit fundamentally alters the general ontological conditions. The emergence of relations of recognitions between humans modifies the ontological landscape, it introduces a profound transformation of the pre-existing ontological picture. And even more strikingly, it does it twice, through the emergence of the desire for recognition and through the satisfaction of the desire for recognition. So there are two ontological revolutions performed by the human being. Um, one that gives rise to a dualist, and one, uh, this is a term of my uh, uh, making uh, of a trialist. Moreover, to continue um, the, the comment of this quotation, at no point in his interpretation does Kozhev collapse, as Williams pretends, the phenomenological observer with the natural consciousness. To the contrary, the phenomenology is written from the perspective of the sage, of the wise man, a perspective which is clearly shorn of any immediate links with that of the natural consciousness. Now, to go to the, th the, the third author I, I want to mention, in his recent study, Recognition and the Human Life Form Beyond Identity and Difference, Heike Ikehemo, a Finnish-Australian author, one of the most important authors on the, on the question of recognition today, admits that, I quote, Kozhev did, especially in France, but not only there, probably more to bring the, the theme of recognition to general attention than anything written by Hegel himself. End of quote. Despite this acknowledgement, 
Ike Heimo does not delve into the specificities of Kozhev's take on recognition, indicating that, I quote, it's kind of funny, I will only mention but not discuss Alexander Kozhev, end of quote. However, we may wonder whether a confrontation with Kozhev's position would not have been in this context, in the, in the context of Ike Heimo's discussion, not um, at least instructive, if not even compelling. For while Ikehemo relies on, upon the presupposition that, I quote, recognition is distinctive of what I call the, the life form of human persons, or in short, the human life form, therefore the title recognition and the human life form, the theoretical ambition embedded in Kozhev's concept of recognition is more wide-ranging, insofar as it does not presuppose the already constituted human life form. For Kozhev, there is no given self or self-consciousness, no human life form previous to engaging in the quest for recognition. Kozhev's master thesis is precisely that with the coming about of the desire for recognition, a new mode of being, a new ontological kind has emerged. His theory of recognition is meant to account thus not only for the distinctive structure of self-consciousness, for its ontological configuration, but also for its emergence into being, for its ontogenesis. Uh, so the, the, um, what we uh, see in his discussion of chapter four in, in the Philology of Spirit is also an ontogenetic discussion. He does not simply attempt to show that through the emergence of the desire for recognitions, humans are awakened into consciousness of, this, of themselves as free and rational beings, rather and more radically, it is this desire that genetically constitutes us as the beings that we are. Now, after, um, after this say, bird eye view of how um, Kozhev's um, take on recognition is received in, in, in the today's discussion, I think we may say that delineating the outlines of Kozhev's nuanced understanding of recognition, doing, doing justice to its internal coherence, may allow us not only to get a firmer grasp you know, of the, the heart of his philosophical project, but also to dismantle the prevalent prejudices regarding his position and to vindicate the enduring relevance of his philosophical project. The conviction that underpins my, my paper is thus that Kozhev can offer us a re robust theory of recognition that makes him a precious and compelling figure in the contemporary debate on recognition. Now, as I said at the beginning, Kozhev's concept of recognition is an overarching and multi-layered category operating in a plurality of fields and intervening at various levels of analysis. Although these registers are interlocked, we can distinguish analytically the following ramifications of the concept of recognition. It is a non-exhaustive list, but I have singled out seven fields in which the concept of recognition appears in, in Kozhev's work. First, recognition is for Kozhev a condition of self-consciousness. To be a self and to be conscious of oneself amounts to be engaged in a recognitive relationship. Second, recognition constitutes the normative requirement for a truly or an accomplished intersubjective relation. There is no real intersubjectivity without reciprocal recognition. Thirdly, the desire for recognition has a decisive bearing on Kozhev's concept of history. It is the phenomenon, the, the desire of recognition, for recognition that triggered the coming about of history. It is also the, the same phenomenon the phenomena that it is its driving for, force and its telos. In a fourth sense, the universal and homogeneous state is characterized by the fulfillment of universal recognition. Thus, human emancipation amounts to universal recognition. Fifth, the difference between the three juridical regimes discussed in the sketch of a phenomenology of law is given by the kind of recognition each regime puts in place, right? So recognition defines the kind of juridical uh, regime. Sixth, Kozhev even uses the concept of recognition in an epistemic sense, 
in this epistemic sense, recognition amounts to intersubjective confirmation. We can find traces of this in the debate with, with Strauss. As such, recognition sets the standards for assessing an epistemic claim, a claim to truth. Thus, recognition it was, it is what enables the transition from subjective certainty to genuine knowledge or objective truth. The truth of a claim is measured by its successfulness, by its capacity to achieve intersubjective recognition. Finally, the concept of recognition is meant to illuminate the distinctiveness of the human being, what sets the human being apart from the merely natural entities. It is the emergence of the desire for recognition and the attempt to realize it that marks the transition from the animal species Homo sapiens to humanity as such, and it is the complete and perfect satisfaction of this desire that brings about an end to humanity. Thus, Kozhev can unreservedly take up Hegel's concise formulation in his 1805-1806 Jena Lectures on Real Philosophy, where uh, Hegel abruptly states that der Mensch ist Anerkennung. In Kozhev's translation, this is, man is nothing but desire for that. Now, despite the wide spectrum of themes covered by this concept, it is undoubtful that the originary scene of recognition, the conceptual moment setting the stage for all his further developments, is to be found in the analysis Kozhev offers of the fourth chapter of the Phenology of Spirit on the autonomy and dependency of self-consciousness. It is well known that the dialectic of the lord and bondsman, or of the master and slave, occupies central stage in Kozhev's commentary on Hegel. The, an the analysis deployed there, there have been widely discussed, but I think it is important to grasp with sufficient clarity the tenor and the implications of, of Kozhev's position. And this so much so that, I mean, this is more important also because the accounts that are generally given of this moment are of narrative character. Interpreters generally focus on how the story of recognition unfolds. Its main episodes will be, uh, if we follow Michael S. Roth, the bloody battle, the reign of the master, the triumph of the slave. So it's like a, a a three-part uh, series, a, a, a trilogy of, uh, on three moments. While such a presentation does indeed capture some central elements of Kozhev's account, uh, Kozhev's account which actually precedes at times narratively, I think it's helpful also to explore this episode and its implication from a different angle and to unpack the structural elements embodied in this discussion. This will allow us to better understand the peculiar twist Kozhev gives to the question of recognition. So I will pin down in the, probably I think we have seven, eight minutes. Um, I think so, right? Yeah, around 10 minutes. Freedom, freedom. I will pin down, I will try to keep the, the time for, I might be tired. I will pin down four of the pivotal aspects of, um, um, uh, 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 this discussion and finish by indicating what I consider to be a tension running through Kozhev's account. I will do so by trying to answer four interrelated questions, very basic one. Why does recognition take time? What is the status of the defective forms of recognition? What exactly is it recognized? How does recognition occur? Now, the guiding assumption of Kozhev's analysis is that recognition cannot be achieved at once. It cannot be actualized immediately. The two freedoms or the freedoms of the two contenders cannot be actualized from the beginning simultaneously. This requirement can be fulfilled only through the inauguration of a process. Recognition is thus not a static concept, but entails within itself a movement, a dynamic movement. This is why the demand for recognition necessarily engenders history. It opens up a path, it gives rise to processual realization, to a gradual overcoming of the limitations of the initial situation. Or to put it differently, there is history, 
because recognition cannot be accomplished instantaneously because recognition can exist only as a processually as processually medium second now the desire for recognition is to be understood in the passive voice the desire for recognition is the desire to be recognized it is the desire that others recognize me what i desire is that the other behaves in a determinate way toward me however the relation of recognition has the peculiar character that we cannot properly enjoy it or receive it unless we also grant it to others for recognition to be valid i have to authorize the other to recognize me. however this symmetrical structure receiving something only insofar as we grant it cannot be substantiated as such in its purest or more adequate form from the very start it necessarily involves the emergence first of deficient forms the first products of the quest for recognition are one-sided forms of recognition the master that is recognized without recognizing the one who recognizes him the slave as the one who recognizes without being recognized thus recognition comes about firstly in impure deficient forms however it would be hasty to claim that recognition is symmetrically or is not or does not exist and hence to dismiss these forms and as not only in inadequate but as obstacles to recognition as forms of misrecognition rather could have claims i think that whereas an asymmetrical rela relation of recognition is not a genuine one it is an indispensable step in, est in establishing an adequate one the deficient forms while they indeed do not satisfy uh, the full-fledged concept of recognition nor do they provide um, a subjective satisfaction are preconditions for the complete realization of uh, recognition this means that recognition cannot be achieved without going through imperfect version of itself the sharp separation between recognition and misrecognition which is by the way pivotal cardinal for axel honet's work is here out of place Kuzhev insight would rather be that there are forms of mixed recognition that are conducive or that can be conducive to recognition third the desire for recognition exists in the horizons in the horizon of its satisfaction this thesis has two implications first recognition is not a mere yearning a striving without any possible fulfillment a desire of something unreachable second the desire for recognition possesses a normative content it is a demand that we place upon others we are calling upon someone to act in a determinate way with regard to me and we have an idea of what this acting could and would look like to put it differently this horizon of expectation is determined from the very start however if we compare Kerzhev's description we can realize that in the course of its processual development this normative content has undergone a considerable shift or displacement the recognition what one sought when engaging in the bloody battle is that of one's humanity that is of one's capacity to wrest herself free from the shackles of nature to annihilate in oneself the bio biological instinct of survival however what one expects from the universal and homogeneous state is not merely a recognition of one's humanity but of one's personality that is of one's free historical individuality to state it differently when engaging in the blood debate and one wants to have one's worth recognized but the very meaning of this worth valeur has changed in the first moment this word had the generic sense of humanity one wanted to have this his its own his own her own generic humanity recognized now one wants to have its full-blown individuality recognized. 
Fourth, each consciousness wants to be recognized by every other consciousness. This requirement, Kozhev says, cannot be fulfilled. Recognition can be achieved only through the mediation of an institutionally robust framework. Thus, the achievement of recognition involves the overcoming of the merely intersubjective standpoint and the emergence of an objective that is institutionally organized system of recognition. The kind of recognition that we might get is the one embodied in institutions that are molding subjectivities. The recognition of every citizen within the universal and homogeneous state secures inst institutionally everyone's political emancipation. Therefore, the achieved institution is not merely intersubjective, but rather institutional. But if recognition is realized not so much in interpersonal relations, but in institutional complexes, then we have to understand that recognition is not so much attitude dependent. It does not depend upon how we behave subjectively to the, with regard to the other, but it's rather status oriented. It, de it depends upon the status that we are granted within uh, an institutional framework. Now, I'm coming to an, to an end, and I'm simply well, um, OK, let, let me just take three more minutes, um, not to make the, 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 the end too, too much, too abrupt. So this were the four. Um, let's say, structural elements that I think define uh, Kozhev's take on, on recognition. Now, I think there is also a paradox in, in his position that has to do, as uh, you might expect, with the well-known thesis of the end of history. So, with regard to this question, um, we, we all know, know the, the question of the end of history is one of the themes that emerges from Kozhev's heretical reading of Hegel. Kozhev, Kozhev affirms not only the very possibility of an end of history, of the completion and cessation of the dynamic that has run through the history of, of the world, but even more that this end has already occurred, that, and that our world, our modes of experience, therefore bear the imprint of this end. Now, the affirmation of this already occurred end has two aspects. Firstly, it consists in assessing that the project of a radical emancipation of the human being, which has constituted, according to Kozhev, the driving force of history, has indeed been achieved. That the ideals that organized the radical revolutionary project of the past have been realized. Or to put it di differently, um, there is, uh, in, uh, at the end of the day, um, the, the, um, the desire for recognition has been uh, completely satisfied, have, has been fulfilled. But secondly, precisely because history has, uh, has, been, has fulfilled its promises, precisely because history was a, su successful, a success story, and the emancipatory project has become reality, the playing field for human action has been definitely closed. No true ideal is available to us anymore. We would thus be living in a kind of a posthumous world where nothing fundamentally new can come about, where no creative action in the true sense of the world will be conceivable. Our ex existence will be thus posthuman, given over either to the unbridled and immediate pursuit of pleasures, jouir sans entrave, or at best to a constant recollection of the past acts of the spirit, to the incessant work of archiving, treasuring, safeguarding, preserving, and ultimately you know, musealizing the places and documents that bear witness to the deeds of past humanity, that bear the imprint of genuine human action. So our contemporary ethos would therefore be defined by this constant oscillation between the quest for pleasure and the concern for preservation between the nightclub and the museum. Now, this, of course, engenders 
a fundamental tension in Crozet, right? Because on the one hand, um, if the end of history is to be thought through the category of achievement, what is therefore uh, achieved is what, for instance, uh, Marx calls the regnum homini, right? The reign of man. That is a, a complete uh, realization of, of human possibility. But if, on the other hand, this end is also a, a cessation, is a deprivation of essential human resources, then we have the impression that we assist to a fall of the human into something like an animal race. And there are sufficient indications in, in his uh, work for this. But then if we follow the, the theological uh, inspiration of, of Crozet's thought, what this means, we have seen it also in his reading of Renan, right? The, the post-historical soldat Bru is wandering like a god between the mortals, right? So when the desire for recognition is satisfied, what do we get? Do we get a fulfilled, complete Egyptian humanity? Do we get a sort of an animal-like uh, realm? Or do we get something like this voyou des oeuvres, which uh, are actually gods among us? Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you very much, Ovidiu, for this wonderful talk. And uh, I guess we can, we're going with the Lukhakhe. Um, so, that we make a, a wonderful, enormous, pluvious discussion after the break. And uh, Jorge Varela, he comes from the Kingston University in London, and the title is of oh, his uh, speech is Kozhev's post-communal politics. Wow, and I guess I should move from here, otherwise you won't see anything because of my hair. <laughs> Um, thank you for organizing this. Sadly, it's about to, to end, um, and I have the pleasure to be the last one. Um, okay. Is it good like this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so um, in 1940, Walt Disney Productions released its version of Pinocchio. Our current perception of the story is largely informed by this version of, or, 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 by, by, by this movie, um, and not by the original 1883 story by Carlo Collodi. Um, but if we compare this movie with the 2022, actually there came out two um, versions of Pinocchio in 2022, but I only watched one. Um, uh, but, but this version, the Disney version of uh, 2022, almost completely co copies the script of the 1940 version. But we will notice that there, there are a few variations of tonality in the two versions. Um, today, I will not advance a comparison between these two, um, nor the differences be the difference between either of these and the 1883 book. Um, uh, to grasp to to grasp the feeling of the 1940 movie that I want to focus on today, it is enough to refer to the puppet show scene. Um, so, as we all know, Pinocchio was an automaton which expressed the desire to become fully human. Um, in the famous chorus of this, uh, of this scene, Pinocchio sings, and I won't sing it because I'm not able to follow rhythm, but 
Uh, so he says, I've got no strength to hold me down, to make me fret or frown me, frown me down. I had, I had strings, but now I'm free. There are no strings on me. Um, so the song tells the, the, the tale of an already accomplished autonomy. Um, unlike all the other puppets that appear in the show, Pinocchio is not controlled by the greedy businessman Stromboli. <laughs> I will not try to delve uh, into all the layers that appear in this image, uh, but uh, I, I want to emphasize something that is relevant for my discussion today. Um, there are a few geopolitical references that appear in this scene. Um, al alongside Pinocchio's song, there is a parade of stringed puppets representing several collective entities. English beef eaters, uh, Dutch milkmaids, French cabaret dancers, and Russian squat dancers. Um, um, I would like to remind you that three years after the release of Pinocchio, Walt Disney produced and distributed a propaganda movie called Victory Through Air Power. Um, while in 1940, when the um, Pinocchio movie came out, the US were, uh, were not yet fully involved in World, World War II, the context clearly already impacted on the mental, mental, mentality behind its production. So the geopolitical aspect should not be taken as an over-extrapolation of the scene. Uh, Disney was effectively uh, engaged in, in, in this, um, in, in, in the mood that surrounded the events of the day. Um, uh, so Pinocchio's achieved independence stands in contrast to the supposed authentic forms represented by dif different geopolitical projects. So each of them representing a national identity. And Pinocchio is the only one who only represents himself as an individual, uh, clearly expressing um, American individualism, trying to affirm oneself by oneself rather than through uh, collectivities. Um, so Pinocchio's lack of strings does not only represent his independence from any overlord who pulls the strings of world politics, um, but, by but by remaining independent from any collective form, form of authenticity as well, he is fully independent at both levels, uh, uh, individually for himself and for others, for the world. Um, I already said this. Um, yet, Disney's take on Pinocchio's so Pinocchio story is not a mere apology for American individualism. At the start of the scene, uh, Pinocchio interrupts his son right at the start by stumbling on the stairs in his entrance on the stage. And the, if anything, Pinocchio's story is a succession of tribulations in his quest to achieve this self-proclaimed independence. At the end of the movie, Pinocchio accept, accepts his depend, dependence on Geppetto, thereby no longer self-identifying as a puppet and abandoning his quest for independence. Um, so thereby achieving a certain form of community in private life. Um, what I want to take out of, uh, of, it, uh, of this scene is the, thematiz the thematization of an intrinsic confrontation between anthropology, an anthropology of authenticity, authenticity and community collective forms of organization of humans expressed here by, 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 by their form of dressing. Um, the, these, um, which at the time were characterized by multiple attempts, at the time, so at the historical time, not in the movie, by multiple attempts to constitute a new man, a new fascist man, a new communist man, um, um, a new anthropology, uh, generally from above. Um, Ultimately, ultimately, this relates to the decision on the fate of the world that due to the American retreat from the world scene after World War I was being manipulated by forces that remained, remained on the backstage. 
This portrayal of anthropology is not merely accidental. In 1924, Helmut Plessner wrote a short book in which he claimed that, for some time, time now, the alternative between community and society established by Tonys as a, as a well-known antithesis stands at the center of public discussion, especially in Germany. Plessner presented the quest for the achievement of community at the level of the state, at the, the level of the public scene, uh, as what he called radicalism, a proto-theory of totalitarianism. The term at the time hadn't yet been defined as a theory of totalitarianism. It was already used in Italy, first by the opposition, then taken over by the, the regime itself, but, but not as a theory that unified fascism and communism in a single theory. It was just a theory of uh, uh, a concept used for fascism. Um, for Plesner, the radical uh, nationalism, which he saw as being mostly embodied by Primo de Rivera's dictatorship in Spain, uh, and communism shared a common outlook by attempting to create a political sphere without internal conflict, without internal diversity. Um, for him, these theories or ideologies stood in an antagonism with a proper anthropology, which favored society where uneasiness and conflict would reign. In 1924, Plessner advanced a personalist anthropology to oppose the, uh, the radical uh, views of community. But from that point onward, he spent his career mostly trying to develop this anthropology, and he goes beyond this initial anthropology. Um, as we all know, Kozhev himself uh, is one of the inheritors of this tendency uh, to take human anthropology as a centerpiece for any philosophical system. However, rather than emphasizing Kozhev's anthropological reading of Hegel, I would just like to mention that his famous reading of the master-slave dialectic was first published in 1939 uh, in the prelude to World War II. As a matter of fact, when Kozhev published his commented translation of chapter four, of part of chapter four of the Knowledge of Spirit, he, he hesitated on which part to publish. So it was not clear cut for uh, Kozhev that it was this piece that had to be published. Uh, ju just to emphasize that the master slave dialectic is not necessarily the single uh, significant piece for Kozhev. This is not to say that the master slave dialectic was not significant for Kozhev, but that there were many other aspects uh, that, that were significant. Um, so what I would like to argue today is that the fact that he published the master slave dialectic is part of Kozhev's uh, increased emphasis um, on political discussions, and it will become uh, particularly important for the writings he will, for his writings in 42 and 43 to use the master slave dialectic as the, the, the point of departure for his analysis. Um, um, to understand the way that Kozhev come, comes into this debate about community and society, community, and anthropology. Um, um, I, I should emphasize that, that Kozhev's position does not come from a direct debate with the, 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 the discussion of, on community. Uh, but this debate on community were, were, was widespread, far beyond Plesner. Uh, we, can, we can just refer to a, couple, to a few uh, examples. Edith Stein, Simon Weil, Gerda uh, Walter, uh, and so on. There were lots of writers trying to conceptualize community at the time. Um, but Kozhev's argument doesn't appear explicitly in this form. So to understand uh, Kozhev's approach, we need to focus on his political phenomenological essays. Um, uh, and while his uh, phenomenological approach is regularly underplayed and undervalued, Kozhev, Kozhev published often uh, on phenomenology during the 30s, and from 1929 on, onwards, references to, to, to a phenomenology start to appear. So in 1929, in his uh, review of Quaire's doctoral thesis, he refers to who's, who's, who's presence, and he writes the, 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 the article uh, on uh, uh, philosophy and the Communist Party, in which he does refer to Heidegger explicitly. Um, um, so, and, and from then onwards, in, in 1931, when he writes his book on atheism, he already has a fully developed 
um, technological approach. Um, but key among uh, Kozhev's approach to phenomenology was his skepticism on the possibility of an intuition of essence. So essence, essences are not the point of departure for uh, a Kozhevian phenomenology, but what is arrived at through a phenomenological analysis. This gives a priority to what Kozhev terms variously as the factual in the book on atheism, behaviorism in the phenomenology of right, and in the case of the notion of authority, uh, it is uh, just called phenomenology. So the first chapter is just this, um, this initial step of, of uh, phenomenological analysis that reveals that there is an essence that informs facticity. Um, so this le uh, leads to a consistent privilege of the factical elements of human reality, but also on an ins insistence that the phenomenological analysis must center on the process of revelation of essences. So the, 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 fact, the, 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 the emphasis on revelation appears uh, over and over again when he's talking about, um, about his phenomenology. And so what's at stake is, for example, there is, this is, uh, I didn't complete the list, but this is uh, in the archives. He has a list of lots of uh, forms of authority that exist, uh, which are purely factical. It's, they are, they are, there is a huge array of events of authority that appear, but what he tries to do is to take these um, factical aspect and try to step beyond it, to, to kind of arrive at what actually makes this into events of authority. And so there is this table here, down, down here, in which he already is trying to make that step by reducing the amount of phenomenon of authority and by revealing uh, what is the essence of, essence of authority, in this case, expressed by temporal modalities. Um, um, but what I would like to emphasize about the, this insistence on, on temporal modalities by Kozhev um, is not only that time is central uh, in, in this presentation, but what is it that time is doing here? Um, and time is not only um, uh, temporalities are not only true representation of past, future, uh, present, um, but they are uh, expressions of the fact that what authority is doing is not only presenting itself uh, as something that uh, exists without the use of force uh, and that gets recognized. This recognition is already an expression of something more. And this, that is being ex this something more that is expressed is a sense of identity. It is an identity that is shared by a, a common tradition, a common present, a common future, a common project. And it is the sense of, uh, of identity that is expressed here that constitutes authority as the, the guarantee of community. Um, um, and, and so the recognition is not necessarily a recognition of authority, but the recognition of authority as uh, part of the collectivity to which one belongs. Uh, it is my past, it is uh, my future, uh, it's his emphasis. Um, to, to, to insist on, on how this connection with community is clearly present, um, in, in 1934, Levinas published an article in Revue Esprit, uh, where he uh, where he analyzes Hitlerism, and he, he, he emphasizes how uh, human rel uh, relation to historicity, historicity, um, is fundamentally uh, a relation to the irreparable, and and what uh, Nazism is trying to do, Hitlerism is trying to do, is to oppose and reject these the, these relation to temporality in this form. Um, I, I don't want to emphasize Levinas as much as the fact that in the following year, in 1935, um, Robert Etienne, and, and so there was a special issue on community in the Revue Esprit, and Robert Etienne publishes one article that derives directly from uh, Levinas' argument with a few corruptions, um, and he basically expresses that what is characteristic of uh, Hitlerism is a false approach to temporality. So this uh, attempt by Hitlerism to constitute a community is false, not because 
it tries to overcome this relation to time, but because it has a wrong approach to community, uh, to temporal, uh, to community and to temporality, therefore implying that a correct approach to temporality could lead to a correct form of community. Um, oh. Um, but but Kozhev goes beyond this. And so rather than staying at the fact that temporalities uh, are constitutive of, com of communities, Kozhev advances to an analysis of, of temporalities. And, and for him, what is clear is that um, after 1848, and this is a, a, a widespread argument at the time, that tradition disappeared. It's not, not everyone agrees with 1848, but it's widespread this idea that we lo uh, modernity lost access to tradition. It, is, it, it disappeared. Um, and so Kozhev says that the authority of the past disappeared. It, it, it is dead. The authority of the father is no longer existent. And what proceeds from here is that actually the relation to the future is also suspended because a, a relation to the future without the past is, is canceled. Uh, and he does say that in bourgeois society, the, these two temporalities disappeared. He does go again at an attempt to um, overcome this, but in the end, all of those attempts to try to base um, authority in other temporalities, he always presents them as having uh, serious limitations. And so what's at stake here is that this sense of um, um, a qualitative form of community uh, is put at stake by the crisis of temporality that is experienced as, uh, at the time. To confirm this, um, he proceeds to an analysis of the authority of the marshal and uh, the national revolution, uh, so the ideology of the Vichy regime. Um, and while he starts the argument by saying the marshal represents authority, then he says, okay, th these authorities are delegated and all that, once again, all of these forms of temporality and of authority fail to, to, to have any solid basis. And his argument in the end is that all that can be done is to have a simulacrum of, um, of temporalities, a simulacrum of the content of, uh, of, of community. And what, is, uh, what this says is not that authority disappeared or community disappeared, but it is that um, that which authority reveals is no longer the existence of a substantial community, it reveals that the essence, essence is absent. Uh, there, there is no e essence behind it. And I would like to, to refer to, to Petit Jean because there, there, are, there are a few authors who insist that Kozhev was uh, writing, a, was supporting the Vichy regime, which is debatable, it, it, it can be supported. But uh, if that was the case, um, uh, Kozhev would certainly be aware that this would be a, a, a fascist undertaking because in, in 1939, Kozhev attended a conference where, where Armand Petitjean presented his, his uh, view of the Nouvelle uh, Révolution Française. Um, uh, and in that discussion, Petitjean was accused of being a fascist. So there is no possibility that Kozhev would be defending this, uh, this national revolution without being aware of the, of the fascist connotations underlying it. Um, um, and so uh, to, 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 to go, to develop a little bit more this relation to fascism, uh, I would just like to refer briefly uh, to, to Georges Bataille's analysis of, of fascism, of Nazism, he had published in 1933, so before uh, Kozhev's lecture started. Um, and in this analysis, um, Bataille says that um, the, homogeneous society is always dependent on an heterogeneous element that comes in to, because homogeneous society is unstable and therefore it requires an heterogeneous element that always comes in to intervene to re reinstate homogeneity. Um, this can be seen very simply as uh, the Schmittian sovereign that through the, the state of exception reimposes order by the exception as the, the, the greatest affirmation of uh, normality. Um, but, but what Bataille tries to propose as an alternative is to propose a, a, an heterogeneity, a pure heterogeneity, an heterogeneity without relation to homogeneity. Um, 
and, and what I would like to suggest is that um, Kojeb's analysis of authority already points to, um, to the impossibility of heterogeneity. It is uh, because there is no qualitative element that everyone is pushed towards an homogeneous emptiness of uh, qualitative elements in community. Um, and, and the universal homogeneous state is a different form of representation of, the, uh, of this element. Oh, sorry, I was here, but I'm going to move forward now. Um, and so to, to confirm this, I will just refer briefly um, to the, the essay or, or the phenomenology of right. Uh, and, and one of the interesting things about the phenomenology of right, it is that it is actually, so it was written in year after uh, Kozhev wrote the, the notion of authority. Um, and, and it is a development of something that in the book on authority, Kozhev said it is, uh, that justice, legality, is the corpse of authority. And so it is significant that after presenting authority as, as no longer being able to advance its, its content, Kozhev decides to develop what he claims is the corpus of authority as a full essay, much more developed than the essay on authority. Um, and so here he develops a Schmittian. Uh, in, in the notion of authority, there are implicit references to Schmitt, but here there is a, an explicitly uh, explicit engagement, engagement with Schmitt. And in this case, um, Schmidt is used to, to express the constitution of um, the qualitative expressions of, um, of justice. Uh, the masters, um, so there is the master-slave dialectic uh, struggle, um, uh, but rather than being two consciousness fighting each other, groups are formed, and so the group that wins becomes the master, the group that loses becomes the slave. And therefore, two different forms of, uh, two different conceptions of justice are developed. The masters have a conception of equality because all of them are equal. All of them are uh, um, separating in their equality. Um, and the so in this case, it's not only the victor that writes history because the slave also writes his, its own history by developing a justice of equivalence in which the, the uh, rather than assuming that the slave uh, is recognized, they, they say that the, their subjection to the master is equivalent to the domination of the master. So the, here there are two antithetical uh, uh, conception of justice that create the conditions of unity of these two groups. It's no longer uh, national communities that are at stake here, but, but there is still an ideological element of, of constitution of these, of these communities. In, but what I would like to emphasize is that Kozhev builds the argument for the overcoming, for the superation of these antithetical elements. And so what he, he develops the, the, the conception of justice of equity, that would be the justice of the citizen, in which both elements are present. But, this is no, but, but the presence of both elements is the negation of both of them, because both of them can only be uh, conceived as absolutes. Equivalence and equality are negations of each other. And so uh, um, to quote here, the final justice of equity will no longer be a harmonious cohabitation of the previously antithetic justices, but the suppression of their particularities. So once again, just like in authority, it is the, the, the qualitative element of the ideological form that is suppressed. Um, so rather than arriving at the point in which both uh, forms uh, of justice live beside each other, both are denied and they are emptied out by creating a conception of justice that allows for multiplicity inside. But this multiplicity is a multiplicity of, of an homogeneous emptiness, um, of an homogeneous lack of substan substantial aspects of community. Um, and so if you look at uh, the essay that Kozhev wrote in 1945 on the, uh, the Latin Empire, uh, he talks about the political irreality of the nation state. Um, and this political irreality is not only due to geopolitical, the geopolitical analysis he offers, is also because the, uh, the substantive uh, element of nationhood no longer mobilizes anyone. And this is more explicit in the text that is called Project uh, 
Roger Kojevnikov that is in the archives, in which he, he goes a little bit more at this aspect. Um, so, so it is the, the emptying of qualitative, um, qualitative forms of being with others that is uh, the, the, um, the demand of the time. And so what Kojev is doing and demanding is that at this point, it is necessary to conceive of, of politics and of the, the, the state um, beyond um, quantitative forms of humanity. And so th that, that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge, and uh, we'll see each other for a thorough discussion in 15 minutes. Okay, very thanks. Ora si registrerà la conferenza. Okay, so I guess that now we can start discussing the three talks we had this afternoon. And uh, if anybody wants to start, Isa, please come. Yeah, thank you to, to everyone. Um, and also three very different at times complementary, at times conflicting positions. I think that's an interesting discussion um, coming along. So um, to George, I wanted to just um, ask, so you said um, you speak about post-communal politics, and I was thinking with Schmidt in mind, it's maybe post-political communities would be an interesting kind of inversion. And I was just uh, curious to see how exactly, against the background of what you spoke about, you see the relation between politics and community and community building, which is post-political. Um, and also, I was wondering how this ties in um, with Kozhev's contact and critical um, relation also to the Collège de Sociologie, Acephal, and all these conceptions of community, which are quite like mystical and um, esoteric. And I think it's also an interesting tension. And this question, I would also extend it to um, Eletra and video about um, just these visions of community which um, yeah which which I think unites the the three positions in a way um, so to, to start with the the, the part about post political communities um, I, I would probably suggest that most explicitly in the text on on right um, you, you can tell that um, what is achieved by the third position, uh, by this uh, justice of um, equity, is an overcoming of the, the opposition between friend and enemy. It's a cancellation of the opposition between friend and enemy. Um, which, uh, now the answer about whether that is to go beyond politics or it is to a foundation of a new form of politics. Uh, it is something that, that it is somewhat open to debate, but I would say that the text that follows, so the, the Latin Empire, suggests that what's at stake is a, a constitution of a new form of politics. And from, um, and, and with the Latin Empire, and in 47, Kozhev writes several texts that he talks about propaganda, I would suggest that maybe what's at stake is, is is this form of propaganda as possibly this leading form of new conception of politics that might be going on. But I, 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 I don't have a definitive answer about this. Um, but but I, I, I mean, but, but this is also kind of a constellation of a little bit of tradition of political philosophy, because Aristotle also said uh, that um, human association is an association of a different kind from what exists. Uh, in other animals, the Polish, 
is an association of a different kind, is difference of quality. Um, and, and so it's a suspension of that. In relation to the Collège de Sociologie, I try to suggest a little bit with, with my reference to Bataille that, that it is a little bit of a reversal with, with, with um, um, Bataille's emphasis on a pure um, heterodox uh, form that remains outside of homogeneous society. And, and Kojev is, is kind of the cancellation of the homogeneous society without the creation of these pure forms uh, that, that still are kind of the affirmation of the quality without, uh, or, or maybe just affirmation of the form. Um, but, but with Kojev, that, that, that is cancelled, uh, I would say. But yeah, I hope this is good. Thank you. <clears throat> Yes, um, I think that uh, in my discourse, the, the, the question of community, community is related to the question to the nothing, the, the, the issue about nothing that is uh, radical essential in the discourse of Kojav from my point of view, <clears throat> uh, about the fact that uh, so the, the desire that is uh, what has to do with uh, a common in so much is desire for its desire is uh, related uh, about um, to this uh, nothing that is not uh, uh, only um, an, uh, of something that not exist but is what relate the subject and in this sense, is we can say is the monus that intrinsic in the common, and this the, the dimension that Kojav maybe um, is thinking uh, um, um, in face to um, so um, criticize the the concept of Schmidt on politics, and in some way we. I think we can we could uh, um, talk about the fact that the end of history in Kashav is the end of the Schmittian idea, idea of politics and maybe an opening of a community that is related to this monos, to this Nothing that is not nothing, that is something that open the relation. I don't know if I answer. Um, well, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, if I want to, if I if I try to relate this question to my talk. Um, I will translate it in the following manner. Is there something like a community of recognition that will be just a community? Because everything depends on what we understand to be a community in contradistinction to other forms of, let's say, association. One could say, for instance, that a community is an association that is not necessarily institutionally mediated, but rather is articulated through a series of, let's say, informal um, binding links, you know, customs, patterns, shared patterns of actions, but which are not objectivized. Um, as um, as a law or, or, or as a as an institution, and I think one of my, the conclusions or the implicit conclusions of, of my talk is that um, universal recognition is the overcoming of a, of a community. Right? It's Kozhev talks about the state, or sometimes the, the 
universal and homogeneous state or sometimes the universal state and homogeneous society, right? But the point there being that there is an institutional framework that articulates um, the, the members of, of, of this um, association, right? So as such, the community will be always particular. When we want to get to something universal, we need this radical mediation of um, objective spirit that is of, of uh, a robust institutional framework. Hmm. But the problem is that this, uh, precisely this, uh, this paradigm is a end, a, a, term, a, a, a end for Kozhev, or? Yeah, so this being said, I, I do agree, uh, I, I do agree with you, and then we are actually at the heart of Kozhev's uh, description, diagnosis of the end of history. The end of history is tantamount to the emergence of the universal and homogeneous state, perfect, right? But then we could say, well, the end of history is also, or in, is, contains as implicit the dissolution of the state, right? Because the state, would you would say, well, the state, the state exists in plural, the state exists in, in as much as they can wage war against each other, in, in as much as they need to police their citizens, and, and so on. Um, so is it, is it really the end of this, the end of history if we still have an institutional framework? And, and so, so I think here we, we find one of the, the, the paradoxes of, of Kozhev's description and how could it be otherwise than paradoxical? Okay. Just yes. really quickly, I want to jump in because it's just based off of this. I'm sure Danilo is going to have a, have, a, have a more interesting question. No, but thank you so much. No, uh, I just wanted to follow up on this because um, there's clearly, we, we can, there, there's a little bit of uh, disagreements that are going on in this panel, which I think are interesting. At the, George's position seems to me is directly opposed to Danilo's position, even though there's also similarities. And I was not too sure, uh, sorry, oh, videos, videos. Uh, uh, and, um, I'm a bit tired after two days, really? uh, maybe. <laughs> and uh, and but the position. Uh, hopefully, I can get this question out. Uh, and uh, uh, Eletra, um, at the beginning, I thought you were more aligned with George because uh, your point of departure with the nothing. Um, now I'm not so sure after this last uh, last exchange, because um, it it appears that Ovidio, for the, the it's a it's a something that is a something at the end. If I, if I can put it that way. And Letra said, it's a nothing that is not quite a nothing. And it seems like George's is, is a something that really is a nothing at, oh. at the end. And, and I was wondering, I mean, it's too much to ask all of you to, to um, uh, uh, engage this question, but perhaps if, if you guys could engage this difference a little bit, like how, how do you think Ovidio, you would respond to George's position and perhaps how would George respond to yours? And if Aletheri you wants to say something as well. Uh, I will need more, more elements. So, yeah, I yeah, just, I, just I, can yeah. I, I absolutely can elaborate. I mean, for George's, in George's position, the universal homogeneous state at the end is, is virtual. It's a simulacrum. It, as he says, it lacks all substantiality. So these institutions that arise at the end in this state are, are phantoms. I mean, it seems like in your position, there's a great deal of substance. I mean, community is rich in, in the universal homogeneous state, the one you're depicting of universal recognition. Even though you guys both start, it seems to me, from this point of departure of a desire for desire, that it, for, for you, this desire for desire becomes something in the universal homogeneous mm -hmm. state. For George, it's this void at the, at the beginning, this desire for the desire that reveals itself in its nothingness. And, and it's remarkable to me how two seemingly, seemingly similar arguments can arrive at such two different, uh, 
different endpoints. Okay. So per perhaps it's too much to ask, but no, no, no but uh, no, I got it perfectly. So I would say um, first in in Hegley's, um, what is the the endpoint? Call it the end of history, universal state, whatever. It's absolute mediation, right? What what Hegel is saying, what Hegel and Kozhev are saying, oh, okay. what Kozhev says that Hegel is saying is that universal recognition is the best way for someone to be individualized, right? And this can be uh, traced back also, for instance, to how uh, Kant treats in the, the transcendental dialectic uh, this idea of the, the matters of the predicates, right? In order for, to have this thing now uh, perfectly singled out in the reality, you would have ideally to relate it to every other element in the world, right? And in this way, it will be perfectly individualized, right? Now, you can have this is a, a thing that is, let's say, indifferent to itself. It's sufficient to have relations. But if, if these relations are re reciprocal relations, then you end up with reality in, in, in the fullest, the full-blown sense, right? But I think this is what Kozhev is up to. I mean, if not, the end of, uh, of, of history is not a story about achievement, about fulfillment, right? So you have to, to, to get from a minus, from a desire, a uh, beance, uh, a gapping abyss, to something that is con concrete, right? This is what we are after, concreteness. Now, the question where I see that the difficulty is, how this, once this mediation is realized, what is the purpose of maintaining, let's say, the, um, the infrastructure of mediation, which is the institutional framework? I have the impression that for Kozhev, you still need to maintain the institutional framework, right? It's, it's not something you can get rid of, right? But then you can you can see uh, let's say a theoretical tension between this being really individualized and having to to maintain uh, to maintain the framework. But I think in what I'm saying, I I am more or less true to Kozhev's Hegelian inspiration. Now I I realize and I admit that this is probably not the only one that that his position is permeable to other, um, other influences, other insights. But let, let's say the, Kozhe, the, the Hegelian Kozhev cannot maintain that we end up with the virtuality. And um, when I, I saw this quotation, I think what it was in uh, Isa's talk uh, this morning about Agamben, so how he in, in, interprets this désœuvrement. Um, well, this is not exactly the, what the soldat Bru is doing. So, okay, he's counting the time and he cannot do it properly. Okay, good. But he's also doing uh, photographical frames, right? And in a certain sense, you know, Boris Groys's take on uh, Kozhev's photographs goes exactly in the same direction. So even Kozhev was a so, kind of a soldat bru, huh? gathering the uh, memories of humanity. That is a reconstructing uh, story. So there is one thing to do, we're not lost in virtuality. This is to retell, to constantly retell the story of, uh, of humanity, that is recollection. Sorry, I was a bit too long. So <clears throat> I will end up by giving a, a, a short answer because the, the full answer would be a different presentation. Uh, um, but uh, I think that one of the questions at stake here is uh, that Kozhev does <clears throat> effectively, constantly 
um, claim that there is this project that needs to be fulfilled um, and that it is being followed. Um, it, the, the, the problem is, uh, does he at the end say that the project that is realized is what was set up, set out to be achieved at the beginning? And, and there are constant contradictions in Kozhev. And uh, I mean, if I want to build my argument, I can just explore lots of contradictions between different statements and in in different formulations of of the same argument to claim that. I, what I'm arguing is there, but we can also kind of stay with with his more initial statements about the achievement uh, uh, or the, the achievement of recognition that supposedly would have to be uh, a recognition by other by other cognitions, but then suddenly is transferred to, to to the state that suddenly recognizes everyone without without being totally a mutual recognition between consciousnesses. Uh, so, so there are lots of these little steps that suddenly kind of move the goal and, and, and reveal that at the end, that which was supposed to be a substantial form uh, is emptied out. So, but what is emptied out is not necessarily the goal, is all of the institutions, all, all that was created in order to achieve it. Um, and so, what is shown at the end is this emptiness that is supposed to be the source of legitimacy of of, of the, the these entities that that in the end are supposed to recognize the the subjects or humans. Subject is not exactly the the, the term for here, for, 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 but. That, that is my step, but I will always go around this. And with Kozhev, you can always choose uh, statements that will contradict what, what, I, what I'm saying, but uh, I believe that there, there are lots of traces that perhaps that's not the whole story. <laughs> now, only to say that my interest is to um, focus the um, not so much uh, the intention of Kozhev, but uh, uh, more the um, historical effects of the, the idea of end of history. Mm. And through Kozhev, I think, it's possible to realize that this end of history is the end of one history, the so-called global north history. And in this sense, the, uh, there is some sources that maybe we can take from Kozhev to, uh, and, and Taubes make this a little, not so in, in, in so clear way, but a little, uh, to um, so to, uh, to um, poten potentiate is, is uh, intensify intensify um, one idea of uh, another way to uh, narrate history. This 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 uh, um, one directional history uh, is. And that, but this is only one history. This was this is my my interest in this discourse. In this sense, it is not true that uh, so the, the, there is no uh, possibility to change history to 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 change the the, the direction of the history. The, the, um, the historical effect of the idea of end of history was that of the uh, intensify the de intensify the history itself, and I think that the Taubes um, idea is to uh, re reuse a Benjaminian pers perspective of history as narration 
to um, so to to use the narration, the the aesthetization of the the the, the, the through and the history, not in the term of an neutralization. At the, uh, but in the sense that it is possible another another aesthetization, another narration. This is, I think, this was my my <laughs> my idea. Thank you. Uh, Daniela is waiting. It's been waiting long. Uh, yeah, thanks. I, mean, I have a f two remarks or question for 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 Uvidio. I mean, uh, very uh, helpful as usual. A uh, very helpful conceptual kind of precisions from you. Uh, that sounds like a trick question, but it's not because it ends up corroborating your point. How often? How often do you think the German word Anerkennung appears in Hegel's terminology of spirit? Not once. Not once. Because why? What does he use? He uses the word. Anerkennen, the verb turned into a noun, so it would be more appropriate, I guess, if people translated really literally to speak not of recognition, but of recognizing, and that really corroborates the processual aspect. You, uh, so uh, Anerkennung is not a state, it's an activity. Yeah, so we're talking about recognizing, that is sort of just a small aside. So the second point is, you mentioned Williams, who charges Kujev's supposedly anthropological theory of recognition with sort of falling back into natural consciousness. And I think what, 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 what happens there, what Williams does, of course, it's a very classic, dogmatic, Husserlian move. Because as Husserl confronted the rise of philosophical anthropology in Germany, um, he, uh, early 30s mostly, he wrote, uh, he issued what is famously known as an anthropologie verbot. And his argument was the same, that if you have this sort of conceptual apparatus of phenomenology, then philosophical anthropology will just appear as a as something as a as a form of as a return to natural consciousness that is unphilosophical. Yeah, and uh, having said that, I think I always try to show uh, in my PhD as well that, Kuzhev, and I don't know whether you find that convincing that Kuzhev is much more open towards philosophical anthropology than Husserl. I mean, I, what I try to show then is like he reviewed Max Scheler, he read Helmut Plessner. Uh, Helmut Plessner publishes in the Recherche Philosophique. So there's definitely an idea that he knows, uh, because I had this sort of friendly argument with Stefanos Gerolanos, because Stefanos always thinks when he uses the term anthropology, he actually dialogue, is in dialogue with Kant. I think it's much more specific with the recent 20th century philosophical anthropology he's in conversation with. Um, um, the third point, uh, because I mean that preoccupies all of you here, and I kind of feel relatively strongly about that is I was super grateful that you insisted on uh, or that you emphasized the institutional aspect of a process of recognition because if you if you if, which I think is absolutely crucial because if you leave it out Kujev ends up being just an existentialist or like a doppelganger of Jean-Paul Sartre and I was so frustrated because even the you know, one in this room but there's a couple of Kujev scholars who kind of still think that Kujev's is a sort of existentialist reading of Hegel and I spent the first 50 pages of my PhD just so because I went through all the sort and a lot of contemporaries thought of that that you find it Pierre Naville, Georges Canguillem, Gaston Fessard um, they all read Kujev as an existentialist to the point where Kujev gets really annoyed by it and complains to Carl Schmidt about it in his correspondence and and I uh, the only one the only one who kind of gets it that this is too easy and that's not that doesn't capture even half of his thought is Maurice Merleau-Ponty who's not particularly fond of Kujev so it's very surprising in his L'existentialisme chez Hegel it's a 1947 Le Temps Moderne article he says I just this one quote I quote la phénoménologie de l'esprit tel que Kujev l'a dit rend possible une philosophie communiste du parti ou une philosophie de l'état plutôt qu'une philosophie de l'individu comme celle de l'existentialisme so I think the desire for recognition uh, would be entirely ineffectual, as you said, I'm in complete agreement with you, if it weren't channeled by institutions, 
owned by the state and, and, and by law, of course. Yeah? The Kuzhev is not, Kuzhev is a statist Hegelian philosopher. He's not, uh, he, he's, he's a small part of him is existentialist, but these people who present the struggle for recognition in this sort of like, as if it's like a kind of a, a showdown at high noon, a Western, it's like recognition happens in and through institutions. And I think uh, even in the introduction to the Hegel, he's very adamant about that. So I was really glad uh, uh, that you emphasized that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, definitely agree. Um, I will react starting with the last point. So, so yeah, I think this is this is important to stress. Um, now, what I also wanted to show is how um, the content of the the normative content of recognition changes through its being mediated through history. So. It is true that we want the other consciousness to recognize us immediately, but then we, what we realize is that, so to, to take up the, other, the, the previous example I gave, is that of course we cannot get recognition from every other person, but we, what we can get is a universal recognition. For instance, um, each and every one of us is recognized, even if we're not uh, Italians, by the Italian state that's as human beings, right? So the Italian state is not just the state of the Italians. It is also, in a certain sense, the state of, and not just of Europeans, let's say now with the, the next institutional framework, but of all humans, right? So every human in the Italian state has a certain number of rights. That is, it is recognized. So this does not depend Okay, this can generate problems, and in, 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 and that this is very common in contemporary debates of recognition. Okay, I have the status, but the attitude of the states, or the attitude of the policeman, or the attitude of the person looking at me uh, in the street is is not one of recognition; it's rather one of misrecognition. And this is important, right? But then the Kozhev move w would be in a fairly antique fashion to say, well institution mo are molding behaviors, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's uh, the institutional, the, this last remark. And then with the anthropology for both, um, uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree. And even, I mean, it's Husserl and, so Husserl against Scheler and against Heidegger. Now this is how he, he, he reads, being in time. But then what is even more interesting is that also Heidegger has an, his own anthropology for good, although he recognized you know, that the question of what is uh, was is the mensch, what is the human being is of essential importance, one cannot um, one cannot reduce uh, philosophy to uh, to anthropology precisely because he has this naturalistic idea of what anthropology is. Or he, he understands uh, anthropology as being finally a branch of the natural sciences, right? Um, so there is this for both. Um, in in Kozhev, I think, so my point was to say that he has absolutely no difficulty in assuming this title for the kind of under, undertaking is doing. No, what I'm doing is an anthropology. So, this is it, no problem. Geist is um, the human understood in all uh, its historical manifestation. However, his point is that philosophy is not reducible to anthropology. So uh, we should have a big moment in, 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 in philosophy, which is anthropology. And he even at, at times equates phenomenology with anthropology, right? But then, as I mentioned here, you have also the metaphysic and the, the, the ontological level. So I think this is more or less. Um, yeah. May, yeah. Yes. Okay. So it, it, it's partly continuing the, the, the question of, um, in, in the end, what happens is this opening towards uh, what follows from Kozhev's thought? What, what, what are the potentialities that, that 
are enacted or not enacted or suspended by, by, by Kajiev. And I, I would say, uh, also trying to answer to the question of institutions, is that there are also other debates uh, that, that can become interesting here. And one of the things is in, in the Maurice Blanchot-Jean-Luc Nancy debate on community, Blanchot seems to be quite aware that the use of uh, désoeuvrement comes from Kojev. But Nancy doesn't seem to be aware of that. Uh, and one of the things is he seems he, he tries to use désoeuvrement as opposed to recognition. Uh, and he presents community as an alternative to totalitarianism. Uh, and so what I'm trying to rebuild here as well is a certain association between community and totalitarianism, to, uh, between uh, movements of ecstasies uh, and totalitarian movements. And, and, and Nancy goes exactly in the, in the opposite direction. He says that ecstasy is, is a form of community that opposes totalitarianism, that at the time he say, is arguing that liberalism is becoming the new totalitarianism. Um, and, uh, so but by doing this, I'm trying to go back to Kozhev in order to uh, uh, avoid these easy returns to communities as oppositions to, to, to institutions uh, and, and be aware that Kozhev was dealing with lots of these issues that can become quite relevant. In, in Jean-Luc Jean Nancy, I, I believe that he wasn't totally aware of, the, of these connections and I believe that he committed several errors and that's why in 89, Giorgio Agamben, when he wrote uh, Battaglie la Souveranita, if I'm not mistaken, he, he recalls when Walter Benjamin turns to, to Battaglie and says, Vous travaillez pour le fascisme. Uh, because what, what's at stake is this tendency towards ecstasies by, by, by Battaglie, then by, adopted by Jean-Luc Nancy, really copy lots of things that are happening at the time in fascist movements. And, and, and so we, it's these connections that I'm trying to explore of course, today I didn't touch in, in, in any of it, but uh, yeah, so, just so. So also to, to insist that, that the question of institutions come, comes back in, that we cannot say, oh, let's go to community and, and we, we avoided institutions. Yeah, Isa, I want to just. I just wanted to express them. Um, I was really happy that you later um, brought up this Jakob Taubes text, which I think hasn't really been received as widely in Kushev studies. Maybe I'm mistaken, but it's it's quite a marginal kind of text, and it's very important also for my dissertation and this whole idea of the aesthetic turn or something like that or in our perspective. And also, um, in I went to the Free University in Berlin, and there are all, in the archives there are all kinds of materials around these lectures that Taubes was involved in and they read Kozhev really quite extensively and there was also broad reception and like, even the German newspaper Tatz was um, writing like a weekly report about these seminars because they were so popular in the, in the 80s. So there's quite an important link between Taubes and Kozhev which I feel is not really that well explored yet. Also as a multi maybe directional sort of not even concrete dialogue, but just um, I would be curious to hear, hear you speaking about. Yeah, I think this is really um, a matter to explore because it's not, uh, there is not so many uh, research about this, uh, con this uh, relationship that was uh, obviously so complicated uh, first for um, because uh, there is uh, the, the 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 presence of Kant Schmidt and this was uh, the the uh, this is the interest but also the problem um, because uh, in the so in some way um, I think that Koshev uh, rep represents uh, from for Taubes uh, the possibility to rethink uh, history again, Kant Schmidt, uh, but also criticizing uh, in some way the the interpretation of uh, Koshev in so much the uh, history, the Koshevian history is the uh, so a new way to rethink the Hegelian history 
And I think that mm, in this connection, in this uh, line, is very important to take the presence of Walter Benjamin. That is not so related to Kojev that directly, I, I don't know, through Bataille, may, maybe, but it is, is uh, really important to, <clears throat> to understand uh, uh, the relation with, uh, with Karl Schmidt. And in this sense, so uh, there is a, a shadow, the shadow of messianism. That is, in, the, the question is, uh, there is a, a messianic sense of history in Kochev, in the, con in the uh, Kochevian concept of achievement, in some way, yes. From, oh, there is an important, uh, so an important um, background uh, of the or Russian uh, philosophers, Solovyev and, and so on. But the, uh, the, idea, the, the, the Taube's idea of messianism is in some way uh, precisely that to um, criticize a identification between messianism and achievement. Hmm? In this sense, Benjamin is important because the Benjaminian idea of dialectic is not a, a dialectic of the achievement. Hmm? And, this is, and this is precisely the idea of Taubes, not so clear, mm, not so, so uh, all, always the same, and this is a problem in, in Taubes' thought, but uh, so the, the, it is a really interesting, the interest uh, of Taubes to Kojev through Karl Schmidt from the uh, pers Benjaminian perspective of history. This is, I think, the, the question. I don't know. <laughs> May I give the word to myself? Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, I think Benjamin has an, uh, an opinion on Kojev, uh, and which is awful. <laughs> In 1937, he, um, yeah. he wrote to Max Horkheimer that he had seen a uh, conference held by Kojev at the Collège de Sociologie, yeah. and he actually realizes that this is a kind of sociology made in Moscow, sort of. I don't know if my uh, recalling is exact, but that's actually what he what he meant. And um, um, at the same time, uh, the, the 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 formula uh, of the uh, travailler pour le fascisme, no, which was not, not exactly that as recalled by Klosowski, and uh, is I mean is has been uh, struggled against so many times uh, during the uh the the 80s and 90s even by esposito and so on because they try always to save this uh sort of an anarchistic uh nuance given by blanchot nancy uh, of trying um, trying to find a way out of of the uh a communal way out of the uh totalitarian state even if identified with liberalism in its end, um, but the, yeah, the, 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 in that sense, Bataille has been saved by, <laughs> at least by Italian philosophers. Um, the, 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 what I would I would like to add, if I may, I may, yeah, yeah, is that yeah, this is Kojev is not is paradoxically or not is he is not a, a thinker of community at all. Right? Is that that could be uh, one of the main uh, 
main moments of discussion or or this of um, antagonism with Bataille. Bataille thinks that a community of nothing <laughs> is possible, uh, while Kojab is not interested in community. Uh, he doesn't think that through recognition you reach a community. Through recognition you see the start, the birth, the genesis of value, la valeur. No? He insists so much in, in his only published article on Mesure uh, when he speaks for the first time publicly of his interpretation of Hegel. That the, la chose la plus importante, c'est de devenir la valeur pour l'autre <laughs> qui te regarde. La valeur means that the, 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 that the birth of right, the birth of law, in a sense, which is institution, which becomes, in the end, the state, which and he's not interested in, yeah, there's the community of those who are friends against the community of those who are enemies, but that's, that's pretty obvious. And this is a very a simple banalization of, uh, of Schmidt's um, begrips as politician. Um, I guess that his, his true interest is in, is in society as an institution, an ice state. Um, Another point, I want, yeah, Belletros was right. The effects of the idea of the end of history, that's what we, we, are, we are supposed to, uh, to investigate. You know, this is, uh, well, I've already said this, this so many times, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's important to understand that from which perspective you talk about the end of history. Of course, if you're talking uh, from Marxian perspective, okay, the, the Reich der Freiheit, uh, that changes everything. But uh, Kojav has been interpreting that in a totally different way himself, and the uh, end of history has become liberalism, capitalism, okay, in, uh, in some ways. The, 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 the sentence of, uh, on the uh, sino sovietic uh, no? uh, the, 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 the China, China and the USSR together, uh, the USA are, <laughs> are, are the rich Chinese people. Uh, that, that orientates our reading of the end of history in some sense. And my question is, when I speak about so, so the sociology of the end of history, who can talk about things like this? The the uh, and, uh, the bored bourgeoisie. Who else? Who else can speak of uh, something like that? Really? <laughs> uh, why is uh, why is Kujab talking about the end of history? If uh, if just because he has nothing to do, just because he doesn't work, no working class would talk like like this. It's impossible. I mean, it's just a matter of distinction between Bataille and Kojev about the use of negativity. But the, the effect of talking to the, about the end of history has no sense apart from the, the capitalistic mythology that we can, we, we the technician, <laughs> have the chance to direct things to administrate things not in the Engels sense, uh, but in our sense, the bureaucrats, the Coupe Dominant, uh, and you, the people, keep on working, maybe less through, uh, through the uh, fact that machines have, have a good uh, part in, production, in producing things and goods now, and you can stay on your cell phones. But otherwise, I, I don't find people who would understand the fact that history has come to an end outside uh, a bourgeoisie who's a bit bored by history. And that's a provocation, but I would like to talk about it. Glad you want to answer it um, and to defend uh, the Kojev's position. Um, so, yes, of course, this is. The obvious objection, um, where do you speak from? 
comrade, as we used to say in the 60s, uh, d'où est-ce que tu parles, camarade? Um, and of course, there is a, a, a possibility of narrating different histories, right? And this is what we're, we are doing in, in you know, in, in, in history since at least 30, 40 years. Um, but now, I think there is a certain plausibility in Kozhev's account, right? And the plausibility has to do, I think, with, first of all, with the fact that at times he has still a deflationarist reading of what is end of history, that is, there is a part of humanity that has reached it. Not everyone is there. So that's one point. But even if, if when he does not say this, what, what, have, what I think we have to understand under the, the label end of history is not so much, of course, history of events, eventual history. Um, occurrences, happenings, but something like history of um, procedures of legitimation. So there still might be revolutions, even bloody revolutions, let's say, but in the name of what? I think Kozhev's point, point is that the um, legitimation strategies that we'll be using even now in order to defend our points have already been established. They can be refined. We can say, well, um, my free historical individuality has not been recognized because it also has some distinct dimensions that have not been taken into account. But his point, I think, will be there is no other master idea that has come up to replace this idea that we should be recognized in our free historical individuality. I think that's that's the point. Are you sure that we have? <laughs> yes. I'm not sure. <laughs> what is the other idea? But the, the world is uh, full of uh, different way to uh, try Another narration. I don't know. Uh, you you see the the Iranian situation, for example, or the I don't know the cancel cancel culture in the uh, in uh, the USA or in the world. There is many expression of another way that is not that of revolution in the classical Marxist sense that is a, a way to uh, try it is not so easy so 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 clear but I think that uh, is not all an end that is not all the uh, homogeneous uh, state uh, or, or the, the, the eternal presence our eternal presence. I don't know what to, why, <laughs> it is all, only my idea. This, uh, I think this is an, an evidence uh, uh, for me. I don't know. <laughs> in, in any case, I will only um, say that um, I, I found very interesting the idea of Taubes of the aesthetization of true because uh, the aesthetization is um, Taubes um, retrace the origin of this concept in Kantian, uh, Kantian um, sense of uh, the, in the, um, the third uh, critic of uh, the judgment. That is this idea of <clears throat> that aesthetic is precisely the way through which a human being could construct, in, uh, invent, invent something new, something new, and then there is a possibility, this aesthetization of truth that Koshev uh, in some way show 
is um, something that uh, seems like as if well, uh, as if is true, but this is only a way. This is only a, 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 a possibility to interpret the world. It is not a fiction. Not only we can say a fiction, a fiction. This is, I, I think this is also important to use the new technologies that are really the the means to uh, from one side uh, mm, uh, so express the uh, the the true in a, a fictional way but in other sense we can use these to to uh, construct other narration other narration i think that this idea of the end of history is a really stark idea that has to take seriously in the sense that is one end and maybe the 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 bad the bad the bad, the bad. Thank you very much for the talk. Well, uh, as Ovidu said, okay. Uh, okay, uh, as Ovidu uh, already said, uh, no one except me have read Sofia, so it's hard for me to talk about something that you haven't read. But uh, what I can say is that uh, is um, in this uh, book, Kojev is just thinking about the end of history and what can it be, the end of history. And one of his answer is that it is possible for everyone to get his own narration about one's personality, about his or her personality. And he's talking about that, about the fight for recognition of women, the moment when women will be able to talk about themselves without um, repeating what uh, men are talking about themselves. So it is the very moment when one is able to speak about uh, oneself, itself or herself, without repeating another and he's saying something very strange he say and it is even possible to think that every uh, biological uh, given uh, uh, heritage inheritance uh, would be uh, suppressed so it is possible to speak about uh, oneself myself without making any reference to my biological uh, uh, gender or my classes or my <coughs> nationality. So the end of history, it will be the time where everyone is able to speak to uh, about himself without repeating what was saying, uh, biological or gender or thing like that. And uh, it is a time when uh, I can do the other, recognize my own narration about myself. So you have to recognize what I am saying about myself, even if uh, you think that I am a man or I am a woman or something like that. So it is a possibility to see uh, a thing like that. And in fact, it is um, directly uh, linked to uh, the negation because it is still a negation of what is given. Uh, our biological gender, our uh, class, our nationality, it is, uh, if I dare say, uh, as uh, because it is a Soloviev ID, which uh, uh, in Soloviev's uh, the achievement of uh, humanity will be uh, androgeneity, uh, transsexualism, uh, not transsexualism, because, but uh, uh, hermaphrodism. 
the moment when I can be recognized uh, for all my possibilities. I don't know. This looks like a bit uh, very, it's very fascinating. We don't believe that, that, that it's written in Sophia. Yeah. <laughs> You're inventing that. But, but thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, look, it looks like, um, in, in a way, we won't find that in 1,000. 1,500 pages, we won't find anything like that. But uh, it looks like a bit uh, what uh, Eric Weil says in his um, uh, little essay on the La Fin de l'Histoire. It's much later in 1970, but it's a way, I mean, uh, this thing that it's, the end of history is something that concerns not the Weltgeschichte, the Historia Universal, but the individual. I mean, the end of history is when one gets satisfied with himself, it's a sort of, a, it's, a, it's very Greek, it's very, and it's more. In a way, they, they wouldn't accept that. <laughs> but in a way, it's, it's, uh, it's something to do with, with perfection in the Greek sense, and not with society reaching perfection. Society, according to Weil, guarantees should guarantee if it's democracy. If it's democracy, should guarantee the possibility for the individual to feel at ease with himself, herself, and with it, her on his own narration, storytelling. <laughs> Micro yeah. or, or not? Yeah, uh, well, you, you're perfectly right. I, I do agree. It's uh, very great. And uh, just a precision, and you are already, you agree with me. Uh, it's it's um, an identity. I have to be at ease with myself, but not with myself that it was given to me uh, at birth, but oneself that I created by myself so uh, and by the, by work by the way but uh, because it's very important to get recognized through work but okay uh, there is um, so it is a recognition through a creation of myself and not just a cognition of what I was at my birth Anybody wanting to intervene or say something? Vanilla. A uh, follow-up from your from your earlier comment about uh, thinking about Kozhev, uh, Massimo, uh, as, a, as, a, as a theorist of institution, uh, uh, and, and not not of community, and almost sort of as an anti anti community thinker. I mean, in that respect, uh, it's uh, still something we have talked about a little bit yesterday. Sort of parallel or lecture croisé, as say the French, between um, Arnold Gehlen and Kozhev might be very interesting because, I mean, we, we, funnily enough, Gehlen writes his own anthropology in 1940, and when his institutional theory, uh, War Mention Spätkultur, comes a bit later, 56. But uh, another point they have in common is, of course, that he develops, as you said yesterday, independently his, his own theory of a post histoire. Uh, uh, and it would be very, I, I don't think they've Kuzhev was certainly not aware of him, of his existence, I think, uh, but I'd have to verify that. Um, but this is, this is sort of um, one, one other tradition uh, in the context uh, of which one could place, I think, uh, Kuzhev. Uh, and it's uh, definitely uh, the kind of stabilizing, institution as a stabilizing force. And the interesting thing is, I think, what one misses, uh, I mean, where, 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 so where would be Kuzhev's institutional theory, then, I think the closest he comes to it is obviously in the Esquisse du Phénomologie du Droit. And there, what I find very interesting, where he kind of decisively breaks with certain elements of existentialism, of course, that for a process of recognizing, you need to be not two, but three. Yeah, this is an introduction of a third person that then becomes a sort of juridical uh, um, constellation 
first as a judge, but later also as, as, as just as the third becomes a sort of objectified into an institution that avoids the situation that you describe, where we each have to kind of recognize each other individually, which would uh, frankly take up a lot of time as well. And uh, so that's, this, I guess, maybe with a role of a third in the institution, that, that would be a kernel of sort of Kujayev's institutional theory, I think. So, are the contestation, objections, insults, Definitely. nothing? Yeah. So, we're so pacific. Maybe someone. Oh, yeah. There was a question about the title. <laughs> the title of the symposium is. Uh, <laughs> Do we want to explain that? No. Uh, yeah. Sorry? The reason for the title is do tyrant, tyrant walk or not? Do they sleep? That's the problem. Does, or are they silent or not? This is, I guess it was a good title, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Or is the is working a tyrant itself? Maybe John. It's just a a way to think about that. But it's yeah, it has something to do with uh, Leo Strauss and Kujab's um, colloque uh, and xenophon. Yeah. <laughs> it was it. I mean, uh, something I wanted to say about your your expose yesterday uh, is Kujab that you, um, he refers to he refers to Xenophon in the La Notion de l'Autorité, uh, pour expliquer la, le chef, l'autorité du chef. He, he makes references to La La Base de Xenophon. Uh, and I guess that was something to, that had something to do with sleeping, if I remember it properly. But I should, I should watch <laughs> the uh, inside Xenophon. So, concluding remarks by Marco Filoni and me, myself, and I. <laughs> Nothing to say. <laughs> Nothing to say. Twen 24 hours concluding remarks. Re Marco. No, we have uh, 30 okay, so minutes I... after the university close. <laughs> so so I, I want to thank every, every one of you uh, to, to be here. And uh, it was a pleasure uh, listening your words. And I hope this is just one of the first meeting uh, I hope uh, every year, why not? And uh, like uh, to, to, to share our, your, uh, I, I made myself, I made my works. <laughs> so it's your turn and uh, me and Massimo, if you want, uh, we, we, we can, uh, we stay here to, to listen to you. And it's a, it's a great pleasure. And uh, if you, we can uh, help you, we, we're happy. And uh, so, really, uh, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure. I think to say that uh, also to uh, to Nina Kuznetsov, uh, who is with uh, us. <laughs> Ciao, Nina. Bonsoir. Est-ce que tu veux dire quelque chose? Bah, pas spécialement. Euh, je trouvais ça très riche, très varié et couvrant beaucoup de sujets. Et il faut dire que j'ai été quand même frappée par le fait que Massimo Palma n'a pas cru, euh, là, bon, c'était une blague un peu, euh, que Kojev avait écrit euh, cette chose sur la disparition des genres, en particulier dans la Sofia. Mais je peux quand même être témoin que moi, je l'ai lu aussi. Voilà. <rire> okay. Il y a beaucoup de choses dans la Sophia, et donc peut-être que c'est même difficile à croire. <rire> J'en ai lu qu'une petite partie, hein, je veux dire. Pour ok, merci, merci. Alors je crois. Alors. <rire> ah, merci. Je te remercie pour, pour être avec nous. Merci bien. Merci, merci vraiment. Et... Thank you.